get these donations in. And with that said, it's time for Kyarun to show us Final Fantasy 13. So Kyarun, show us how it's done. Hi, Hi I'm Zonzig. <laughs> I'm an old boy. Hi, I'm Zero. I'm a newer boy. And I'm Rista. I'm a medium boy. <laughs> I just talk. I can hear the game through Discord. Same. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I have both lines completely full here in my thing. So we have to start over again. All right, all right. So, uh, hello everyone, I'm Kairun. I'm going to run this game today. Um, and I have three commentators that introduce themselves, please. And then we can start. Hello, I'm Zero. I also run this game. <laughs> I am Zwanzig. I also run this game occasionally. I'm Rusta, I also run this game and route it occasionally. <laughs> Alright, and timing starts when I confirm the difficulty here. So I go with 3, 2, 1, go, and then we're good. 3, 2, 1, go. So, first things first, cutscene skips. We are not going to be seeing a whole lot of the story of this game. So we're going straight into the first battle. Right off the bat, uh, people familiar with the Final Fantasy series will notice that this is pretty different from anything else they've seen before. The ATB is very different. So in previous games, there's been uh, a variety of different systems, but typically it's turn-based or the characters charge their ATB and you have an ATB for every character. But here we only have the party leader and they're the only one whose ATB they control, and the rest of the party is controlled by AI. And here at the start, it's pretty straightforward. There's just uh, only really attacks for blitzes, which is sort of an area of effect attack, and those are only options. But the game is just showing us the ropes at the start, uh, and we're taking care of this pretty straightforward boss. In the bottom left, you see this bar that fills up. Um, when it's full, you can execute a full string, but it gives you a lot of freedom where you can also execute partial strings, <laughs> you can end the strings that are executing early, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, degrees of freedom it gives you. Um, there's also one other, little thing, one other little thing, which is that your ATB can get stuck if uh, your leader is trying to do an action and they, their character model gets interrupted, and so that's just like one little thing you already have to manage this early in the run. Yeah, and later on in the game we get more and more of these single segments, so we can use a lot of different combinations of attack moves in one string, which is very new to the series. But uh, now that the first boss is done, we are going to be in the sort of overworld for the rest of the game. Um, and in this, this overworld there's enemies that wander around, and our goal is to dodge them, so if we don't have to fight them. If you touch the, touch the enemy model, then you get into a fight with that enemy group, and so Throughout the whole run, we'll be doing this kind of dodging. And uh, we have a, a few donation incentives for the for Kaya Rune and for also people in the community for whether or not we can avoid these dodges. Immediately very rude with that second dodge. Yep. That, that was a beautiful is, backup, though. That one is not that likely to run out immediately. Normally, you can just go on the right and then cross to the left. But if one runs out, and in this case, both ran out, it's kind of scary. Yeah, normally, but, just dodging is... but Kaya was masterful in his dodging at both of those. <laughs> yeah, it's very much an art where we, we have a very... We have a lot of experience with how enemies generally move, specific enemy types, specific enemy groups, but there is always just degrees of, of randomness. and uh, it's, it's like every... Adapting. Every enemy has its own sort of selection of things it can do, and so you have to be prepared, be prepared for all of the possibilities. And uh, that was a very trolley pattern he got for that, and they managed to dodge it. But if you do so that, um, 
Uh, I say, if you do feel dodges, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a time loss. The game lets you retry a battle, and you just start, start outside the battle zone again. So you can give it another shot right after. Yeah, unlike in older Final Fantasies, you don't have to deal with, like, running away, being random, stuff like that. You just hit start, select, retry, you're good to go. In almost all cases, it's faster to retry, even if you have to retry multiple times compared to fighting the encounter as well. Um, there are exceptions in Chapter 1, the fights are still very fast, so if you want to just get through this chapter, like today for example, you fight more things than you normally would, but in general, normally the fights take way longer than a few retries do. In general though, the, our part is going to be very underleveled and it's going to get worse and worse as we move along, so the random enemies will become more and more challenging and we have to just dodge them, there's no, no option to fight them anymore. Specific kind of dodging trick coming up here. You're going to see Kaya turning the camera towards the ground. Uh, now, this is to manipulate the enemies that are over there off camera. You can't see them because, well, they're not looking at them. Um, but us not looking at them actually influences their behavior. Normally, those enemies would kind of run forward and get in your way. But um, doing this, what we call camera tricking, can manipulate their, uh, their behavior. My, making us do, uh, making them do what we want them to sometimes. My guess for why this is, is that the game designer said, we want you to see these enemies do some action, and so they programmed them to start moving when you could see them. So if you just don't look at them, they don't do the action, and you can dodge them more easily. But we're now on the third fight. All of these fights are sort of teaching you one little mechanic at a time. The previous fight was the item tutorial, even though you don't really need to use items, but it's still a tutorial anyway for this one. This is sort of the stagger tutorial, and it's showing you how this big enemy, the Psycho Marauder, becomes less dangerous once it becomes staggered. So in the top right, you can see there's a chain gauge. That'll build up throughout the course of fights, and then once it reaches max, it'll turn gold, and that's the stagger, and the enemy takes extra damage and gets interrupted during their actions. So that's just uh, one of the mini game mechanics we'll be getting into as we get along. Yeah, the chain is a one by one multiplier, so if I'm on 200% chain, I do twice the damage I do on 100%, etc. Yeah, when you hit stagger, you get 100% increase to that, so, you know, if he goes, it was 150% as a stagger point, then it goes to 250%. So, now we've left lightning behind, and we have one of our other main characters, Snow. Uh, Snow, here, there's several dodges at the start. Snow's character model is also a lot wider than the other character models, so some of these dodges can be uh, pretty annoying. Sad. This that dodge <laughs> in particular, uh, this is what we call the legendary dodge. It is pretty much the hardest dodge in the game um, to get consistently. You typically don't expect to get it, and so when you fail it, you just fight the enemy encounter because it doesn't take too long to do. And. Uh, it's, it's so unlikely that you expect to just fight it, and you are happy when you do happen to get it. And it's definitely the only dodge like that. Yeah, it's, it's also not something that, that people reset for or anything, you know. We, we will reset for bad early games, but not for legendary dodge, it's just too hard. Otherwise, yeah, on PC the there's not at that level. On PC there's a trick, I play the PC version right now, that when you camera trick at the start, the dogs will sometimes stop for whatever reason. That is not really happening on console, so on console it's even harder to get than on PC. A little bit of camera tricking there. Yeah, for the same reason as before, just to like not have these enemies in the bag load in, so we'd get the cutscene earlier. The dog-like enemies in particular do seem to be particularly influenced by the camera trick, and they don't start their running animations, and that can make it a lot easier. But this fight's fairly simple. Um, you mostly just attack him. We, we do some uh, manual potioning here. You can't really die here because your party member, Lebro, will automatically throw potions if you start to get even moderately low on HP. But when she does that, it actually takes away from her attacking. Uh, whereas the party leader using potions doesn't actually um, cost you any ATB. So the way we do it, we usually just uh, don't really have to worry about that happening. And we also kind of try to line it up so that he misses some of his attacks on us. 
Yeah, I got the lucky pen on where he missed the attack. If he doesn't do that, you just potion yourself, as Swanzik said. And then... Yeah, you can see the she, she, threw, she threw a potion at the end, but... Not a big deal. At that point, it doesn't matter anymore. You just do one attack and he's beaten. This fight, though, is a bit more technical because he's very fast and I want to avoid him dodging my attacks. So I attack in a specific pattern that whenever he's dashing forward, I attack him. That he's not dashing backwards to dodge my attack. This is a yeah, this is very good demonstration of what we've been talking about so far, though. You can see the stagger is going up slowly and he's very fast. But once he gets staggered, then our attacks will start interrupting him. And he'll start taking more damage and die much quicker. Whoever he attacks, he can interrupt also. So it goes from him interrupting you to you interrupting him, and it gets much easier. And uh, one one kind of notorious mechanic about this game is uh, that if the party leader dies, it is a game over. Your party members can die, and you can potentially revive them. Uh, but if the character you're controlling dies, it's a game over. Who's gone? So uh, that is always our first priority to make sure that does not happen. And uh, that past fight is one of the big opportunities for you to actually came over because of that. Until then, you know, either the fight was really easy or you had someone like Libro there to potion you. Almost. Almost. So close. Yeah. That is the second really? hardest dodge in this chapter because these aerial guys are very, very fast. They outspeed you, so we try to have them see us as late as possible. And you sometimes make it, but not always. So this is another one that we just fight if we fail it, usually. Yeah, this this fight actually takes a little bit longer to fight, unfortunately, but it, it gets even trickier to dodge on retries. Uh, that, that just kind of happens sometimes. Some fights, the way the enemies respawn when you retry the fight, are just more or less um, convenient than they were initially. With this one, it's really hard on retries, so typically you just fight it if you get caught. Now, later in the run, we will not have the luxury of just being able to fight random fights when we fail dodges, because we will not be set up to, to do those fights. And, but at this point in the game, it's all relatively easy. A lot of the random fights later on are actually almost as hard as boss fights are in terms of like the damage they do to you. Something they unusual. usually just have in this chapter is yeah. uh, Snow has been throwing hand grenades. This is something a lot of people don't know about because the auto battle only gives you attacks, but Snow has hand grenades which do splash damage and we'll be using them also in chapter two, but he loses the ability later on, so we just take advantage of it now while we have it. And yeah. that is chapter one. This is the end of chapter one, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. The game has 13 chapters, but they have very unequal length, so Indeed. we are not 1.13th through the game right now. Yeah, one is one of the quicker ones too as well. But later on there are chapters that are half an hour long or even longer. But now we're getting introduced to two more main characters, Vanille and Hope. Vanille, you'll notice, has one more ATB segment. Lightning and Snow both had two, Vanille has three, and there's a reason. She also has a... Sorry? She also has a fantastic weapon. <laughs> a fantastic but mysterious weapon. I think it's a fishing rod or a fishing hook? Yeah, 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 she goes fish later in the game. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you may have noticed there that Kaya went into the menu and actually turned the battle speed to slow. This seems like an odd thing to do for a speed run, but there's a very specific reason. Uh, but it's going to require some explanation. Zero, you wanna you wanna go? Sure. So in this game, there are consumable items called shrouds. Shrouds are usable outside of battle, and they generally give you some kind of effect. Um, there's four in particular. There's the Scepter Souls, which make you invisible to enemies. There's four the Souls and Aegis Souls, which give you certain buffs when you go into a fight. And there's Deeper Souls, which restore your TP, which we'll get to. But um, we want to farm a certain amount of these shrouds, um, just so we have them for the rest of the game. We will need them later on. And they are not guaranteed drops for the most part. For example, these fights right here have a base drop by 50% for these episodes. But the game is nice to you, and if you're bad at it, it gives you a better drop rate on Trouts because you need them. 
So if you get if you do this fight in 23 seconds or more, it'll give you a two-star battle rating. And that will double your shroud rate drop by 50 or more. Well, double your shroud rate drop, so it ends up being 100% off these fights. Later on, there will be shroud drop fights that are 12%, and we'll be getting zero stars on those because I'll give you an 8 times multiplier, giving us a 96% chance to get a drop. So this is just like our little farming segment that we intentionally have to put our battle speed down for so we can get these shroud drops. Yeah, and, and the, the reason the battle speed has to go down, because if you remain at normal battle speed, Hope will actually, even if you do nothing whatsoever, Hope will kill the enemies for you faster than it takes to get down to a two-star rating. Yeah, as far as the way the run works, we basically looked at every possible place that we could use these shrouds and decided that the you know the 45 seconds or so it takes to get a given shroud is worth it for any place that it saves that much time or more, and so we've just routed in the shrouds, which uh, we plan to use throughout the throughout the run, to, that are worth investing here. And it, you can get them randomly from other fights, and we know where to use them if you do, but we only count on the ones that we find. Yeah, which is for the current route with what most people go, it is three Deceptor Souls and one Fortress Soul. If we don't get another bonus that is not planned, then I have to get a chest later for a second Fortress Soul. But now that that Pantheon fight's done, we've got another Shroud Farm here, and this will actually be a good spot for Donation Break. Absolutely, we've got a bunch coming in here. Mr. Titan donates $54 saying, Kaya, good luck. This run is going to be great. That being said, I'm putting a bounty of $54 for death and $5.40 for a failed dodge. So choose, crush the estimate or crush the cancer. Who am I kidding? We're going to do both. And we have a $50 donation from CC Gambit saying, Hey, Kaya, good luck on your run today. Super happy to see you get the chance to perform on AGDQ. Can't wait for, for you to show the viewers this amazing run. It's one of my all-time favorite games. Let us all bow our heads in prayer for the Vanille's blessed debuffs. If we don't, she might not help us. Also, people need to see this blindfolded Dahaka boss fight. It's crazy. Get donating. We have uh, raised actually almost $4,000 since the run started toward that blindfolded fight. So we've got about $35,000 left. We've got a couple hours. We can get that going. Thank Do we got you guys. some more? Hey, yeah, or you go up. Yeah, go for all it. All right. Um... We have a $50 donation from Madoka saying, such a great GDQ so far. Glad my husband and I took this week off to watch. Super excited for the Final Fantasy run. Go Kaya Room. And we have a $10 donation from Logtails saying, greetings to the German restream. You are doing great. All right, All so right. Uh, something that is really interesting about this game is that the positioning in the battles actually matters. However, you don't have any direct control over your positioning. So in these fights with multiple enemies, we're doing all we can to hit as many of the enemies at once as possible. So, you know, when Snow throws a hand grenade, we try and hit the target that will hit everything. When Lightning does a blitz, which is the attack where she spins around, try and hit all of the enemies. Um, and so without any direct control here, you kind of just have to mess with your timing or if you see an enemy moving, attack when they're moving, that kind of thing. But it's just one of those little pieces of finesse that you have to get into when you want to really start optimizing your times as much as Kai has. You yeah, a little thing that I, a little thing that I did right now was putting the Gladius weapon on Lightning that has more strength. We generally use the default weapon for almost every character in the game, but in the early game, Lightning's Gladius is a bit more beneficial for us, so I just put that on quickly. Yeah, in this game, the weapons can be upgraded to have better stats, but the Different weapons require different amounts of resources to upgrade, and it turns out that everyone's base weapons has the best scaling rate. So in terms of gil invested versus the you know, amount of stats you get back, they're the best. And so we, we give Lightning a quote-unquote better weapon, the Gladius, because it has a higher base stat. But once we actually get back to upgrading, we give her default weapon back and upgrade that instead. But coming up, we have one last farm. Um, one last farm, assuming none of our previous farms failed. Uh, and this is for Fortisol, and there's a Fortisol chest here. We basically plan on having three Deceptisols and two Fortisols. There's just two big fights uh, that we need these Fortisols for, where not having them would significantly slow the fight down. And then there's three places where we need either a Primped 
or uh, to dodge something. And that's what the Decept Cell is for. And so. Oh, 4%. Nice. So uh, as Zero mentioned um, earlier. No, no, no. That was that was because you did the, the fast fight. Oh, because you did the fast fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that has been a round change recently. Um, you, you can do this fast and then just get the chest later on. I said that a bit earlier. Um, yeah. so the you can I also take you. that as a farm fight. But, yeah, the, yeah, the 45 seconds I mentioned earlier is what you expect to get zero stars in that fight. But if you just fight it at full speed, you don't have to change the battle speed in the menu, and then there's a chest later on that takes 35 seconds to get, and so that's been changed in the route, and so we'll be getting that later, unless we get a lucky 4 drop, which is something that can happen in many fights. Your odds of getting another 4 are pretty good. Like, from that fight on, you have about a 40 some percent chance, and mathematically, you end up saving time more of the time if you just skip the grind there and pick up the chest if you don't get it, versus farming for the bonus. So, we skip farming for the bonus there. All right, coming up now are two very interesting dodges. Uh, Rista said earlier that positioning is important. That is also the case for dodges in a lot of cases. Even more, more so for dodges, I would say. <laughs> Even more so for dodges, yeah. Um, there is a really, really big ghast enemy that blocks this whole wave path. Um, there's a way to dodge him reliably while luring him out until he swipes, then positioning myself here so he backs off. And once he backs off like that, there's enough space to pass him on the left side. This, this is one is very consistent and also a good showcase of like how important positioning can be. Yeah, the, this gas has been a thorn in runner's side since the beginning of this run. Yeah, we used to have a, an, a just a, kind of a YOLO strat for it, but uh, I think it was you, right, yeah. Rista, who developed and, the consistent... Uh, and the other zero strategy. helped out. Right. But, uh, yeah, these, these gasts are generally pretty unpredictable, as you can see. Kai is trying to do his gas whispering ways to lure these guys. But one thing that they will generally do is if they walk forward, they will eventually back away from you. And that's uh, the same mechanic that Kai took advantage of for the previous dodge. But yeah, every every dodge uh, kind of has a uh, each enemy encounter has a zone associated with it um, in which the enemies will aggro onto you. Uh, so when you leave that zone, what most enemies will do is kind of just back away from you and then go back to just wandering around aimlessly. And that kind of backing up is what we use there to make sure that they get out of our way. That specific single gas, though, is particularly annoying because uh, you can kill him for a Decept Assault, but the fight is like more than a minute, if, you know, add a little bit of time for the loading and everything. So. People used to just do that instead of having to worry about that inconsistent dodge, and now we have the consistent method. But now we're on the final boss of Chapter 2. This is our first boss fight of the whole run. And you might notice we have these three little icons next to our characters' names. These are buffs. That's Bravery, Faith, and Haste in order. And we got that from using a fort as well before this fight, so that's what the Shrouds are good for. At this point in the run, we don't have any way to apply these buffs so, um, besides using a Shroud. So using a Shroud here is worth it just because it's a fairly lengthy fight without it. Those and somebody, else like, okay, uh, somebody else that Kai is trying to do here, or was trying to do here, is that he was trying to time his attacks so he wouldn't get countered. That big claw of Anima right there, he swipes every time he gets hit, essentially. So what Kai would do is he would wait for his other characters to attack him so he can get the swipe out, and then would attack him with lightning so she wouldn't get hit. Okay, you can't control your teammates, so Snow is going to keep attacking no matter what. You can control who he attacks by changing your target, but in this case, you just want him to attack Anima, so you let Snow run in, he's got a lot of HP, gets hit, and then Lightning can go in and hit herself. Um, there's also a small aspect of positioning where you can Blitz to try and hit those two manipulators, and uh, that was well done by Kaya, and that's the end of Chapter 2. Also for me it's very interesting that that fight already is the first usage of the Fortisol that gives you offensive buffs, because we don't really have that many resources there, we can just attack, and that fight takes around 45 seconds longer when I don't use the Fortis on it, so it is very worth. At this point in the story, the characters have become Lucy, essentially slaves for their big machine overlords, and this means we are now going to have to kick the commentary into overdrive because a bunch of mechanics have just been introduced, starting with the paradigm system, basically the main combat system. Yeah, so if you were paying close attention there in that fight, there was uh, different actions from Saz and uh, Sorry, Snow and Vanille, 
Um, they were actually casting spells instead of just doing attacks, which is what we've been doing so far. And this is one of the powers of the sea. So um, the two roles currently available to us are the commando and ravager role. Commandos can do attacks and physical damage, and they can do magical damage also, but they're basically the damage dealers. And then we also have the ravager. The ravager is the mage, and they do elemental damage, and they increase the chain gauge of enemies. You know, right? And, so the, and the game allows you to uh, the game allows you to switch paradigms during battle at any time, um, which really allows you a lot of freedom in, in how you tackle um, combat in this game because you can only do actual actions when your ATB is full. The paradigm switch can be engaged at any time you want to. So yeah, what Kai is currently setting up is a paradigm tech. The game lets you swap between these paradigms, and so you want to know you know, you want to have a plan for what you do with your various roles, and so. For example, we have the aggression paradigm where we have two commandos and a ravager, that's for damage dealing. Um, and then we also have the relentless aggression, or sorry, relentless assault, which is one commando, two ravagers. That with the two ravagers for building chain, we can increase chain faster. We also have tri disaster, uh, which is three ravagers for maximum chaining. And sort of those are the, the big ones right now. Later on, we're gonna have three commandos available to us, and so we can do Cerberus, which is the maximum damage dealing, and then as more roles become available to us, we'll have more freedom with that. But the game sort of holds your hand at the beginning and only gives you a few options. Every paradigm has its own name, and we as runners of this game are just kind of familiar with each other, with, with them, so we tend to just say things like smart bomb and know what that means. We realize that the, the audience will not necessarily, so we'll try to be more descriptive with it, but it might sneak in there somewhere because that's kind of how we usually communicate. Yeah, currently I've set up two aggression paradigms, which are Commando for Lightning and Snow and Ravager for Vanille to put out the maximum possible damage because in this early game, the enemies don't really have that high of a chain gauge to fill to stagger them. So you don't really need that many Ravagers to chain. But later on, we need a lot of Ravager use. Yeah, the, that extra damage you get at higher chain really makes it so that the best way to kill enemies is to do most of your training at the start typically stagger and then do all your damage. So uh, a lot of casual runners will just sit in the role with one commando and two ravagers. And that's a pretty good strategy, but it usually ends up being better to do all your chaining and then all of your damage yeah. like that. Uh, and the main reason I have the same paradigm twice uh, to further explain that is the game has a mechanic called ATV refresh, or we call it ATV refresh. Oh, um, that means that every single time you shift the paradigm the first time in a fight, you get a full gauge refill for your entire ATB gauges. And after that, it happens every 12 seconds. It also works going from the uh, one paradigm into exactly the same paradigm. So that's why I have the same paradigm twice. So if you want to maximize your chaining, then you'll have three Ravagers. But if you want to continue doing that for more than 12 seconds, you typically want to just have two paradigms that are both three ravages and you can just go back and forth between them and get maximum chaining. Or if you have two party members, you can have two ravages and that's something we'll be doing quite a bit also. Um, but something else I want to mention is that uh, you sort of effortless, effortlessly dodged Gandalf. There's a ghast with several birds flying around him. Uh, we affectionately call it Gandalf because you shall not pass, but Kaya just ran right by him like he was nothing. All right, and here's the big scorpion from the start of the game. He's back and uh, actually stronger despite how beat up he looks. Beat up, but significantly stronger. So he starts off with this big attack, uh, hits everyone. And then after this, there's a sort of timer, which is a little bit random, up to his next attack. This next attack is guaranteed to kill us with our current stats. The intention of this boss is to show you how to use another role, the Sentinel, to tank damage. However, with a certain timing, we can stagger him just before his attack, and when you stagger an enemy, they'll lose the current action that they're trying to do. And so he was trying to do Crystal Rain, and we just staggered him, and now he's onto his next part of his pattern, which is to just shoot a single laser beam. We did actually use Snow's Sentinel, and in Sentinel, he does something called Provoke. And when he provokes an enemy, it makes the enemy want to attack him. Um, typically, when you provoke an enemy, it'll only make them attack the sentinel when they're in the sentinel role, but this guy has an AI such that he continues to attack the same enemy, so we just attack snow the whole time, 
and we're safe. So we spent about two or three seconds in Sentinel and the rest of it was not, and that's how we optimized the speed for that boss. Yeah, and then after Stagger, I shifted between the two aggression paradigms to maximize the damage output. Right, it was just... Because that has Lightning and Snow both in Commando. Yeah, Vanille does not have access to the Commando role yet, and she won't until, like, more than three hours from now. And so we're doing a lot of aggression instead of uh, service. Sorry, the two Commando role instead of the three Commando role for uh, people that aren't so familiar with the paradigms. So one other little mechanic that's coming up here is we mentioned Decepticals uh, being one of the shrouds that are given to us early in Chapter 2. So Decept Decepticals has two main uses. First, it uh, makes you invisible to enemies. And second, if you start a random battle with a Decepticals or an overworld battle with a Decepticals, it'll give you a preempt. Uh, preempts are a type of battle where uh, the enemies start with almost full chain gauges, so you can make a lot of fights go faster if you start them with a preempt. So, one thing that you can do is called a deset cancel. It's sort of an intended mechanic that we abuse, where if you start a fight with a Decepticol and then retry it, uh, you get the Decepticol back. Actually, this also works with all of the shrouds except for Aether Souls. But specifically for Decepticols, you can use the invisibility property to get by the enemy, and then you know, retry the fight, and then you get the Decepticol back. So it's sort of like a cheating way to get by enemies. And so, if, if I, I was going to say, if, if, <laughs> if this goes right, we won't see it here, but uh, yeah. now we will. Uh, Kai was going to try this dodge once the normal way, but it's quite tricky. So for the retry here, he is doing now what Rusta just talked about, which is a Decept cancel. So what is happening here is he ran with the Decept, which means the enemies cannot see him, which makes it really easy to dodge them. Uh, ran real quick. past their zone. Uh, did he teach water? Because I'm not sure he did, but I can just be blind. I'm very sure I did. Okay, I'm just blind. Go on. <laughs> if not, it doesn't matter too much for this fight. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I, did, I did the paradigms, definitely, so I'm very sure I did water, too. But we'll see. Yeah, it's not too bad if you're missing it for Behemoth. So. But uh, to finish that thought on Decepticol canceling, the, when the battle restarts, it'll put you where you last entered the battle zone. There's an entrance and an exit to the battle zone, and so we run into the entrance, past the enemies, out of the exit, and then double back to re retry, the, retry the fight, and then it puts you at the exit instead of at the entrance, and so that's sort of how you can cheat the system a little bit. Yeah, and, and the, the reason we have to uh, do the running into the battle and retrying is so that we get our Decepticol back. Because otherwise, after 30 seconds, it would simply run out and we would lose it. And we want to do this trick a whole bunch of times throughout the run. So let's just duplicate so our this way, Decepticol, it's like 20 Decepticol essentially, instead of grinding for a bunch of them. Yeah. It lets us use it without using it. And some people sort of think of that as a glitch, specifically the... In the past, the Japanese community considered this not, not something that you're allowed to do, and so they have to spend much, much longer in Chapter 2 just grinding the Souls to get everything you need for the run. But it's not... It's an intended mechanic. They don't want you to lose something like a Fortisol or a Decepticol if you die after using it. And so we just sort of combine intended mechanics to get a nice advantage there. Yeah. So uh, with apologies to Zero, <laughs> he was right. Yep, that was, that's why that fight took a bit longer than usual. I was missing water. Uh, this guy is weak to water normally. Um, I forgot that in the menu earlier. But now we have it. As I mentioned, the Ravagers do elemental damage, and so we're able to teach Vanille the spell that that enemy is weak to. And she does a little bit of extra damage. It's not a big difference because while Ravagers do do damage, it's not a lot compared to the Commandos, and this is something that's going to get more and more. Uh, uh, the difference is going to get larger and larger as we go along. So by the end of the game, the Ravagers are doing nearly no damage compared to the Commandos. But the amount of chain they provide is critical, because you know, doubling the damage of your damage dealer is better than just getting a little bit more damage. But, yeah, okay. and generally a lot of the going fast in battles in this game is stacking multipliers on top of multipliers yeah. to just skyrocket your damage. The commando has a base double multiplier for plus 100% damage, and uh, 
Ravagers add damage from their chain, but that's pretty much all we have access to right now. Pretty soon we'll be gaining access to more mechanics. Actually, we had Bravery earlier from a Fort Assault, but we can't give ourselves Bravery. Bravery is a 30% increase, but these are all going to be combined once we have access to them ourselves. But just several dodges here, a few D-step cancels, but now would be a good time for more donations if they're available. Absolutely, they are. Your community has really shown up. We have a $327.54 donation from Sharky. Ten years ago, I scrolled through the games directory on this new site called Twitch, stumbled into Zoning 1138's channel, saw a single segment FF13 run, and I fell in love with my very first speedrun. And as far as first runs go, what a choice. I can dodge fights, I can refresh my ATV, camera trick does things. This game was endless fun as a street speed run. The speedrun community for the 13 trilogy gave me some of the best friends in my life, like Logic Dolphin, uh, Dolphin, Kyo's Little Monster, Bulletin, Conry, Das Faro, and the entire RPG Limit Break crew. So here is a 54 cent donation multiplied by all 605 members of the 13 speedrunning Discord to honor a wonderful cause and the best Final Fantasy game. We're very proud of you guys, and thank you, GDQ, for having us. And speaking of one of those, we do have a $54 uh, dollar donation from Logic Dolphin saying, Hi, Kaya, Logic here. Just asking why you haven't reset the run yet? Just kidding. Glad to see Final Fantasy XIII and HGDQ for the first time ever. You will smash this run. I'm sure either that or you won't smash it. I'm not sure which one here. <laughs> All right, just to give a little bit of explanation there. Thank you very much, Sharky and Logic Dolphin. The, there's sort of a meme in the community of just around the number 54. There's an enemy much later on that we dodge, but Logic Dolphin in the past was trying to grind good times for it, and he was so excited when he finally achieved the 54 second time that he very excitedly exclaimed 54, and uh, it's just sort of become, become a meme. So you may have heard earlier that Mr. Titan donated, he's gonna donate $54 and $5.40 for deaths and failed dodges. And then we got 54 cents times 600, and Logic Dolphin donating $54. So you're probably gonna hear more of that from our community. It's kind of an inside joke for us. We, we can get another quick donation or two in before the boss fight here. All right, well, speaking of 54, we have $54.54 .54 from <laughs> Violaxcor saying uh, preemptively donating 54 cents per failed dodge plus a few extra bucks. Good luck, Kaya. Hi, Rusta. Hi, Zwanzig. Hi, Zero. Oh, wow. So this dodge is the last dodge of Chapter 3. It's kind of an interesting one. This is another one that we didn't use to do, but the enemy in the back is sort of this Templar guy, and he's very, very fast. He is much too fast to actually dodge. But now that we understand the enemy mechanics better, we know that as long as you don't get too close to him and directly in front of him, he won't start moving, and so we can just sort of hog this left wall. Um, I affectionately refer to him as the scary guy because he is very scary if you don't know what you're doing, but we just run right by him, it's no problem. Um, here we're also going to pick up a chest that has Libra scopes. We're going to get into what Libra does and what a Libra scope is, but getting into this fight now, this is sort of the big boss of Chapter 3. He's a flying enemy, so we're going to be doing some interesting things here. When lightning attacks him, she jumps. And when you paradigm shift while your leader's in the air, you don't get the normal long paradigm shift animation. So, even though we're shifting paradigms, we don't have to ever watch this animation. And the first phase is very quick compared to the second phase. There's sort of a mechanic here that's being introduced, which is that the second phase gets a barrier, which may means he takes a lot less damage until you stagger him. So the game is trying to teach you to prioritize staggering. Um, but that means that we're going to want to use Tri Disaster, which is the three Ravager. However, when Lightning is a Ravager, she doesn't want to jump. So our second shift here is going to have a long animation associated with it, which is this animation. During that animation, the ATB was charging, and so we tried to time that specifically as our second shift, so that while that long animation was happening, ATB was charging, and the next time we shift, It'll be after 12 seconds since our first shift, and so the shift will give us full ATB on everyone because of that ATB refresh. So it's all sort of come together really well. Getting full ATB when we need it, stopping the enemy when he's about to attack us, and now that he's staggered, he's going to be continuously interrupted. Yeah, the ATB refresh is, is, is really, it's kind of the mechanic that we have to structure all of our battle strategies around because it just speeds you up so much to get those full ATVs.
But now that that fight's right. done, we have another fight that has uh, positional mechanics that's really interesting. You want to explain it, Zero? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, this fight right here is actually supposed to be a force loss, quote unquote. If you don't, if you leave one soldier alive here, they'll spawn in more. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to kill two of them very close together to each other, so they never get the chance to spawn in more units like that. Say Snow missed the punch there because one of the soldiers jumped back. They proceed to spawn in like three, four more of the soldiers, and then they you would have to wait for them to kill you. Um. And here we got our first Eidolon fight. So this is Shiva. And you'll see a little gauge there next to um, next to his name right there. Our goal for this fight is to fill up that gauge. And we do that by chaining, essentially. But there's also a mechanic with this fight specifically, where if they do an ATB charge attack, and you think Incendio it fills up 18% of the gauge. So we try to play around that, do as much to, like uh, put together as many strings as possible. And then when we see ATB charge, we go to Sentinel and we tank and try to fill up the gauge that way. Yeah, the idea behind these Eidolon fights is the game is trying to say, you know, if you do the things that fill up the gauge, the characters fulfill in the role that they're good at. And so Snow is really good at tanking and chaining. And so these frost strikes do a lot of, uh, add a lot of just all points. And then when the ATB charge, like Zero mentioned, they'll do their big attack and then just go in a single to dodge it and then they'll finish the fight off. A little bit random when she does the ATB charge. Here she did it early, so we got a good fight. Yeah, step one minute's good. And a little fun fact about Shiva. Yeah, a little fun fact about Shiva. Um, you can win this fight by just shifting to Sentinel at the start and not doing anything. Yeah. It's true, yeah. yeah she's guaranteed to do enough big attacks that you can just sit in Sentinel. But if you do something like just sit in Commando and attack, you might not win because there was a Doom counter over Snow's head. And so you have to win all of the Eidolon fights within three minutes. And so they're kind of notoriously difficult, especially the later ones. So here in that fight, that was very, very quick. But one little mechanic that we use there that we'll use a few more times later on is we manipulate who our party members target just by changing who the leader is targeting. So we want to distribute the attacks between the enemies. And so you know, we can target one Panther on, which is named the dog, and then Saz and Neon will attack that. And then we can have Lightning attack something else. But we'll be using, using that in the next fight, so I wanted to mention it there. Also, I uh, just checked my shrouds. I have a Fortisol, which you're not supposed to have at this point, so I have the bonus drop. Yeah, so yeah. I can skip the chest later on. So the, I believe that that is from the first phase of Karuda. Or is that from the soldiers? It probably is the soldiers. The soldiers yeah. give you the, the, yeah, On Garuda, I got nothing, so it's oh, from okay, the yeah. soldiers. But yeah. that soldiers fight doesn't have a result screen, so got lucky there. Yeah, it's, I think, the only fight in the run like that where it can give you drops and it gives you some, like, CP and whatnot, but it doesn't show you because you go straight into the Shiva fight. So we have a nice time there to check while we're waiting for the cutscene. And we always check there to see if we got that hidden Fortisol drop. So here we have another DSEC. Those Watch drone enemies can also move very quickly. It's possible to do those dodges without the shroud, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah, the the, the chance of you stringing all of them together is just too low to go for that. In general, we save the Deceptisols for enemies that move faster than us. If they don't move faster than us, we can usually just get around them somehow. And there are a few enemies that are guaranteed to move in specific ways that we can dodge, even, even if they're faster than us. And we'll, we'll explain those when we get to them, but... In general, when you see us decept, it's because the enemy is faster. Now, we are gaining access to two more of the roles. So we've had Commando for damage, Ravager for chaining, and the Sentinel for tanking damage. Now we also have, uh, sorry, we actually have all three, all, all, all six now. So the Saboteur is for inflicting debuffs to make enemies either take interruptions or take more damage. We've got the Synergist, which buffs the party, and we've got the Medic, which is able to heal the party. So in this fight specifically, we're going to be relying on the first two. So Vanilla is in the saboteur role, you can see SAB by her name, and that makes her cast D shell, and that makes enemies take significantly more damage from magic. Uh, we only use D shell here because we only have access to magic. Neither of these characters is, is a commando at this point. And then Saz also quickly added faith to both members, so that makes them do extra magic damage. So this is the multiplier stacking that uh, Swansea mentioned earlier. So they're taking more damage and we're inflicting more damage. And the, the combination of those two is massive. Now also... Yeah, buffs and debuffs in this game are incredibly powerful. 
it, in, in a lot of other FF games, it's kind of a, well, you might use them on really tough fights. Now, in this game, you should be using buffs and debuffs basically all the time. How much, what's the that multiplier? That is just how good they are. It's multiplier from deep um, effect? I think it's 67%? Or... Uh, 89. It, it, is, it is 89%. I don't know why it's 89. Uh, if anyone knows, feel free to tell me. I have no idea, but it's it's almost times two. So. And then if you add in the 30% yeah. from Bravery and Faith, and it's more than two times damage. Also, one so, of the uh, quick thing I'll mention. Real quick. That... That, that fight, the the <laughs> vanille is doing much more damage, and so that's just like following up on the what I was mentioning earlier, where you have Saz target the enemy that you want vanille to attack because vanille is the one that's actually doing more damage. But sorry, it's really quick. Go ahead. Okay, so the place we're in right now, we affectionately like to call it Iron Gutter. There's three dodges in a row that all 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 the enemies are fighting each other, so they they don't pay attention to us at all. Like these thing would do absolutely nothing. And since they're fighting each other, they don't react to our movements. We can't control their movements in any way, and all the pathways are fairly thin. So you kind of just have to hope they give you room at some point, and you're able to make it through. And it's a little bit of a pain point, but kind of had a pretty nice one right there. Yeah, there is a bunch more of that later on, where enemies don't really trigger you, um, or are getting triggered by your presence. Here's the most unnecessarily complicated strat in the world. <laughs> I'm proud of this strat, okay? But this is a great strat. So, so this, yeah, this, okay. this recently got changed to have a bunch more shifts in it than it used to. Like, it used to be very straightforward. You just get D-Shell on him and then spam spells at him until he dies. Now there's a whole bunch of specifically timed shifts to save, like, what, two seconds? Like, well, it's around two yeah, seconds, yeah. About two seconds. The thing about that fight is that it gives you a set paradigm deck, which is far from optimal, but it's not worth the time investment to change it. And so we just like found a very specific pattern of using their bad paradigms to save a few extra seconds. That and now, fight also was uh, was not required. We did that just to pick up another weapon, uh, just for money, essentially. There, there will be a few times in, in the game where we do some easy uh, optional fights in order to get some chests. In Chapter 2, there was the uh, fight that we got the Gladius from. Yeah. That fight and then the Shroud fights have been the optional fights so far, but that's nearly it. There's only a handful through the rest of the run that are optional. And now I'll introduce you to the most beloved part of Chapter 4 for anyone, because these are consecutive dodges with bird enemies, or bird-looking enemies, and all of them outspeed you a lot. Um, they usually start running a bit delayed. If I'm lucky, I get past all of them without getting caught, so it's worth to try without Deceptisol. But if I get caught by one of those, I just Deceptisol use the retry. The you might notice that the birds on top are perched up there. So right now, there's only one bird that starts on the ground. If you fail to dodge and retry, they all start on the ground, and it gets considerably harder. The birds outspeed you, so if they good. come from directly behind, they will typically attack you in a way which means you don't get caught. However, you have to run past them, and so they are not typically coming from directly behind. And then coming up yeah, is going to be a fight with some birds, but it's going to be a few minutes, so now would be a good time for donations. Yeah, so we have $250 from Koinu93 saying Final Fantasy speedrunning is a huge part of what got me into this life-changing pastime, the 13 trilogy especially. Congrats, Kaya, on getting this technical marvel into the marathon this year. Good luck on the run, putting this towards some blindfolded boss slaying. And on that same note, $100 from Morgan. Thanks for a great event. Hope we get to see the blindfolded fight. And $50 from Yorolomor saying blindfold incentive, count my donation in. We have about $35. $5,000, that $34,000 left to get that. You've got about three hours or four hours left to get that one in. Uh, so I want to see that one uh, get, get in as well. You got time for a little few more? Sure. Uh, so we have Dizzy donating $25 saying, good morning, Kaya, and good luck. We are, are we're dodge, dodging pounding today, right? And good proto, if those still exist, and a lot of shroud. <laughs> All right, so here is the fight against the birds. We're going to be doing uh, most of the damage with lightning, and Vanille is going to be debuffing, trying to cast D-Protect and D-Show. And here we sort of begin to see a theme of the game, which is just praying for Vanille to land debuffs. Debuffs are random, and the chance of them landing goes up every time she fails, or as Chain goes up, so you, you will get them eventually for most fights. However, the faster you get them, the faster the fight is. And 
that's just going to be a, a source of time loss or gain throughout the run. Yeah, this fight I was pretty unlucky at the start, so it took a while to kill the first one. Yeah, the first two birds have more health, and so um, you're killing them as you debuff them, and so the earlier you get the debuff, the better. And then we got two more bird dodges, and then we'll be done with birds for chapter four. This has been a good good bird segment so far. So far. I think this one right here is the worst what? one. Yeah. Why did I say that? <laughs> Sorry, Kaya. Yeah. <laughs> I realized as soon as I started saying it that I was just going to curse it. So the position with that was pretty bad. Um, I hope that they see me like a tiny bit later, so then you can squeeze on the right side on the one that jumps down. But yeah, that was, that was very close. Now we just accept this all the retry and then we're through all of these. Something that makes the debuffs particularly good in this game is that they are multiplicative. So if you have a 30% from bravery and 89% from you know, deep, deep protector key shell, then those multiply together. And 13-2, they add instead. So you get 50% added. So, you know, if you get a 50% from something and then a 50% from something else, you just get 200% instead of 225% if you were to multiply them together. So in this game, it's really, really nice to, to stack these things together. Yeah, we can see the power of buffs and debuffs in this boss already. This is one of the longest fights in the game, actually. Uh, it's a two-phase fight, the second phase and the first phase combined take close to three, mi uh, three minutes. So the first thing we're going to do is buff Lightning. And only Lightning for the first phase. The first phase is the shorter of the two, and she's the big damage dealer, and so da damage from the two Ravagers doesn't really add up. Um, our main damage paradigm is one Commando, two Ravagers, with this Assault, because, as I mentioned, Vanille and Saz do not have access to the Commando role. So Saz and Vanille will be adding Chain while Lightning does damage. Now we here we do a Libra. Um, so Libra is a really interesting ability that uh, it's not easy to take pro make proper use of, but basically Libra just gives you information. Now, the advantage of having information, because we're speedrunners, we know everything. The advantage of information in-game is that when you gain the information, it tells your allies how to, how to behave better in the fight. So it lets them know if they're weak against something, or it lets them know how to use the right abilities. Specifically, commandos like to start their strings with ruins, but starting your string with a ruin when you should just be doing attacks uh, makes you lose lose out on damage. So doing a Libra there will make your Ravagers perform properly, or make your commando perform properly. Ravagers too, if they can hit a weakness. And also it carries over into like two phase fights. So for example, in Garuda, we Libra at phase one, and we had the info for phase two, and here it's the same thing. We Libra at phase one, and we have the info for phase two. So right here, he's uh, buffing up his party, and the first part of this uh, second phase is essentially about getting everything to line up for another stagger cancel. Um, oh yeah, I happened to do a shorter string there to make sure it lines up at the end. Um, so right here, it's about to happen. And there we go, easy. That was really good, you didn't even so, see the start of the animation. Yeah, so what was about to happen there was a very strong move called Wrecking Ball. Um, we, you know, we, we generally don't want to see it because it does a lot of damage, but we especially don't want to see it because it's the rare example of a glitch in this game. Uh, Wrecking Ball sometimes glitches to where it hits you twice. We don't really know why this happens, uh, but if it does, we are just dead. We don't have the HP to tank two hits from it. I think the general theory is that there's two zones where the Wrecking Ball can hit, and if they both happen to overlap on size, it'll double hit him. That, that second part is also so long that it becomes worth putting faith on both members. And he also did an interesting skill there, Steam Queen, which removes D-Shell. And so we went back and re-inflicted D-Shell. One interesting thing about that fight is that you get to see that after he staggered, his chain is so high that D-Shell hits immediately. Whereas in the first phase, it's random how long it takes D-Shell to hit. So we typically want to start with chaining and then inflict debuffs because then the debuff chance is higher. But if the enemy is going to be dying too fast, uh, or for whatever reason, then we might have to do the debuffs earlier, like in the birds fight. Yeah, that's something we haven't mentioned yet. Um, higher chain increases the duration of debuffs and also the likelihood of them inflicting. Yeah, the base for, for example, Deep Protect, I believe is a minute. 
but if you inflate that, say, 200% chain, you'll get two minutes. So, same thing with the inflation percentage. I forget what the exact, I think, I, I forget what the exact base inflation rate is, but it gets multiplied by whatever their chain is at. Oh boy, they oh, did not like him. Yep. And no I did not expect out. him to die that fast, okay. <laughs> So yeah, this is this is a kind of an infamously random fight. Um, there, there's a lot of positioning RNG because you're trying to maximize damage from blitzes here, mm -hmm. and then also if, if all the enemies happen to target, either yeah. lightning or hope, yeah. it can get pretty dicey. I need to single target um, them. There have been opportunities uh, up to this point in the game to pick up, but I think one opportunity to pick up an optional Phoenix down chest, um, but he's not gone for that because it's a bit out of the way. I'm using the therapy. Usually you don't need any Phoenix Downs this early. I got oh, we one got now. one now. <laughs> <laughs> Could have used that before the fight. Yeah, no, I, like, I think almost all targeted Hope there because he's normally not dying that fast from over 100 HP. Every soldier does around 50 to 60 damage per shot. So they must have targeted him with at least three. Amusingly, they like to cast Mana Drive Bar Thunder to reduce lightning damage. It doesn't reduce lightning's damage, it reduces damage from lightning spells, <laughs> so... They are confused about lightning's lame. Probably. That is a, a good example of a fight where positioning is very important, though, because Blitz, as an attack, does more damage than a single attack, but it requires two ATB. So anytime you can hit more than one enemy with a Blitz, it's better to do the Blitz. However, the enemies like to split up. As Kaya said, he had to do single attacks, and so... That's uh, made, the, made the fight go slowly there. To add to that, Blitz also interrupts them. So if they're all grouped together, you can just keep hitting them with Blitz. And it's a lot less likely for somebody to just get gunned down, like Hope got gunned down there. If they're, if they're a bit more spread out, more of it can hit you. So you can have stuff like that happen. One yeah, more. if you expect that, you obviously potion a bit earlier there, but yeah, it happens. One more quick fight. These soldiers move independently, but if you can time your blitzes right, you can have every blitz hit both enemies and then kill them in four blitzes. Anytime it misses, you'll get extra attacks. But that, even that fight, it's possible to die on. It's happened to me. Yeah. I still don't know how, but it, it has. Now we got one other glitch that we don't know why that happens, but I don't have background music now. I think it is based on when you skip the cutscene before that, but sometimes the music here just disappears. For some reason. In terms of the story, chapter four, <laughs> chapter three and chapter four are a little bit more downbeat because you're feeling pretty bad about having turned into being turned into human weapons. Uh, but this is like a sort of moment of lightheartedness where Hope hotwires this dreadnought and this nice upbeat song called March of the Dreadnought starts playing. And uh, we unfortunately don't get to hear it this time because of Kaya's excellent mashing skills at the start. <laughs> So I hope you've been enjoying this, because this was the minigame of Final Fantasy XIII. <laughs> yeah, great minigame. There is we a little were... mechanic that's important here, which is that the number of soldiers you get affects what you get from this chest at the end. So Kai actually went out of his way to kill a few extra soldiers there to get those thickened hides. Um, we'll, we'll explain the use of thickened hides when we get to them, but... Go ahead, Zero. No, I was going to say the exact same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So in general, these type of soldier enemies, there are going to be many of them throughout the game. The way their AI works is that when they see you, they like to charge forward. And so we generally have an idea of where they like to be in their battle zones and try and enter the battle zone at a point such that they'll run not directly at us, or when they run at us, we'll be able to get by them. Some of these dodges can actually be very annoying, especially the earlier ones where the soldiers can just start right next to you and just hit you without your control. But we have little manips like you know, camera tricking or moving in specific specific places to uh, to avoid them. But now that we've gotten past all these, actually this, this last dodge can be pretty annoying also, but after this we get into the next Eidolon fight. So Odin is the next one. If one of you guys want to take that. Yeah, that is a much more difficult one and I can actually die there. It's like not completely unlikely to die on that fight. He does a lot of damage. Yeah, the first Eidolon fight with Shiva was really not a in any danger of killing us because one of them actually constantly heals you since it's kind of a sort of tutorial. Um, this guy does incredible amounts of damage. Uh, luckily, this is still the part of the game where potions are incredibly overpowered. Um, so there's a lot of good things about potions. First of all, they heal the entire party. 
Second of all, they don't cost any ATV to use. Third of all, with an, uh, an item called the Doctor's Code equipped, um, that doubles the healing that they do. So, essentially, at this point in the game, a potion is a full party heal that doesn't cost any ATV. And that's, uh, that's pretty good. It's so good, in fact, that we basically don't have to use the medic role for most of the game. Yeah, really, until chapter 11, the medic role is basically non existent. There's a few spots where we use it just because it's not faster to use potions at that point, but potions are really, really good. The one other thing about potions worth mentioning is that there's certain attacks that'll knock you down or knock you back, but if you're mid-potion animation, you won't get knocked down or knocked back, so it's a good way to remain standing, so you can keep on hitting him instead of just lying on the floor in pain. Yeah, against Yeah, Odin, that is the reason has, why I waited. Yeah, he has two That's attacks. That's the reason why I waited so long. His seismic slam and... Uh, I forget the other one. Crush and blow. Crush and... They, they yep. can knock you back and interrupt you, but if you just use the potion, as you saw Kaya wait, then... Uh, it stops you from flying. So immediately after getting Odin, we'll actually use him. Uh, this is a tutorial for how to actually use Eidolons, and doesn't do a very good job of teaching you, but we have it mapped out to be a very, very good use of Odin. So Odin is unique among the Eidolons in that his final blow, Zantetskin, has a kill threshold. So if you get them above a certain chain and below a certain health, then there's a formula that you can check to see how much damage Odin can do with his killing blow. People often complain that Odin doesn't do as much damage as the other, other Eidolons or that he's weak. That's just because the game doesn't actually explain this instant kill mechanic. So once we get both of these guys above around 270 chain, we can just instantly do our max level Zentetskin and it will kill both of them. Hopefully. There's <laughs> a chance that it misses when we don't do a Thunderfall. That depends on how much damage Odin did on one of them. But normally they both die, which you can see on this black fade-out animation. Yeah, it didn't show damage. If you see damage, that means you didn't get the instant kill, but there was no damage shown. Um, the formula ends up being some constant times the square of the chain. And if you don't get the instant kill, it's just some that same constant times just the chain. So if you're at, you know, say 500% chain before you kill them, then you'll get five times higher damage from the instant kill. There was around three... You know, close to 300%, so it's basically three times the damage. And Odin is actually quite good because of that. Um, and that I also got a Deceptisol uh, from that fight. That is a low chance Deceptisol that we normally don't have routed in, but we will use that later on to save some time on fights that you would normally not save. Yes, bonus Decepts are very nice, and we'll explain it when we get there how we use it. But just one last thing I'll mention about Odin before moving on is that uh, that constant that multiplies the chain to de determine the instant kill, that's a constant that goes up with your Crystarium level, and so even though we're not going to be using Lightning or scaling up our stats, Odin is going to be getting stronger in the background, and that's why we're able to use Odin against Adam and Chalid, in case people do happen to donate for that. But now uh, we've got a sort of long dodging section, and now would also be a good time for some donations. All right, we, we have some jokers. In, in these donations. <laughs> we have jokers in the community, so I'm not we, surprised. We have yeah. five dollars from Shifty. Oh, gee, perfect weather for a Final Fantasy 13 run. I sure hope that there's no snow or no lightning so I can enjoy my vanilla ice cream and bite into it with my fangs, or pizzazz. Good luck to Kaiyarun with the run. Can't wait to see it. And we have a $250 donation from Severa Messia. I went out in the snow to cool off waiting for this Final Fantasy 13 run because this game is fire. I'm trying to ground myself and I'm so excited to watch Kaya move through this game like Grease Lightning. Let's see that blindfolded Dahaka fight. And there is a $5.40 train for that Dahaka fight, including from Dave Mysterio saying, hey GDQ, let's get a $5.40 train rolling to beat these incentives. Love seeing Kaya in Final Fantasy 13 and GDQ for the first time. This run is absolutely phenomenal and Kaya makes it looks way too easy. Shout out to the homies on commentary. You all are killing it. So there's sort of a theme to the party names or the you know, party character names, which is that they're all supposed to have the color white sort of involved. So lightning is white, uh, vanilla, vanilla, vanilla. Van Vanilla's original Japanese name is actually vanilla. Um, and then Saz isn't really a word, but I believe it's supposed to be a reference to suds, i.e. foam, which is typically white. And so uh, the fact that these are all words means that you can make a lot of puns with them, as, as you just heard. 
you probably. just blew my mind. I never knew that. Yeah, White fangs. All right. <laughs> uh, now there's a very specific camera minute setup that I'll try to do and hopefully get the good patterns. Because we explained the camera tricking earlier, and now this gets to actually have like a really, really good use to make preemptive strikes way easier on these upcoming fights. Because these Pulsework soldiers on those platforms back there will only move when I look at them. So I try to look only at specific parts of them and then look on the ground again to have them in the perfect position for a preempt. So we'll see later on if that works. So this is uh, sort of a gauntlet of fights. There's four fights here. They're all overworld encounters, but we have to beat them in order to unlock buttons to continue the, continue the level. This first fight is against two bombs. And bombs, as many fans of Final Fantasy will know, can self-destruct and our HP is particularly low at this point, so if they do self-destruct, uh, they'll just kill us in one hit. Bombs in this game actually do damage with self-destruct proportional to their remaining HP, so it is possible to save yourself by doing damage. Um, but here, Kaya got good luck. The one bomb that started self-destructing early uh, was close, and he managed to take him out, and then the, the, the fight became safe. But that is that is a point where you can just die over and over again if the bombs don't, don't like you, so that was nice. My record is three times in a row that I died on that fight with absolutely no chance of recovering it. But basically here the, the four fights are the combinations of soldiers and bombs. So we get two bombs and then we get two one bomb, one soldier fights and then one two soldier fight. So this is the first one soldier, one bomb. But these are all, besides the bombs, because bombs are very unpredictable, these are all preempts that we just force manually. And by getting a preempt, they start near full you're starting near their stagger points, and so the fight is uh, very quick because of that. We can just stagger them almost immediately. The bombs, uh, having the preempt doesn't matter as much, but these pulse works take quite a while to stagger, and then you do basically negative damage before they stagger. Like, I think you get double damage or triple damage or something once they stagger, because they open up. So for these guys in particular, it's very important to get the preempt. I think it's double. No. It's actually interesting. In addition, in addition to the doubling yeah. from them being staggered, the, the, the chain. You can actually see if you shoot like a sequence of attacks of them as they're staggering, you can see it go from like 400 to 800. Yeah, you're as right. As they open up. Those sparks are good. So something to mention about the camera stuff again. Before we used to do this uh, gauntlet going right to left, and we would often have to wait for the fight we just did there quite a bit, usually a cycle or two to wait for a preempt opportunity, but since we have this camera manipulation now, we can just do it fairly quickly like Kaya did there. It's been a nice recent improvement. Yeah, that saves around 20 seconds in best case over going the other way around, which is a lot. These the fights... one <laughs> I was gonna say, the one trade-off is there's a Phoenix down chest to the right side that we can all <laughs> skip, and sometimes that comes in handy, as you saw. So, but it's worth skipping for the time save. Each chest takes around three seconds to open, and as as you go along, the amount of gil per second you expect to, to be worth it goes you know, goes up. And so, a phoenix down is worth 500 gil. So even at this point, it's not really worth investing three seconds to get 500 gil. However, a phoenix down can save you. So. As you saw earlier, Kyle lost several seconds because he wasn't able to Phoenix down Hope. And, but now he does have a Phoenix down, which hopefully he doesn't have to sell and we'll be able to use it in a clutch scenario. Yeah, that depends the on number of, The number of fights where you usually would expect to have to use Phoenix downs without something going like catastrophically wrong is maybe like five or so. But, uh, you know, catastrophes do happen and there are those couple of fights where it's fairly common to have a to use the Phoenix Dam. And just in that last dodge, uh, Kai does something pretty cool, which is to fully take advantage of the enemy AI. Bombs can be pretty unpredictable and annoying, but if you get them to spot you at a good point, they'll just move in a straight line towards where they first spotted you at. And so they won't actually chase directly after you. And so Kai got them to come straight towards where he entered the zone and then just ran past them as they were moving. That's actually a very, very hard dodge. And a lot of people just decept past it. The, the manipulation to try and draw them out actually takes time, so it's not a massive time save, but it is a really cool uh, display of skill and understanding of the enemy mechanics to do that. 
Yeah, I was considering to dis uh, decep that, which is why I opened the shroud menu, but then I saw their position was so good that the bombs were stuck behind the soldiers. Yeah. And then it worked. But with that, we reached the end of chapter four. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, even with decepting, that dodge isn't guaranteed, sadly, because sometimes they just block the whole kind of like tunnel and you can't get through anyway. And since you're decepted, you, they can't see you, so you can't pull them out. So it's just a decision you have to make in the moment. So now we reach chapter five. Our party for this chapter, the entire chapter is actually going to be Hope and Lightning. We'll be changing who's leading, but at the start, it's going to be Hope. Uh, this first section is just a sequence of several dodges. We can get more into it after some time, but if there are any donations, this is sort of a slow point. All right, well, we have a $50 donation from Mutski. Hey, FF13 friends, your favorite Final Fantasy speed pal Mutski here. I can't put into words how hyped I am for Final Fantasy 13 to be in this marathon. It is definitely one of the most combat tech execution heavy speedruns of the entire franchise, and I'm so glad that so many people can see Kaya absolutely crush it today. I always shout 13 out as my favorite Final Fantasy run to watch. Best of luck. Shout outs to some of my good friends commentating Zero, Swanzig. Thanks for all you do in the FF community, and I can't wait for the commentary. And Rusta, grab yourself some purified water for this run because it's going to be mental out of this world, buddy. Much love, Mutski. We also have $50 from Pancake saying, I donated five bucks, right? I'm not sure, I could not see. Let's get that blindfolded run. Absolutely, thank you for your $5 times 10. And we have a $100 donation from Kevin Janssen saying, hey, is that critically acclaimed MMO? Oh, wait, apparently I can't count. Let's hit this blindfolded incentive goal. Been looking forward to this speed run and glad I'm up to see it. Let's go, Kaya. To quote something from Snow, the speed runners always win. Wait a minute, that isn't right either. I need a Kupo coffee. <laughs> we have uh, about $33,000 left on the Dahaka blindfolded fight. You've got about three hours left, three and a half hours left. I know we can do this. I am seeing a $5.40 train. That helps in this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this uh, this game is pretty, the speed run's amazing because you can beat this game faster than you can get in through a queue of that uh, critically acclaimed RPG. <laughs> <laughs> Shut <up. laughs> Anyway, getting back to the actual speedrun. Uh, so we're leading with Hope now. Hope is pretty remarkable among the six party members in that he runs slower. <laughs> so he runs at about 7 eighths speed of the other party members who all run at the same speed. And uh, that makes dodging a little bit harder. However, these Thexerons, or the, the, dodge enemies of, or the dog enemies of this chapter, they also are slower than the typical, uh, the typical do dog enemies. So it's basically like playing in molasses. The enemies are slower, hope is slower, but the dodge difficulty is still high. Yeah, I can only imagine that the devs just thought it looked silly, hope running at the same speed as everyone else with him being short, but... If you want to see nah, what it's, different it's some, characters yeah. look like running at different speeds, we have, uh, you know, a rando for this game where you can change the, the speeds of the various characters and have them run faster or slower. Oh, Lord. The thing about the height that makes no sense, though, is that Vanille is almost the same height that Hope is. And Vanille's, you know, so, hundreds of years old, too. And, and, and Vanille, <laughs> yeah, but Vanille runs as fast as Snow, for example, does, whereas Hope is slower. But other than the dogs, most of the dodges in this fight, or most of the dodges in this segment are pretty straightforward. Some more camera trick in here, you know, the drill button. With all of the dogs. Just put the camera down and the dogs won't start moving as early. But once we're through this dodging section, we're going to be on to the next section of fights. Um, so there's some pretty interesting fights that we'll be learning some cool stuff during. Um, the first fight is against two, uh, not Thexerons, it's sort of the next dog enemy after them, but they're weak to fire and we'll get to see some cool tech. Um, so specifically something that we've been going for but haven't talked about yet is something called the Stagger Slowdown. So anytime an enemy gets staggered, the game actually sort of throws in a little slowdown where it's like, oh cool, look, he's getting staggered, but that loses you a little bit less than a second. And it's possible to avoid this in a couple of ways. So if you're not targeting the enemy that's staggered, then they will, you, you won't get the animation. Or if you're doing a paradigm shift at the right time compared to the enemy, you'll also not get it. So in this fight, we're actually gonna be doing both of these. So for the first enemy, um, when it staggers, we're going to be trying to do a paradigm shift, and there won't be a slowdown. 
and then for the second enemy, we'll be selecting but not using a potion, and when you select the potion, it targets the leader. And so, they aren't targeting the enemy, and so you don't get the stagger slowdown. And this is... Throwing these uh, stagger slowdown skips into the run has been kind of a recent uh, trend before last year. It wasn't even really something we seriously considered most of the time. Um, but now it's gotten, strats for that have gotten thrown all over mostly the first half of the run. A lot of the later fights are kind of already precise enough with timing that we can't really afford to go for micro-optimizations like that, but uh, especially a lot of the easier fights in the first half, there's tons of those now. It's, it's about three quarters of a second saved, but we do it probably how many, I, I haven't actually counted how many times, but I want to say it's probably more than I think 30 or 40. I think we added at least 10 to 15 when we purposely paid attention to them, and there already have been some before. Yeah, so it ends up saving a pretty significant chunk of time overall. Like this one, for example, didn't used to be there, but now it is too. All it takes is a single fire up plus lights two blitzes there, but by throwing in a little ATV refresh at the end, you don't actually need the paradigm shift for any reason other than to stop the stagger slowdown from happening. Yep. So after those little slug enemies, now we're going to face a Feral Behemoth. We're going to fight two of these in this chapter. Um, shortly after this, we're going to be changing from Hope Lead to Lightning Lead after the next fight. Uh, and so the game sort of wants to show you what it's like leading with both members of this party. So you can see what it's like controlling the Medic and the Ravager versus the Commando and the, and the Ravager. Uh, but these Behemoths are weak to water, and both characters have water. If you pay attention to Lightning String, so see she's doing Aqua Strike, Water, Aqua Strike, Water. That's just... The AI in this game is programmed to do alternating moves when possible. However, Lightning is spec to do more damage with physical attacks, and so she's actually being slightly inefficient there. It'd be better to just do multiple Aqua Strikes. So we try and take advantage of changing paradigms to get better moves off, but then once we leave with Lightning, we can just select Aqua Strike ourselves and do the more efficient string. And now we have the worst <laughs> non-boss fight in the run. <laughs> yes, this is... We fight 10 crawlers. Each of them does around 60 to 70 damage, uh, potentially. And if multiple target hope, I can die very fast. We also purposely don't get the preemptive strike here because the boomerang preempt animation that hope has at the start of the fight on 10 enemies takes extremely long. Yeah, for the preempt animation, the character independently attacks every single enemy to give them that high chain. So watching Hope attack 10 things takes takes longer than it does to just kill them without staggering them. But you saw it got very close uh, a bit there yeah, because a lot of them target the lightning. Yep. That's another fight where the positioning is important. Lightning uh, can interrupt anything she hits with a blitz, and so if they're all together, she can hit them all and stop them all from attacking. But if they're all spread out, then they'll just keep attacking her, interrupting her, and it's just a mess. But now we're back to having Lightning as the party leader, so we're back at running full speed. And I just got a few dodges here to take care of. There's actually a spot there to the left where outside the battle zone, so we tried to just like enter that spot quickly to reset the aggro on the Lobos, but sadly it didn't really work out that time. Yeah, the, we're not yeah I back. hit the spot, but I didn't reset the... Oh, I reset the aggro, but he started to chase immediately again as soon as I left it. Yeah. So he still caught me. Anytime you leave the battle zone, and if you get caught after, you'll go back to where you entered the battle zone. And so by leaving the battle zone there, we basically got like a save point in our progress through that zone. And so even though Lightning got caught there, it was uh, it put him back at the point where he made it to instead of at the beginning where he normally would. Something else to talk about with these uh, behemoth fights, we're coming up on another one in a moment, um, is a mechanic that's, that's pretty important for certain fights, which is interruption. Um, there's a pretty complicated system um, governing whether your actions can interrupt opponents, whether they can interrupt you. There are buffs and debuffs that uh, affect this, um, but most of those we don't really use that much. Um, but most notably, when an enemy is staggered, they get interrupted by basically anything. 
Um, and so these behemoths do a lot of damage, so we really try to keep them interrupted uh, during stagger. Um, what this usually means in, in practical purposes is that we're alternating uh, attacks between our party members so that the enemy doesn't get a chance to do anything. So right here you see that Lightning is on red HP, so if she gets hit again she's dead, but now that the enemy is staggered we're just gonna make sure that he doesn't hit us anymore by just constantly keeping him interrupted. A few other little mechanics I can mention here. Um, one is animation cancel. So there's something called a ready animation, or which we call a ready animation, which is the action that the character does when you do uh, when you change paradigms. They like to do a little flourish with their weapon, and that you know loses you a bit of time. However, if you get an ATB refresh, which is what you get every 12 seconds when you do a paradigm shift, at the correct timing when they're doing their final move, they, your party members, not the leader, will immediately go into their next move without doing the ready animation. It is possible to get this on the party leader in some points in the game with certain moves, but for lightning it's not really possible. But there, Kyrun timed uh, a paradigm shift as Hope was doing his final water from, you know, Rav plus Calm into Rav plus Calm, and then Hope immediately started to do his next water, and so that maintained the interruption also, so it was faster and safer by doing it that way. Yeah. And one other thing, actually, Kai mentioned in his interview, uh, we're sort of seeing there for one of the first times, is called roll buffering. Lightning is doing, she has Aqua Strike in her Ravager roll, and she has Attack in her Commando roll. Um, attack does double damage just because it's in a command, it's a Commando move, and the Behemoth is weak to water, so you get double damage from that. So an Attack and an Aqua Strike both do about the same damage, but if you do an Aqua Strike and then shift into Commando before it hits, the Aqua Strike will get the damage multiplier from the Commando, so you basically get a four times damage attack there. Um, there's a few, that's exactly. called, called roll buffering, and there's a few places where you can do that to get it a lot of extra damage in. The ready animation cancel that Rooster mentioned is very, very, very necessary for the next boss yes, fight. Very so there yeah. they you can see it after and before stagger. I will basically use the ready animation cancel on Hope for the entire fight. Hope is way more important in that fight than Lightning for uh, increasing the chain gauge. So, because with Lightning we have to potion two, so we cannot only chain. Um, so we play a lot around Hope on the next fight. The, like the boss fight. Alright, so here's another Odin fight. Um, you're you're going to notice that for quite a lot of uh, multiple uh, basic enemy fights, we're, we're going to end up using Odin. We can't do it all the time because um, it comes out of your uh, uh, resource called technical points or TP. Um, but whenever we can and we know that it saves time, we uh, will use Odin strats. There'll be quite a few of those. And here I also used the bonus deceptors all that I got. Normally this fight has no preempt and takes around 20 seconds longer without the preempt. Now I got the preempt. But it's it's the same. You, you still kill with Odin. Yeah, yeah, and we are now coming up on the kind of the the toughest fight in, in early game. We actually got a donation uh, specifically for this, having a good proto. Right. <laughs> Um, so Astro Proto Florian, the basic conceit with it is that um, he, after a little bit into the fight, he is going to transform into one of four possible uh, modes. Uh, he calls them exoproofings, um, which will change his elemental properties. And you would think, okay, what's the big deal? Just hit whatever he's weak to. Well, the problem that we're having to deal with at this point is that Lightning does not have access to any ice-based uh, abilities whatsoever. So if he goes into fire, which is weak to ice, um, we have a problem. We're simply just not going to be able to kill him in one stagger if he does that. Um, so if that happens, we'll just have to wait it out. Um, similar with Exoproofing Ice, I think, right? No, you can kill an Ice right now, right? Yeah, I There's been some changes with this recently because there, there used to be a summon backup for certain Exos, but now that's getting rerouted because we rerouted TP somewhere. It's a little bit complicated, Yeah. Um, but we're about to see what we're going to get right here. Lightning doesn't have any Ice attacks, and her only fire attack is a fire spell, which is significantly weaker than her strikes. 
and so that makes I exo proofing ice a little bit more difficult. But we got lightning, which means it's weak to water, and we've seen lightning do a ton of aqua strikes, and that's what we're gonna be doing here. So what to look look out for here is he's about to be staggered, and we're gonna be trying to maintain interruption on him while doing damage. Um, and you'll get to see Hope doing the we're getting seeing Kaya doing the shifts to get Hope's ready animation cancel. So if you pay attention to Hope here, you'll see he does three waters, Kaya shifts, up, oh, missed it that time. Didn't get that. <laughs> yeah. It was just a little bit too late. This might actually get close. I made several mistakes in this fight. The but critical we'll part is maintaining eruption. And so the next paradigm shift will have Hope immediately starting his next water, and that's an example of the ready animation cancel. The other thing that Kai is trying to avoid here is that then if the lightning is every string, she'll do this backflip. I think you can solve that by doing a paradigm shift as well. So it's trying to avoid that there. Oh, this, this is bad. Uh, yeah, I actually yeah, needed to do it back up. All right, nice. All right. He's free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. On console, that actually would have failed to kill most likely because with 30 FPS, the stagger is slightly shorter and your own character is slightly slower. Something interesting about Final Fantasy XIII is that the in-game clock doesn't run at real time. It sort of depends on your hardware. And so on PC versus on console, the amount of time, the amount of time that the stagger... The stagger is supposed to last for 45 seconds, but it's 45 quote-unquote seconds, and how long a second is depends on your platform. So on, on console, the stagger runs out sooner, and that probably wouldn't have killed that specific, guy, that specific fight. Also, there's... Another mechanic that we didn't really get into, which is the uh, stagger duration. Commandos add stagger duration, or they, sorry, they add chain duration while you're chaining. And then the amount of time that the stagger lasts is called stagger duration and depends on your amount of chain, du chain duration when you staggered. And so in that fight, you have only lightning on commando and you're trying to stagger him as quickly as possible, which means you're not, you're using Ravager and not adding as much chain duration. And so if you have a slow early part of the fight, you might stagger him with low stagger duration and then fail to kill because of that. And I think Kai was pretty close to the 45 second stagger duration there, but ended up being okay. Yeah. Also now you have time for reading a few more donations if you want to, because there's around six minutes of encounter dodging now. All right. This chapter only has one fight. All right. Uh, well, we have a $78 donation from Chronolink saying beyond the static to see Final Fantasy XIII's run on display at this year's AGDQ. As anyone I know would tell you, this is not only my favorite Final Fantasy game, but one of my favorite games ever. The characters, story, and lore are not everyone's cup of tea, but they are for me, and the gorgeous soundtrack even more so. I followed the speedrun of this game for a while due to aspirations of running it someday, but the technical prowess and execution needed is beyond me for now. Hope everyone watching can appreciate how amazing of a run this is. Here's $13 for all the main characters in this wonderful game. We have a $54 donation from Sierra's Oasis saying, click, 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 click. I'm not sure if that's the sound of lightning running or all the donations rolling in. Time for a $54 train? Keep up the great commentary and good luck, Kaya Rune. It doesn't have to be a $54 train. It can be a $5 train, a $5.40 train, all of that. As long as when you donate, you select the incentive for the blindfolded Kahaka fight, then it will count towards it. We are, how are we doing on that? We are about $33,000 away. So we're running a little bit low on time, so you might want to get those in. We have a $10 donation from Garrett Jack saying Final Fantasy 13 was one of my favorite games growing up. Can't wait to see it get destroyed. Who doesn't want to see a blindfolded fight against Kahaka? Let's get that incentive met. And we have a $25 donation from My Name is Hope. My Name is Hope. I keep hearing my name during this Final Fantasy 13 run, so I thought I'd send a donation. I hope we get to see a blindfolded fight during this run. And we have a $25 donation from Chappers saying, hello guys, hope everyone is having a good week. Looking forward to some Final Fantasy speedrunning to accompany me through the end of my workday. Good luck to Kyrune and thanks to everyone involved in GDQ as always. Donation goes towards some blindfolded boss fun. And we have a $5.40 donation from uh, Levi's All Anon saying, here's a donation to finally see the ending of this game. And we have a $78 donation from Gabriel GS saying, I love Final Fantasy 13 and I'm really glad to see it run. Let's go, Kyra. All right, so we have a few things we can talk about. Um, Perfect. That first donation, I don't even think that was an intentional hope pun, but uh, 
It just it just tends to happen when you have people, you know, when you have a game with a character named Hope. Um, right, so in this chapter, we're, we're mostly doing dodges. The, right here we have a sort of divergence to the left to grab this chest. I mentioned that there's not a lot of chests that are worth going out of your way for, but that one has a sort of twice in a time item called the Doctor's Code we've already talked about. Um, Doctor's Codes, as Swan Tigger earlier mentioned, doubles potions efficacy, so instead of 150 di a health on everyone, it does 300 health. Um, that's very, very nice, and we do take advantage of having two by being able to leave the Doctor's Code on one character who's not available and using the second one on another character. But there's a sort of second uh, advantage to the doctor, Doctor's Code, which is that once you're done using it, you can upgrade it and dismantle it, and it gives you uh, an elixir, which is a full heal, including technical points. It gives you a Fortisol, a uh, Ethersol, and a dis uh, sorry, Aegisol. So it gives you three of the four shrouds and a really nice elixir. And actually, the number of elixirs you can get in this game is limited, just based on the you know number of Doctor's Codes and the possible ways of getting elixirs. So that's a really, really nice thing to get. And those all of those items are, are routed into our usage. Um, the dodges in this chapter are mostly straightforward. These gremlins have sort of set moving pattern, patterns, and they can be manipulated with the camera, and you can also just wait for them to move into good places before trying to dodge them. If you get lucky, you can basically run through this chapter non-stop. If not, you might have to sort of diverge to, to get the better dodging pattern. Um, but something else we actually did just now, which is a pretty big deal. We also did one earlier, um, but we upgraded some equipment. So yes. in this in this part, we just updated upgraded Saz's weapon. So he has the Vega 42s, and we now have access to both types of upgrade items. So there's two types of upgrade items. There's organic and mechanical. And the organic gives you multiplier. And so you get some points, but it gives you a higher multiplier. And then the, the mechanical ones give you just points. So they actually reduce your multiplier. So the basic way that you want to do it is you use your organics to get to a three times multiplier, which is the max. And then you can use your mechanical items to get the maximum amount of points out of them. So earlier we got the thickened hides from that Dreadnought mini game, and we used those to upgrade a power wristband. But that was only a two times multiplier, and that's using all of the organics basically that were available to us then. But now there's a store, Creature Comforts, from which we can buy them. So we bought the 36 30 bonds, which is what you need to get a three times multiplier. On, on items like that. So we got those 36 30 bones, and then we got some polymer emulsion emulsions, which is just the most efficient item, mechanical item at this point, and we got our Vegas to level 19. So that's 19 out of 26, so they're pretty strong for this point in the run. Yeah, so y you might be wondering if you've played this game casually, how are they killing all these enemies so fast? They're, they're barely fighting anything. They're getting like no XP. How are they going so fast? Well, part of that is good strats. Um, but another part of it is that equipment upgrading is really powerful. So we spend a lot of money essentially just on being able to upgrade our, um, our offensive stats. Um, we, we have a power wristband, we upgraded that earlier. At base it gives you 20 strength, and upgrading it fully gave us another 40. Um, upgrading the Vegas, I don't know exactly how much that gives us, but it's, it's a lot. So, in terms of offensive stats, we're actually pretty close to what a typical casual player who doesn't upgrade very efficiently or very much at all, or doesn't really focus on, on specifically stat-boosting equipment, would have. The main difference is that we have very low HP, but that's something we can deal with. Yeah, if you understand these like patterns, then you can survive anything they can throw at us. I don't know exactly, but the Vegas upgrade from level 1 to 19 is around 100, maybe even a bit more. Like, Which it's a lot. I think close to double Saz's attack. And that's, we also give him the power wristband, which gives him 60 more. So it's quite a big difference. Whereas, you know, each node of strength in the Crystal would give him like four or five strength at this point. And so we could kill every single enemy and it would probably give us less than what we get from just doing that upgrade. Of course, that's the only thing that we upgraded. We didn't upgrade Vanille at all. But she, as I mentioned before, she's going to be doing debuffing and chaining, which don't do damage. And so we focus all of our upgrades on Saz, who's doing the damage. And Saz now does have access to command. He did in Chapter 4, I did mention, but I just wanted to say. So this is uh, the boss of this chapter. There's two of them. Um, the goal, um, the, the main thing, is getting buffs and debuffs. Uh, there's actually a specific strat now where we 
manipulate Sazo's AI by being in a medic role to only buff himself, um, which just speeds up uh, the fight, because if, if we didn't do that, then he would cast a bunch of buffs on the Neon that we just don't need, because um, he is really the main damage dealer now. He has all of our strength equipment. Right. So and then uh, the goal, once we stagger each of these enemies, is to prevent them from doing that move that you saw just now called Bellow. It didn't really matter that it happened there because he was almost dead. Um, but what normally happens is once they, uh, I think it's just once they've taken a certain amount of damage, they, uh, they will Bellow. And the main problem of that for us is that it dispels their debuffs. Um, so it's another interruption strat to make sure that doesn't happen. Specifically in this case, we're making use of poison. Uh, the nice thing about poison specifically is that the enemy actually gets interrupted from it twice. Once when it gets cast on them and then once when it actually inflicts its delay for some reason. And then uh, using that and some refreshes, we can uh, keep them interrupted like that and get a nice fight. One other multiplier that's important for that fight is the Saz has access to the in spells, which basically gives the attacks of commandos, the or it gives all of their attacks, but most importantly the attacks of commandos, the element of that of, of that in spell. And so, in that in that fight, those guys are weak against uh, water and thunder. And so Saz is able to imbue his own attacks with the water and thunder element, and that gives him a nice double damage. So the multipliers are really starting to stack up now. We've got yeah, so you you have to imagine two times from hitting a weakness, 89% from deep protect, 40% from bravery. So uh, just off the top of my head, you're, you're already over four times easily with that, and that is before even factoring in chain bonus. Yeah. Poison is also a really interesting and powerful spell in this game. Um, and the longer you can inflict poison, the more damage it does, and also the more HP that they have. It does damage according to their max HP over time. Um, in that fight, it doesn't really matter because we inflict poison only when they're about to die. It can help you like save an attack, but they, they have relatively low HP. But later on, there will be bosses that have massive amounts of HP, where the amount of damage poison does is massive. So poison is also a very important debuff. Yeah, the scaling in this game is actually extremely big. Like, in terms of the damage you can do, it, and also in terms of how much damage enemies can do, and especially their health. Like, endgame enemies, even in any percent, have multiple millions of HP. So at this point in the game now, uh, we have our six party members. Actually, we haven't really spent much time around Fang yet, so we have our five party members. They've all been turned into these human weapons to do the bidding of these sort of godlike creatures called Felsi, but uh, we're sort of dealing with the with the difficulty of that by all going our separate ways, and so Hope and Lightning have gone towards Kalampolum, which is Hope's hometown, which is totally different direction from where Sats and Vanilla going, are going. Um, and so this is where we are now, and we're just going to be doing a few dodges down here, and I think now would be a good time for some donations if there are available. They are available. We have a $25 donation from Des1957 saying this game made me fall in love with the RPG genre and introduced me to speedrunning so many years ago. Longtime watcher here, and it feels truly incredible to see such an important game be speedrun at a GDQ event. I feel so proud of the speedrunning and gaming community that we put on an event this impactful to people in need. I want to say thank you to the speedrunners for exploring such an impactful game for me in my life and thank you to all the incredible people that are a part of the community and those watching for giving speedruns like this such a great platform and we have a 15 dollars donation from das Faro saying we all know what you can do time to show the world what you can do good luck on the run kaya may the exo proofs be in your favor and the cold blood strike true put this towards the integrate final fantasy 7 integrate so we can have more Final Fantasy action on the event. Yes, we've got the Final Fantasy VII Integrate bonus game coming up as well. That's another incentive. We have a $54 donation from Trojan Dude saying, Yo, Kaya, it's Trojan. I am beyond ecstatic to see you running Final Fantasy XIII and GDQ. You're an awesome person, and I am so grateful to have met you and a bunch of uh, FF13 friends in person a few years ago. May the bonus drop luck be forever in your favor. So uh, Trojan is uh, a fellow streamer who's notorious for his yo. So you did you did a good job with your yo there. I'm impressed. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. 
And uh, thanks for the donations. We did indeed have a good EXO, and we've had at least two bonus drops, so... Uh, a good EXO and no death so far. Like, I'm, I'm, right now I'm pretty much past all of the RNG deaths in early game. Like, there could be some later on if I'm unlucky, but we should be good for a few Famous last chapters words. now. Yeah. <laughs> Like, the, the next big one is probably Sid, I think. But, uh, yeah, this is a really great speed run, and even during this sort of downtime where we're having donations be read, Kaya is still really actively trying to do dodges and stuff, and, you know, the break between any two fights is relatively short, so if you compare this to previous Final Fantasies, like, you know, there are stays in just specific areas in Final Fantasy IX or X where you spend more time there than you do in a whole chapter in Final Fantasy XIII. So it's really a uh, really active and fun speed run, very dynamic too. Yeah, this dodge right here is one that Kaya specifically notoriously has, has a lot of trouble with. <laughs> I don't know why. Like the, the retry normally is pretty consistent when you just look at the ground because they start running later, but even that didn't work this time. <laughs> You're supposed to be able to just run through a gap between the, the right and middle one, but sometimes they just go a little bit faster and it doesn't work. Yeah, you, you have to have a very, very straight line between all three basically. Uh, and if it's not working on the first try, it's a bit different on the retry. That's but... also one of my favorite encounters to fight, because you just like spam blitzes at them, and then they all try to heal each other, and while they do, they make this really loud alarm noise. So when it's three of them doing it all at the same time, it gets really fun. But yeah, now we get to show off one of my favorite strats to show to people who haven't really seen a speedrun of this game yet, but have played this game because we get to do a fight completely in the Summon Gestalt mode, and we haven't really explained those yet, right? The, um, but every single summon in this game can transform into a vehicle, pretty much, and Snow Swan is a motorcycle. And then you can do different things, like doing a wheelie onto the enemy, which is what I'm doing right now, or spinning around with some eyes, like I'm doing now. Um, and then at the end of that, you can do a finisher, and with this strat, you purposely line it up in a way that this finisher will kill. Which, for a lot of people, when they play the first time, they will not kill with this finisher. So it's always cool to show up. Yeah, this fight particularly, it's it's pretty rough, especially on PC, where um, there's, a, there's a little bit of weirdness with the way uh, the chain duration works in uh, Gestalt fights like that on PC specifically, so it, unless you do a very, very specific pattern, you will usually run out of um, run out of chain on the on the big guy, and then you won't kill. And then it's kind of annoying because you have to just fight this enemy with, um, with, with only snow. Yeah, for some reason the, the things that the Gestalt hits are different and harder to hit on PC, so Snow just misses hits in this fight, and later on there's a fight where Lightning will miss hits on PC and makes it so you might have to use the finisher when you might not have to on PC. So just to the left here, there's a little branch where you can pick up a Fort Assault chest. That's the one I mentioned earlier. It takes about 33 seconds to pick up, but because Kaya got the lucky Fort Assault drop from those soldiers at the end of Chapter 3, you can now skip this and save some time. Something we haven't talked about too much in this run yet is money. So enemies and fights in this game don't actually drop money. So for the most part, we Ooh, rely on chests to get a lot of our income. In addition to that, we do rely on the drops from enemies that we try to sell. At this point in the run, we start to like look more for drops that we can sell. Specifically, we look for incentive ships, which is a 2500 gil drop we can get from like, human soldier enemies. And that stadium fight was one of the first instances where you can get them. So, and going forward, we'll have more and more fights with soldiers when we want to get a certain amount of incentive chips to try to afford the shops coming up. There is an element of RNG in that aspect in this run where uh, you do need a certain amount of drops to try to get all the money required for certain menus, but there are backups if you don't get them. So it's not the end of the world, but it does lose you some time here and there if you have to go for backups, if you're a bit short. Yeah, most of our guild is going towards buying equipment and upgrading equipment. Um, in Chapter 9, there is a big upgrade that we're targeting to spend all of our guild on, and this is sort of the, what we need to be counting guild for. Yeah, and I, I mentioned earlier that we probably do quite a bit more upgrading than your average casual player, and the, the reason for that is 
like Zero Civ, you don't get any money um, regularly. So outside of selling certain drops, you're not going to have that much. Where we get our money from is just selling equipment from chests, and your average casual player probably just doesn't want to sell all the weapons that you get. But, you know, we can only use one weapon on each character anyway. Yeah, they, so we're not too bothered about just uh, taking the deal to upgrade what we have. The game also has uh, a lot of guaranteed equipment drops, and we know exactly which equipment we need. There's also several quote-unquote very good pieces of equipment that aren't very helpful for speedrunning, like uh, things that give you extra damage reduction. Because we, we don't know how to live using potions and medic and sentinel. But if there's one that's worth like 20,000 gil that reduces the damage by 5%, we can just sell that and use that gil for more damage. We're all about going fast here. Yeah, that's also the reason we, in Chapter 6, we didn't really touch upon that further, but I sold one of Vanille's best weapons yeah, in Chapter anyone. 6. Because for the speedrun, we don't need it, and it gives a lot of gil. I don't know the exact amount. It's, I think it's 5 digits, though, at this point. It's 15,000. Right? It's yeah. yeah, I think you buy for around 31,000, so it's like 16 or 15. It's a lot something. of guild for this point of the game, and that way we can afford upgrading Saz's weapon this much. So, yeah. so. If, if we weren't worried about the money, we totally would equip the bow long. It has a nice secondary effect of increasing debuff chance. Really good. Casually, pretty much the, the one weapon you should ever use on the mill. It's really good, but it sells for too much for us to yeah. uh, keep it, unfortunately. <laughs> And bonus debuff is nice, especially because we are relying very heavily on Vanille uh, inflicting the debuffs, but it's only a couple percentage points in improvement on her base rate, and then we really are relying on the increasing chain and the decreasing resistance with multiple attempts. So in, in practice, it would usually only mean that she inflicts the spell, you know, one or two casts earlier with, with that wand, whereas we can just get 15,000 gil and gives Saz way more damage immediately. And so it just, it usually ends up being better to just sell anything that we're not gonna use and put it in the, the upgrades we need. Uh, so in this chapter, there's several flying enemies, these flying motorcycles, and then there's also flying soldiers. These enemies are very fast and they will catch us. These are also very large battle zones, so you can't really sneak through them. So there's uh, a sequence of multiple D-set cancels here just to get by these. Yeah, now I run back into this bike because then I get put outside of where I left the battle zone as we explained earlier, which is uh, already halfway onto the next enemy. If you want to watch out for where, where the battle zones are, you can actually look at the mini-map in the upper right. It's blue when you're not in a battle zone. When you enter a battle zone, it turns orange. And so you can see it turns orange and then Kaya triggers a set to make the enemy start ignoring him. And then he'll keep running until it turns blue again and then double back to cancel the shroud. As we mentioned earlier, this gives you the, the d set back, so we've taken advantage of its invisibility properties without actually using it. Right here. This, yeah, the battle zone enters here. Yeah, exactly. Now I run back into this bag to get the Deceptus all back. And then we have another menu. So we've already... Where I upgrade a lot. You yeah. can explain that. <laughs> yeah, so we've already upgraded Saz. Uh, our big damage dealers right now are Saz for that party for Saz and Vanille. We also have Lightning, uh, Hope, and Fang, and so Lightning is going to be our big damage dealer in that one, and she is going to get upgraded. Fang is actually doing quite a bit of damage, but she's not a long-term party member, so we're not going any, to invest any gil into her. So Lightning will be getting up, getting an upgrade, and then also Snow in this party. And Snow will, be in, will also be in our final party, so this upgrade will also last us through the rest of the game. So before, okay. before we bought the Polymer Emulsion, that was the best mechanical item. Now we can get the turbo jet, which is a little bit better and again sturdy bones, so we can upgrade multiplier and then dump those those turbo jets and upgrade the weapons. Yeah this specific upgrade is a little bit wacky because you've also got some <laughs> thrust bearings thrown in there that we got from a chest. Yeah normally we just buy 36 sturdy bones and forget about it. But those extra thrust bearings mechanicals decrease your multiplier so we bought enough Sturdy Bones to uh, to use those thrust bearings without decreasing our multiplier. There's also a little bit of a thing that you have to be aware of as a speedrunner, which is that using more upgrades takes time, and so we are a little bit inefficient with our upgrades, but do it 
in a way to make them in the U.S. as fast as possible. So you find the right balance between doing the, the doing the minimum the minimum number of upgrades to get the maximum amount of benefit. Yeah, and in that menu, you get level 20 lightning by doing exactly what I did there. Whereas if you would just use the 36 30 ones, you would only get level 19. So something we haven't mentioned about summon is as you're doing the summon, you actually have a brief period of invincibility. And we're going to take advantage of that in this fight. Yushu uh, has a uh, attack called Tailhammer, which launches you really high into the sky, does a lot of damage. But what we're going to do is going to work in the wait for it, and as soon as he does it, we're going to summon and avoid it completely. A little bit of bearing, though. He does always do it at the same time, so sometimes you have to wait a little bit like this. Yeah, this is pretty bad. He's, mm -hmm. he's taking a long oh. time to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Normally, I prepared, I prepared that long already because the, um, after we did four strings, he has the chance to do that. But if he's actually doing it early or late, that's random. He did it very yeah. late for me. Mm -hmm. It's it, you could summon just before that happens and just get hit by it, but it would take a lot out of your uh, out of your summon time. Something else that's nice about the summons in this game, it's not true for all summons, but it is true for Odin and also Shiva, is that once they attack the enemy, it basically inflicts provoke on the enemy, and then the enemy can only attack uh, the Eidolon. So here, it. The summon doubles as a way for us to get a lot of chain, more than snow or more than hope can provide. And also they tank hits from the enemy and don't lose health, and so you don't have to worry about healing at all. Yeah, so we're not actually using Gestalt or the finisher or anything. Snow is still doing the, the brunt of the damage there. That was a pretty good we've fight. just upgraded his weapon. The only bad thing there was waiting that long for Tailhammer, which defines if it's a really, really fast or slower fight, but Everything else went good. Yeah. We also actually it, just... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's pretty high barrier. It's like, you saw how long Kaya had to wait for the tail hammer there. Sometimes he tail hammers you before you even get finished your fourth string. So it's just something you have to deal with. Go ahead, Rusev. So we actually just reached an important diverging point for the history of this speed run. The original route had Fang as one of the final game party members. Uh, it was called... We call it now the Fang route. Now we have the Snow route, where Snow is one of the main party members. and. By upgrading Snow's weapon there, we sort of got one of the nice first time saves of the Snow Rune, which is that by upgrading him, we save, we save time on that fight. And uh, we'll, we'll explain more why Snow is the character we use later, but uh, now I actually get to use Fang for the first time. Yeah, for, for right now, up to this point, and still for a little bit, we don't actually have control over which uh, party members we, uh, we can use, but for the end game, we will. So these enemies are, the, the class of enemy is called a tilter, and they are also very, very fast, much faster than we are. Um, but there's a cool little trick we can take advantage of with how they move, which is that when they attack you, they sort of attack you a little bit from the right. And so if you run to the left when they attack you, uh, you can avoid their attack even though they're faster than you are. And so that historically has been a dodge that if you fail it, which is pretty likely, you would have to retry and then decept cancel, but because we understand better how enemies move now, we can just run straight by it without problems. Yeah, that was a, a fixed deceptive soul usage in the route for a very long time until we figured out how to dodge it properly. The, the, the tilters are also enemies that are very susceptible to the camera trick, so you can... The camera trick definitely works on that dodge, however, the place that they spawn is your destination, so by camera tricking, you sort of also just put them where you want to go. So it doesn't, it didn't always work, and you know, it would be a place where you could easily lose 25 seconds or something from failing the dodge in a slow way. And now we fight this boss with only hope, which is going to go great for us. And I believe in hope. He's dead. Mm, yeah, oh, that, lucky. That was a good try. <laughs> nice try, hope. <laughs> you almost did damage. So we've we've actually up to this point. Uh, specifically neglected leveling up hope just to save a few seconds right there. Um, we, we could have leveled up hope's uh, HP more before Proto or before the previous boss, but we specifically didn't do that just for that. Mm -hmm. Now, though, um, y you'll notice that we, um, after the little uh, hope section, um, it actually threw us right into the fight uh, proper with... Uh, Lightning and Fang also there. 
um, but he retried the fight and is now doing a big menu. Uh, the reason for this is because there's just no way to do that fight fast without doing a menu here. Like, if we wanted to, we could have done all the Crystarium and stuff earlier, but um, if, if you just get thrown into that fight right there, you have a really bad Paradigm deck. Um, so, like... It's just faster to retry it, set up properly, and then do the fight fast. Now I say fast, this is still one of the longest fights in the run. Um, mostly because we have no way of taking advantage of offensive buffs and debuffs. Right now our only characters who can actually cast those are Saz and Vinny. Um, and unlike with some other fights like Anima or Proto, we don't have the luxury of being able to use Fortisol here to get at least uh, offensive buffs on ourselves, uh, specifically because of that little hope section at the start. So what would happen if you use the Fortisol coming into this boss? Hope would have buffs at the start. Great, he can't win by himself. And then you wouldn't have them for the actual fight. Yeah, even if you want to, as once said, you can't win. Like the the fight ends in three ways: either after a time limit, or when you die, which is what we do in the run. Or the third option, I don't know exactly how much, but after you do a certain amount of I think damage, two percent is HP. So even if you're very fast, you just cannot win the fight. You would just like trigger the cutscene anyways with damage. So this will be the first fight in the run where we actually have to stagger the same enemy twice. Uh, which is, believe it or not, quite a rarity. There's only, I think, four or five fights in the run where we have to do that. There's a few where you can do that if it goes poorly, but yeah, this is the first one where you have to do it multiple. Yeah, we've, we've done just, just over half as uh, HP. Um, another thing that we are seeing here for the first time, I believe, is the launch ability. Um, so, most of your commandos can learn this ability where when an enemy is staggered, you just yeet them into the air. And that makes interruption a whole lot easier because it, they just can't do anything until they get back down and recover. Well, Fang is not really launching. <laughs> or you can fail all of them. <laughs> yeah, some enemies actually have something called launch resistance where they have a chance to not get launched. It's pretty unlikely to miss a full uh, string of three launches, though, on I, this fight. I believe for for him it's 50% to, to fail each launch, so if you have a sequence of three, then you know it's one in eight to, to fail all three. This is actually getting scary now, uh, yeah. because because I missed Smite in the first phase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah dam damage is a little bit uh, a little bit dicey here. There there are some small. Uh, small things that we're not getting. At the end of Stagger, you'd ideally get an ability called Smite. Uh, you might see it here. Oh, oh my god. This is bad. <laughs> yeah, so what, what ideally happens is... Um, oh, if, wrong one. If Stagger is about to run out, Fang has an ability where if she attacks a, a launched enemy right before Stagger is, uh, is about to run out, then she'll do a really big hit where she smashes the enemy into the ground and it does a whole lot of damage. Um, but we missed that on both staggers, so we're actually going to have to <laughs> clean up here. I actually hit it. it on the first stagger, yeah. but it, it, it ran out. And I think exactly the same happened on the second, so I didn't get the damage from stagger. I just had 100% chain. Yeah, so that was a bit of an unfortunate <laughs> fight, but yeah, that lost clean bit. it up. That fight luckily doesn't do too much damage, so even when you fail the kill, you're fine for the most part. So next up is one of the worst fights in the whole run. It's such a frustrating fight to try and you know find the best strategy for and execute. Specifically, there's two flying enemies and two normal soldiers, and they can all interrupt you. The goal for this fight is to summon Odin and then have Odin help you inflict chain duration on all of them. Once you have enough chain duration on all of them, you'll be able to just go into your just alt and kill them using Odin's just alt abilities, but you have to have duration on every enemy. And interruptions will make it so that the, you know, your, your attempts to inflict chain duration fail. And then if they get you into yellow HP, Odin will start trying to kill you instead of adding chain duration, so. Yeah, this fight is looking pretty rough. Yeah. Yep. I don't think he's gonna manage to stagger everything here. Oh, and Odin turns. 
That is uh, the worst that can happen. Yeah. It keeps yeah. <laughs> two will survive, but I, I still got two. Two will survive, probably. This is very unlucky. <laughs> It's yeah. a bit, th th this is one of the most disliked fight in the in the run for speedrunners. A good fight can be 20 to 30 seconds, but it can just go up to a minute or even more if it gets annoying enough, and you can just die also because of these interruptions. Yeah, I have died this fight before. It's not it's not pleasant. And Kaya didn't do anything wrong at all there. Like, uh, Odin getting stuck turning like that. Odin turns a lot when you change targets, so you try to avoid changing targets once we're in just salt mode. But sometimes he just decides he wants to turn for no real reason. That was yeah, one of those good. times. Right, save. You can sometimes die here because these Aerith Soldiers do a lot of damage, so that's why you want to kill them with Odin. They, they'll kill your characters in two consecutive strings, and they like to target the same character multiple times, and so if you don't potion, you can get interrupted before you can even potion, and then they just die, and it's very frustrating. We, this place we are fighting now is actually Hope's House, and so we call these Hope's House 1 and Hope's House 2. Hope's House 2 is much more consistent, because there's no flying soldiers that do the massive damage interruptions, but... Yeah, this looks pretty good. So after this, we're going to have access to one of our actual first late game accessories. Um, it's not the actual late game accessory itself, but we will upgrade it to that level. It's called the Brawler's Wristband. Uh, it's the second to best of the physical accessories we'll have access to. Or I guess it's the third to best, but we'll be able to upgrade it to the second to best and then eventually get some of the best one. But this is the first accessory that we're getting that we'll be using all the way until the very end of the run. Um, for now, it's just a nice little boost in power, but we'll be upgrading it next chapter. Mm -hmm. And then, going into this next fight, we're going to be equipping Lightning with a full strength spec, and then moving our magic spec over to Fang. Until now, Fang has been the, the physical spec. Um, specifically for this fight, we're going to be fighting against something called the Havoc Sky Tank. And Lightning, for this one fight, gets a special ability, which is that her attack becomes bullets. You know, her, her, gun is a, her, her blade is a gun blade, and typically she just does slashes with a single finishing bullet. But for some reason here, because it's a long-range enemy, she's able to do this really cool gun attack. This boss is sort of interesting. He's got a main body and four sub-bodies, and we can summon Odin to take out these four hulls and turrets. And Lightning is doing the bulk of the damage, but Odin is really nice here because he draws the fire of the, of the Sky Tank. He has a very annoying attack called Plasma Blasters, which can launch, but as long as Plasma Blaster is hitting, Odin it's, Lightning doesn't it's it's an absolute tragedy to me that auto battle in this fight will never actually use attack. I don't know why they designed this this cool animation that's also really useful because just look at how fast we're getting this damage in with this animation. And then auto battle just never uses it. And a lot of people only ever use auto battle so they never even see that this exists. This fight is also a bit of a meme because there's a there's a game FAQs tutorial for speedrunning this game, which does a lot of things that are not very fast compared to the strategies that we use. And it, it, we actually, to be fair, it was written like less than a year after the game <laughs> came out, so we, we can cut that guy some slack. But. True, true. But it's, it's funny because we made fun of him for writing that you should summon Odin in this fight, and then he eventually turned out that that was the fast way to do it. Um, I think it was Shirasu who discovered the... Yeah, this, this, this was one of Shirasu's strengths. Yeah, one of the Japanese runners, and we were we were just like watching his run, and there hasn't been the most communication between the Japanese and uh, North American, or not sorry, outside of Japan communities. And uh, Shirasu is, you know, someone that we haven't talked to much. But Aussie is another Japanese runner that we have spent more time talking to and communicating with. And uh, this is one of the strategies that is has been improved upon through that uh, coordination. <laughs> Yeah, and that is chapter 7, and with that we are entering the shortest chapter in the run, if I get good RNG on the boss fight later on. But also a lot of downtime, so you can read a few donations now. Yeah, it's it's not even dodging minutes. at this point, it's just a little mini game. so it's a good yeah. time donations. Here's a mini game and a menu. Alright, we have a $100 donation from Kubaru saying, Hi Kaya, happy to see you running Final Fantasy XIII at AGDQ. Love this game and love this speed run. Unfortunately, I am stuck at work and can't watch live, but had to donate. Best of luck on the run and can't wait to watch the VOD when I can. Putting my money towards the blindfolded Dahaka fight. Hope Dahaka and PC2 are nice to you. 
And we have a $13 donation from Tyler Salt saying, always donate for blindfolded Final Fantasy incentives. Wild. And $5 from Apollo donated saying, I just want to see a guy play a video game blindfolded. Who doesn't? I'm going to tell you that we are uh, we have about $32,000 left on the Dahaka fight. You're, it's, we're, we're coming up to it. So you need to get your donations in if you want to see that fight and for Kayarun not to be able to see that fight. I think that's the better <laughs> part of it. <laughs> we also have a $100 donation from Yaros, Yarus and I saying Final Fantasy 13 is my favorite Final Fantasy and I am so happy to see it being run. Keep up the great work, everyone. Money goes towards the blindfolded Dahaka fight. And we have a $25 donation from Sneaksy saying definitely bringing me back with the music in this game. Here's to get more Final Fantasy today. I agree, the, the music is amazing in this. I do love the music in this game. And we have a $25 donation from Megas saying played this game when I was in high school, was amazed by the graphic battle mechanics and music at the time. Here is some incentive for the blindfolded fight. And we have a $50 donation from John saying, keep it up, you are all amazing. Let's get that bonus game. And we have a 50, oh. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, this last one, $54 from Miyuki Dawn saying, Final Fantasy 13 is one of my favorite Final Fantasy games of all time. So excited to see this game being absolutely destroyed at AGDQ. Now back to you. Right, thank you for those donations, everyone. So for this part of the story, as I mentioned, we've split up. So this is a totally different area from where we were previously, and now we're following Saz and Neil. And there's just a little mini game coming up where Saz's Chocobo runs away and makes the tracking down a few times. It's a bit of an interesting thing from a routing perspective because the final piece of, or the, the prize for that mini game is an accessory, which we are basically going to sell as soon as we can. But that accessory appears in the menu and actually changes the inputs for the menu. Ideally, you want to just optimize to, to give the accessories, but Optimize likes to put that accessory on, even though we just want to sell it. So Kaya did the menu before, just so we can do that menu a little bit more optimally. Yeah, but the biggest thing I got in that menu is Saz's Blitz, which is normally an AoE ability for every character except Vanille, because with her weapon, she apparently cannot really use that. Um, but Saz's Blitz is special because he's using guns and shoots bullets out. And even though it's an AoE ability, you can use that on single targets as well. And when the target is big enough or very close, you will hit the majority of those bullets and do way more DPS than you would do with normal attacks, even on single targets. And we can see that in this chapter already. So that's why I said it now. Yeah, we're going to be leaning very heavily on Saz's Blitz. It's extremely OP. Saz is kind of notorious for not being the strongest commando because of his stats, but if you look at his ability to damage with uh, Blitz and also his possession of one of the strongest weapons, which we don't use in the speed run, but the, the combination of those two things means that he's able to output massive damage and he's pretty much the leader for every speed run category except for like late game plot percent where <laughs> finally Fang starts to outmatch him. Yeah, because of the Blitz with little Crystarium development, and we have pretty little Crystarium development, he's just by far the best DPS character. So that uh, that accessory that we just got, Star Pendant, is an example of a type of accessory that you can get in this game, which is actually pretty terrible. The next boss inflicts poison, and that accessory is a resisting poison accessory. But accessory slots are pretty sparse. At this point in the game, you can only have two or three accessories it's equipped at once. And it's not even can't get poison, it's lower chance for poison to be inflicted. So, you know, you can spend a third of your accessory, or a third or half of your accessory space just to have a slightly lower chance to have a not that bad stats be inflicted. So it's just, it's just guilt yeah. for us. We're going to sell it as soon as we can. It's not good. And also here we have a single enemy, which we kill with basically two attacks. Attack yeah, look conflict. at this damage now. Like that is Saz's Blitz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Blitz, is, Blitz is seven bullets, and the design intention is that the bullets get spread upon the multiple enemies, but you know, that's a single tiny, tiny enemy standing directly in front of us, and it just takes the full breadth of the seven attacks. And each each Blitz bullet actually does more damage than a single attack bullet, I believe, but the players work out that way. Uh, so, 
It, it does more than a single bullet, but Saz's regular attacks are two bullets, so it does less than, than an attack, but... But yeah. it does seven, so... And here we make heavy use of that now. Once this guy gets staggered, we'll be just spamming blitzes with Saz, and you'll see how much how much damage this blitz can output. So this boss is a little bit annoying. He inflicts poison. Um, poison is basically set up so that once it's been inflicted for six minutes, it'll kill you from full HP. And so, as you can see, Saz's HP is slowly taking down. It's doing like you know, a damage every a little bit faster than every second. Um, but we have relatively low HP. Enemies have much, much more HP, so it's, poison is better for us because of how much HP the enemies have. This boss is also annoying because he has relatively high resistances to the debuffs. However, Kaya got lucky here. <laughs> Very lucky, actually. He got everything. You can go this whole fight without getting lot, buffs. Yeah, but Neil did a lot of poison casts before Stagger. Uh, I think that's something we also haven't explained yet, but enemies' resistance to debuffs gets way lower the more buffs miss, or the more debuffs miss. And she had a bunch that missed before Stagger, so each poison had a higher chance to inflict afterwards. Yeah, so b between that and um, debuff scaling with uh, chain, or the debuff chance scaling with chain, you uh, get more and more likely to land them as you go. All right, and that was a good fight. It was a very good fight. Yeah. That fight can be very... Yeah, sorry, I'll uh, go real quick. That fight can be very painful because Vanille is not guaranteed to get debuffs, and you can get away without getting poison or D-Shell, but you do need deep protect. If she inflicts it late, you generally don't have enough time to kill it in one stagger. So depending on HP, you have to kill him after stagger or re-stagger, and it takes quite a bit longer. Yeah. It, it basically works that there's some percentage for the debuff to land, and <sighs> that fit gets multiplied by the chain, as we've mentioned, but also that base percentage increases by a certain fixed amount every time it misses, so... Keep trying and you'll eventually be guaranteed to land it, but it could take a long time, especially poison is a very low base base rate, so it's rare to get poison first, and it can often... Then that fight, you'll, you'll often not even get poison at all. But there, we got it before the protect even, so very nice. So this is actually the, the next just all fight. This is Saz's Eidolon, Brunhilder. Um, this is a really interesting fight. Something we haven't mentioned in this game is something called the Conditional Modifier. It's sort of a very subtle thing. Um, the game likes to alternate abilities because when you alternate abilities, you get a little bit of extra chain. It doesn't really make a difference for the most part, except here is kind of a cool mechanic, which is that um, Blitz and Attack are two different moves, so we get a conditional modifier from doing different moves, but that conditional modifier gets applied to every single Blitz bullet. So, an Attack plus a Blitz gets a massive increase here, and we've also infrosted Saz, so Brynhildr is a fire, you can see he's on fire, literally his shoulders, um, but the, by infrosting Saz, we don't really care about the damage, but that conditional modifier plus the modifier from inflicting ice damage to him, uh, or to her is a really big, really big thing. So that's kind of a very specific strategy for just that fight. And it's uh, really, really interesting. Yeah. And it's also RNG because the amount of bullets bullet that hits depends on how far away the enemy is and if he likes to back up. And so you can just be sitting there with only two or three bullets bullets hitting from far away. And uh, it can take a long time or she can walk right up to you and just win the fight instantly. And now we're actually in Chapter 9 already, because, as I said, Chapter 8 is very fast if we get lucky in the fights. <laughs> um, this is one of the longer chapters overall. So, in this fight, or in these first two fights, we're basically going to be summoning Odin. Odin is really good in fights where the enemies themselves have low HP because of that kill threshold for Zentetskin. So here we can just stagger them, and then once everything is staggered, Zentetskin will instantly kill. Whereas if we didn't do this, we'd have to be taking these out one by one. So it's a really nice way to just kill everything together quickly. Particularly yes. in this fight, because at this point you didn't have a chance to change your paradigms for your party yet, so you'd be stuck with default, which aren't the best. Yeah, it's basically a cold start in this fight with bad paradigms. For this next fight, we can change the paradigms, but it ends up being faster to just use the use an ether saw and then summon. Yeah, Aether Soul is a strat that we haven't really talked about yet, I think. Um, the idea of it is that, uh, unlike all the other ones, it doesn't really grant you any buffs. It is just essentially a TP restoration item. 
Um, we can't get that one as drops from fights, we just get it from certain chests and uh, equipment dismantles. You think someone this has actually been... Okay, that's right. Right. Say, say, same thing. This I, I actually, wanted to yeah. say, yeah, yeah, exactly. This has actually <laughs> been the, the most recent change to the route. We didn't have an Aethersol for this fight initially and used it on the Proto Florian fight, but now we delay it until here just to have this fight be way more consistent and faster. In addition to that, let's just move some menus a little bit further into a chapter where we can get a little bit more value out of them. So we get a bit more time saved on later fights as well. <laughs> To give you an idea of how recent this route changes, while Proto was being fought, one of the top runners in the Discord was like, wait a second, what, what about XO Ice? What, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, one Japanese runner, Left Bishop, um, did this for a while already, but we didn't really find a consistent way to beat XO Ice without stalling it as well, and treating Ice the same way as Fire would mean that you would have a 50% chance of losing time there by stalling. But now we found a way to get around that and can do it. Something else that we can mention is when you're creating the paradigms, we typically just want to just set the things that we know are best. And there's a function called generate, which is available, which tries to sort of give you either offensive, defensive, or balanced paradigms. It's not that good because it tries to give you like medic and sentinel when you don't want them. However, here, um, there's a certain pattern that we can give to just repeatedly apply the offensive balanced paradigm generator and get exactly the paradigms we want. We've done it a few times in the previous chapters but didn't mention, um, but typically it's faster to just put them yourselves, but in these specific places the generate can do it a little bit faster. Yeah. This is another one of the relatively recent optimizations. Especially in the late game when we want to start making very specific uh, paradigms. We basically have to make all of them ourselves, but like in the early game, generate tends to work out uh, more often because the, the paradigms we're making are pretty basic. Specifically here, the paradigms we want are um, one commando and two ravagers, which is our maximum chaining, two commandos and one ravager, which is our maximum damage, and then one saboteur and two ravagers, which is our maximum debuffing. And the game really wants to give you one Debuff, or one Saboteur, one Commando, one Ravager, which is sort of just a middle ground that's not the best at anything. And so when you're doing the generations, you have to cycle past that and say, no, 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 I don't want that. I want the, the ones that are specifically good at one thing, not the balanced one, even when you're doing the offensive generation. All right, uh, right now would be a good time for some more donations. Absolutely. Uh, so we have $5.40 from the Scruffington saying, good luck, Kaya. The Final Fantasy 13 community is one of the best in speedrunning, and I'm happy to see the game finally get its chance to shine at a GDQ. Also, can 2022 be the year we stop pretending like Final Fantasy 13 is a bad game? And uh, we have $25 from Darkix Cow saying, uh, good luck with the run, Kaya. Hopefully the RNG is on your side and may Fortisol favor the brave. And a $54 donation from Madelon saying, I've recently been learning this run myself, and it's a lot of fun. Thanks for getting me excited for the speed run, Kaya, and good luck. Thank you. So right now uh, is actually one of my favorite songs in the whole soundtrack. It's Fang's theme. Unfortunately, they decided to add a siren in the background because we're infiltrating <laughs> this enemy airship, and they just decided to play a siren over my favorite song, and it makes me sad. But... We're about to it's it's over Saber's. Yeah, it's over Saber's Edge as well, though. Like, the main boss theme will play soon in the next area, and we still hear the siren. So. But now we have the Two Flamed fight upcoming next, which is another showcase of how strong Saz's Blitz is. Yeah. Blitz plus, plus deep, or plus uh, elemental weakness. So, these guys are weak to water, and so we can in water Saz and make him do double damage to them. Plus, seven blitz bullets at a time, and then ideally plus uh, stagger and de-protect from vanilla, but that's not always possible. These guys kind of yeah. just like to stare off into space, and sometimes they stare directly at you and they catch you, and sometimes they stare completely the wrong way and you can preempt them. It's pretty random. This time it looked pretty bad for the preempt, actually, because they stay both on the walls. Okay, maybe? 
Okay, got it. Yeah, he was basically looking at Saz, but didn't notice him. It's just the way this one goes. <laughs> so, typically Vanille will be able to inflict D-Protect here because of the high chain from the preempt. And then, yeah, Saz just hits him with the Blitz, and that, that should be enough. And deleted. It's really quick, but that really is a quick application of the of yeah. all of the multipliers we've talked about. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, all right, yeah. Well, actually, with those plans defeated, it's actually time for me to go. Uh, so thank you all so much for letting me read these awesome donations. Sabera Messi is about to come in to take care of y'all uh, for the rest of this run. So uh, real quick, uh, Sabera Messi, uh, just quick word. There's catering over here, but there's this dude named Ingus. Ingus, he said uh, he's got a new recipe, but it's just uh, like 54 cups of noodles. Uh, so you may just want to dodge that, but use your judgment. Anyway, my name is Bobby Blackwolf. I will be back Thursday for Lost Judgment. But right now, Sabera Messi, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Bobby. I really appreciate that. If it's uh, instant noodles, I'll just make sure to bring my own veggies. Folks, I am really excited to be hosting for you here today. I want to remind everybody that we are just over $30,000 away from that blindfolded Dahaka fight. So if you want to see that, and believe me, you want to see that, get your donations in now. And speaking of donations, uh, do we have time for uh, a couple before? Uh... Yes. Yeah, go All on. right. Like Let's go on ahead uh, here. Let's, uh, we've got $50 from Mr. Popo saying, got here just as the Final Fantasy 13 run started. The Final Fantasy runs are always some of my favorites. This goes for that blindfold incentive. Uh, we have $54 from Valerian saying, I certainly love this game. It was my first Final Fantasy. Just the title screen music had me in a nostalgic mood about it. And of course I had to donate. We have time for a couple more. Uh, actually, we're about to get into another important fight. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I'll also mention that uh, if the catering's not to your taste, we have some vibrant ooze and mysterious fluids that these enemies drop if you want some of that. <laughs> yeah. But um, for this next fight, we, it, this is sort of another pretty annoying fight because both of these enemies are capable of interrupting and launching your party members. And uh, one of them has high HP, one of them has low HP. The low HP one is this sort of flying bug thing called the Vespid Soldier, and he can cast a Roga, which is very, very annoying, but luckily we did not get it this time. Um, oh? Uh, no. Maybe we will. <laughs> maybe we will. Maybe we will. Okay, we're good. Right. I get yeah. launched, but it's fine. <laughs> but immediately south gets launched. Um, there's also an interesting mechanic behind these sort of armadillo-like creatures. Uh, they have a shell, which you have to, which will break when you stagger him. So Vanille's going to add some debuffs, which will help us out in the long run, and then we're just going to try and stagger him as quickly as possible. Um, he's also weak to water, and so we did a quick in, in water there. Um, but, as we mentioned before, the potion will keep us from getting launched, so by waiting and then using the potion at the right time, Saz stays on the ground, and, ooh, looks like we lost chain. Nope, that was ah. very close, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, once he staggers, his shell will go away, he'll start taking more damage, and we'll be able to kill him with only a few blitzes. Yeah, I have and water now with the weakness from him, and now he's close, so the majority of the bullets hit, and that's just a lot of damage combined with D-Protect. These enemies... Well, now D-Protect is gone. Unless D-Protect but... falls off, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get D-Protect inflicted right at the start, it's typically good, but in this fight, since it goes for more than a minute, it is bad, and it wears on. Yeah, that's yeah. an example of getting too lucky with debuffs. Yeah, because Vanille inflicted D-Protect pretty much at 100% chain, and then I only had the base duration for it. So lucky we're unlucky. Let's just be <laughs> running. Right, we're going to have a menu here where we're going to upgrade that Brawler's Wristband, and it'll become a Warrior's Wristband, which is something that we're going to have equipped for the rest of the run. Uh, but that's sort of a long bit, and then we have some dodging, so that now it actually be a good time for some donations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, $25 from Long Way Down 42 saying, I've got to be careful or else I'll blow my donation budget for the week. That said, we've got a blindfold incentive and it would be a crime to miss it. Good luck to the runners and thank you to all the people making this marathon go. We also have $100 from Kaito Ace saying, Blindfold, blindfold, blindfold. 
at $25 from Acer saying, this friend has made me see Final Fantasy 13 in a new light. Good luck with Pulse and let's get that blindfolded fight. Thank you so much, everybody, for all the donations. Thank you so much. So this is sort of the menu we've been saving up gil for. Kai actually went out of his way to get an extra gil chest. Uh, it seems like we've been having pretty bad gil drops so far, but Calculated. that's just... Calculated. Yeah. He got both exactly <laughs> zero. chests. <laughs> yeah, the... I got both chests, yeah. Yeah, you got the the, the... the Ember Ring and the extra... organic... or the extra mechanical components. It's still going oil. Well. It's the poor still going oil. And you still could not afford as many potions as you wanted, right? So... Nope, so I will still buy more. So and that potion <laughs> count was bad before, too, so it's a little rough. Also yeah, really that is quick. because a lot of fights went not as planned earlier, so I had to use more potions than normally. Like, normally we have around 15 to 20 potions here. I had, like, six, I think. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and so. speaking of potions, we actually just dismantled our one of our two Doctor's Codes. We're still going to be using the other one, but the equipment management is such that we want to dismantle that one now. We also want that for the soul because we're going to be using it on the final boss of this, of this segment. But for now, it's... Uh, a little bit of dodging, and then we're coming up on an enemy called the Calavinka Striker. This is actually a two-part boss, or I guess technically it's two different sets of the same enemy within the story. But he's sort of an interesting, interesting boss because he is... Uh, you, you can't use a shroud on the second one for the same reason as Ushu 1, or sorry, Ushu 2. The first fight is shorter, and you might want to use a shroud for the second fight if you could, but you can't because the first, the first part of the fight is there, stopping you. Um, and then in this fight, we're going to be looking for a lot of different things, like interruptions and targeting of the of the of the boss. The second part of the fight specifically has a really big attack, which would be enough to kill the main party member. And a relatively recent strat was discovered because he tends to target, or not, he doesn't. He is forced to target the character with the least HP. So. What we would do before is we'd have Fang be a sentinel and she would draw aggro, so she doesn't have the lowest HP, but she can provoke him. But instead, we're like, wait a second, if we just have everyone at full HP, Hope will have the least HP and we can just let Hope die. So this is this new strat yep. for the second part is the Hope Sacrifice. Also, the first phase, he has a very consistent interruption pattern that Zero actually found out, which we will see after this dagger, and I think that's a really cool one. Because when you now do one ruin, Hope spells hit, you do one ruin, now Fang attacks, you queue up four ruins, that will interrupt, and then Hope attacks again while you do three ruins with Lightning to synchronize it with Fang now, and get a refresh. And we keep this up until he's dead in phase one. Fang is also a saboteur. Fang and Vanilla are the two people that have access to saboteur skills. But the big difference between them is that Fang casts debilitations, not debuffs. Debilitations make enemies go slower or take interruptions, so right now he has slow, and Fang is also going to inflict curse, which makes it easier for him to be interrupted. But this is a speed run. We would rather have them die faster, being able to do all their moves, instead of have them go slower and have the fight be slow, right? So this is one of the reasons why Vanille is going to be our long-term saboteur instead of Fang. But right now we don't have access to Vanille, and so we have to rely on debilitations instead of debuffs. So at the start here, we have, he has a fixed pattern where he does his single target attack several times on the same character, and then he'll do his spin attack. Once he's finished this pattern, he'll do his big attack, which, as I mentioned, will target Hope, and we'll just we have a, a routed in Phoenix down to bring Hope back to life. Ideally, you can actually stagger him just before he does his big attack, but it's rare to be able to actually pull it off successfully. Looks good right now, though. Okay, never mind. It was close. <laughs> it was close. Barely yeah. too late. Yeah. yeah. Very nearly. Once, once he starts going up uh, during that animation, you actually can't stagger cancel it anymore. This Not actually, every single move can be can be stagger canceled. It's pretty, this pretty is rare. a fight that has gotten sort of more and more close to the edge of being scary. Where originally we'd have protect and the sentinel, and now we don't use either. But <laughs> despite seeming scary, understanding the patterns and possible targets actually makes it reasonably safe. Despite uh, you know seeming scary at points like that. Also knowing how much damage he does, for example, to know if you need to potion or not. Right, he does around 300 damage with a single target, so if you're at 350, you're safe. Yeah, 350 pre-max, it's like three separate attacks that cap at 111. So, that's a safe number. One of the little optimizations we did recently is we swapped Hope's equipment a little bit in Chapter 7. He used to have a Silver Bangle, now he has a Tungsten, which gives him 50 more HP than the Silver Bangle. 
And it's just so a Phoenix down on her Vizen will give him 336 HP, which will give him enough to survive one lightning attack always after a Phoenix down. Whereas with the Silver Bangle, if you revived him and he gets instantly hit by a lightning attack, there was a chance that he died. So it's a nice right. little optimization. I just sold some Phoenix stones now to get more potions because we'll need those. But now we're good on that. Yeah, so this coming next up section is... will be pretty heavy yeah, on potion use. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead to uh, talk about the bridges. Yeah, so this has actually <laughs> been one of the more interesting sections of the game in terms of routing, and it's changed massively over the years. Um, so basically, there's a section here where we have to cross multiple platforms, and the platforms are connected by bridges. Every single platform, or not every single platform, but most of the platforms have enemies, and the enemies stop you from unlocking the bridges between the platforms. And so, basically, we have to find the route through these bridges, finding you know, the best enemies to get through the shortest route. However, there's a glitch, or maybe not glitch, but there's an intended mechanic that we take advantage of. You want to try and Again, explain that just one thing? It's an exploit, rather, that you see after the second fight. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, well, there's going to be two fights here first. Um, but the, the, the idea is that we pretty much just try to go straight down. So if we were uh, going to take the path straight down, uh, then we would end up fighting four battles. Um, we're actually only going to go fight two and then use a little bit of a glitch, exploit, whatever you want to call it, um, to skip the remaining two. So the, the way that works is we've kind of talked about battle zones, right? So every encounter has a zone associated with it in which uh, the enemies will generally stay and uh, where they will aggro onto you. Um, now something else that happens in a lot of areas, especially big areas like this one, is that um, the there are certain lines that we can't see uh, where the enemies will spawn or despawn spawn if you uh, go beyond the spawn line and despawn if you go away far enough and cross the despawn line just so that the game doesn't have to render everything um in this specific instance um the spawn and despawn lines for the next two encounters are located uh, quite close to each other and are both located within battle zones of other encounters so we can uh, do a tricksy little thing. What you're essentially going to see Kaya do is he's going to run a little ways down uh, after this fight. Well, I think he's going to do the menu first, which works out great because I still need to explain this first. <laughs> it's pretty complicated. Yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated. And I get this turning animation again the entire time. We're pretty unlucky on Odin fights, apparently. <laughs> so what he's, what he's going to do is he's going to run down um, a little ways until he knows that he has respawned um, the first one of these fights that he's just fought. Um, then what he's going to do is run back into the battle zone of that fight. Within that battle zone are contained the spawn and the spawn lines for the third encounter that we are trying to skip. So what will happen is he crosses the um, the spawn line first, which is close to the encounter, but the enemies are already spawned, so nothing happens. Then he will cross the despawn line a little bit further away. Um, that will despawn the encounter that we're trying to skip. Now, normally, after that happens, if you try to just run back, you'll cross the spawn line again and spawn the enemies again. But by running into the encounter like this and then retrying it, we get put back outside of the battle zone, and this is beyond the spawn line. So now we, in effect, uh, teleported by retrying that battle past the spawn line, and the enemies now will not spawn anymore. So now yeah. you see that on this platform where there were previously a bunch of enemies, they are now no longer there. Um, and the same will be on this platform. Like, now yeah. you see these. there are enemies, but in, yeah. like, roughly one minute, they're gone. Yeah, right down there you see a whole bunch of enemies. We used to have to fight the, that, the, the this was actually a pretty pretty dangerous fight. There's four of those aerial snipers. <laughs> so just there where he doubled back, that was the line where the previous fight respawns. Yeah, now there are enemies again. And before when I went across this platform to go down, they weren't there because they weren't respawned yet. And now yeah. he's far enough away that that more distant encounter has despawned. And then when he reappears, he'll be past the point where they would spawn, and so they're exactly. not there anymore. 
pretty complicated. And this is the only thing that is close to a glitch in this game. But even that is not a glitch because this was coded on purpose like that because of the hardware limitations PS3 and Xbox had back then. Uh, where they just couldn't load all enemies at the same time in this gigantic area. Yeah. With all the running back and forth, <laughs> this still takes a little bit, but it saves a good minute uh, skipping these two fights. And this, this is something that changed a lot over the time since it was discovered, because the exact conditions for the respawn weren't fully understood. And there's also the possibility of diverging to the left side and fighting a different third enemy and then doubling back to, to respawn that second fight. That second fight is actually one of the slower fights you can do, but it saves having to open more bridges and fight a third fight. And so this is currently the, the fastest way we've found for getting through this section. Also upcoming next, uh, you guys can explain it when I'm doing it, but this is one of my favorite strats in the run, and I hope I will get it because it is very difficult. Yeah, we are about to but... get our first fight with the uh, sort of the big bad of the game uh, called Barthandalus. And uh, this is a big casual wall, too. Yeah, absolutely. This fight is really hard. So, and the speedrun strat is even harder because, yeah, so you guys will explain it. Yeah, yes. we're using a we're using a Fortisol here. Um, even though we do have Saz in the party to cast uh, all those buffs, uh, the reason for that is we want him to focus on uh, buffing us with elemental end spells. Um, the side heads of Bart uh, all are. <laughs> Uh, weak to different elements, so this way we can get him right onto uh, giving us the spells that make us deal big damage. So there's there's the main boss and the, the right and left subheads, and each one is, is weak to a different element. So lightning and snow are going to be in commando for the bulk of this part of the fight, and Saz is going to be a synergist giving the right in spells, and then a commando once all those are set, and then we'll go back once heads die and we need to change our in spells. Um, but another interesting thing about Final Fantasy XIII, which changes for the future games, is that the Commando AI is set to target different enemies from other Commandos. So right now we're in the three Commando role, and all three of them are targeting different enemies. Um, in Final Fantasy XIII too, you have the option to make uh, wide or targeted paradigms, where you can have your three Commandos target separate things or target the same thing. But once this, this head, which was weak to ice, dies, now we go back to the paradigm with Saz as a synergist, and now we can in water because this head is weak to water. And we can also set snow to lightning to kill the head, which is weak to lightning. And this is how and so we, we so um, taking advantage of that everyone targeting different uh, heads thing is, is a lot more convenient than having to buff everyone separately uh, every time to, to take on each of the heads in sequence. Not that we could do that anyway because of the way the targeting works. Um, and so now we're uh, setting up for the second part of the fight. Um, now we have to damage the main body. Um, the main concern with this part of the fight is that he will, once we've damaged him uh, enough, he is going to try to do a move called the Strudo. Um, it's a pretty dangerous move, though. We'll, we aren't really too worried about it uh, killing us, but we are worried about the fact that it will reset the uh, chain and then we would have to stagger them all over again and it's really slow. So this is another big interruption strat. Coming up right here, he's gonna start damaging him, and if we can get this lined up correctly between the three party members, he should not get any chance to do anything. With with previous interruption strats, it's, it's largely more been a thing of, well, if they, as, as long as they don't get time to attack us, it's fine, but if you give this guy like a second, he will, start doing the street going, you can't interrupt it at that point. So we need to maintain yeah. constant interruption here. And Kaya did it beautifully it. here. That was a very nice fight. Nice fight. Very good. Yeah, Destrudo is an example of something which is pretty rare in this game, but it's a chain break. So, you know, we're doing eight times damage and interrupting because of the stagger, and he just goes back to to base chain and we lose that eight times multiplier if you lose interruption there and you basically just have to re-stagger and it's very slow. But this uh, strat showcases a lot of the mechanics of the combat that a lot of people just don't know, like what the guy said, the, the targeting AI, the minip that I like purposely have my party target what I want them to target on the head face to make the foreheads die very fast, and then the, the stun lock on the main boss. 
I just like this thread a lot. Yeah, and there's another little thing which we didn't mention, which is that um, we used a Libra scope in that fight. As I mentioned, Libra gives your party members the information they need to operate properly. So there, by using a Libra scope, you learn the elemental weaknesses of all four heads, and Saz is able to immediately start in, in, in spelling people. Um, also, Snow will not try and do a ruin, and he'll stick to straight hit his normal attacks. Uh, and no. Out of the frying pan, into the fire, we've got another fight here. Um, this fight is against two pulse work knights, and we now have the ability to uh, change our party, and after this fight, we'll be able to change our party completely. But uh, this fight is pretty annoying because the uh, Snow likes to fail to provoke here. We want Snow to be taking the damage because he has much more HP than everyone else. And they, these guys also like to wander around basically randomly, whereas we are trying to hit them with an AoE spell from laning. So. Mm, okay. Oh, also nice that. Here. <laughs> okay, I think I'm fine. So we basically want to just stagger these two guys and hope that they stand close together. They're also weak to fire, and that's just something that's, that Staz will learn as the fight goes on. Sometimes you can win the fight fast enough that he won't figure it out. Um, it's also possible to Libra here, but the time it takes to Libra takes away from chaining. But that's just a quick little fight at the start to show off a few of the new things that you're able to do with the uh, ability to change your party. And now we have a long running section before the next boss. The next boss is one of the more difficult ones in the whole run, especially with the current iteration. But until then, it's just a dodging section. So now if you could time for donations. Yeah, absolutely. We have $500 from Nats fan saying, I have simple tastes. Put blindfolded in an incentive and I'll donate for it. Thank you very much, Nats fan. We also have $25 from Zerf saying, blindfolded fight in FF13. Count me in. Let's get a $5 train rolling. It's for a good cause and it's more GDQ. What can ask more? Uh, we also have uh, $5.40 from Lily's Dark Materials saying, don't know much about Final Fantasy, but I really want to see that blindfolded fight. Also, another excuse to put more money toward ending cancer. Good luck, runners. Uh, with that, I'd like to remind everybody, we are now at $52,000 out of $80,000 for the blindfolded Dahaka fight. We have just under $28,000 to go. So if you want to see that fight, get your donations in. That total has been rolling on up, and I would love to see it go higher. You can read a few more, like we have like three minutes of dodging now, like all of these are not well, really it, that it, hard. In that case, it would be my pleasure. We have $154 from Ace Azamine saying, Good morning, GDQ. Some of my favorite runs are the meticulously routed out Final Fantasy runs, and this one does not disappoint. Donation goes to that blindfolded fight. Uh, we have $10 from Bonnie Bonnie saying, Final Fantasy 13 is my favorite of the mainline games, and I'm extremely happy to see it in a GDQ. Good luck to Kaya Rune and Co. We have uh, $50 from Anonymous saying, let's get that blindfolded boss fight. Anytime a runner does something blindfolded, it's so impressive, and I can't wait to see this one. Uh, do we have time for one more? Yep. Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, $20 from Rob Draven saying, wait, we haven't met the, the FF7 remake intergrade incentive yet? Or the FF13 blindfolded Dahaka fight incentive? There isn't much time left for these. Come on, folks, let's get it done. That's right, Rob, let's get it done. Come on, folks, get those donations in for that blindfolded incentive. Let's see that fight. All right, so now we're in chapter 10. Um, this is also a pretty short chapter to sort of a prelude to chapter 11, which is the by far the longest chapter of the run. In this segment, we're pretty much placed in this area and meant to be training uh, and just facing a sequence of strong enemies. But of course, we just dodge everything. Um, There's a character who helped us out early in the game called Sid, and it turns out that he was helping us for the wrong reasons and that now we are going to have to fight him. Um, so this fight is the first in a sequence of several fights, which all have a very similar theme, which is that the boss has a set attack pattern, and we understand the pattern well, and they do a sequence of attacks and then take a break and do something that we can just be free during. So he does four different moves consecutively. Uh, those moves are random, and Kai has to be prepared for a variety of possibilities, including some very annoying ones. But once he's finished those four consecutive moves, then he's just going to take a break and either go on defense or start healing himself. Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty cool thematically because Sid, uh, much like your party member, is a Lassie, so essentially this this slave 
um, living weapon kind of thing. So he can do the same thing that we do, which is paradigm shifting. Um, so that also that is uh, that is how he uh, goes between his different phases. What's interesting about this fight is um, the fight used to be one of the easiest in the entire run, even though he's, he's that late into the game. And now he's one of the hardest in the entire run. <laughs> Just to save around 15 seconds in best case, but we want to go fast, right? And 15 this seconds in a minute and a half long fight is a lot. The strategy yeah, board well, used well, to well, have... Uh, the strat before used to have Snow sitting in Sentinel the whole time to tank um, Sid's various attacks, so he wouldn't be chaining at all, that would take us longer. And because of that, you would sometimes get a second recovery or defensive shift, and that can slow down the fight even more. Our current day strat, uh, we don't use Sentinel outside of the opening, essentially, so he will always be Ravager until Stagger hitting him. And we're going to take advantage of his interruptions. Snow, uh, snow and Lightning Strikes will prevent Sid from starting his string until it's or until his, his attack until he's not getting hit anymore. And our goal will be to essentially go through his defensive shits with him getting in no more than two attacks out and healing through those potions and just chaining the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a, a hidden variable called cut and keep. And those basically decide what interrupts and what does not. So, you know, Sid has a pretty high keep, which means it's pretty hard to interrupt him. But strikes have a high cut, meaning that it's above his keep, and we're able to to, do, to to interrupt him. And so, just to give you a point of reference, when enemies get staggered, their their keep goes down to zero, and so that's why we're able to interrupt him with everything. Um, you may have also noticed a pattern within all these strategies, which is that we used to use Sentinel, and now we know how to predict their moves and don't <laughs> use Sentinel anymore. So using Sentinel is slow, and we try and cut it as much as we can. Yeah, and but but it made this fight one of the hardest, so yeah. I let you guys explain and focus a bit, and hopefully it goes as planned. They, they basically explain the idea, but basically, Sad yeah. and Snow were both going to be doing strikes, and we just try and keep them interrupted as much as possible. Like, now at the start, Snow is still in Sentinel, so he will go for Snow. But that's pretty much it. Now I will not enter Sentinel anymore if the fight goes as planned. And you'll see that occasionally Kaya will delay lightning strings in order to have it hit immediately after Snow's string so that you can maintain a long eruption, or so that Snow's next stream will come before uh, or right when lightning finishes. There's also animation canceling, which we mentioned a few times earlier. When Saz is done with this, or when Snow is done with his string, and there's a need to be refreshed. You want to shift right as Snow hits his last punch, so that Snow will begin his next punch immediately and maintain the interruption. If he gets his ready animation off, you will lose the interruption. So here, the, the three sort of quote-unquote paradigms that uh, Sid has access to is the Commando, Sentinel, and Medic. He decided to go into Sentinel, and, which is the defensive stance, and that means he can't be interrupted. However, this fight's going pretty well. 280% before last year. Yeah, th this now is the hard part where we need to interrupt him until he staggers and then refresh into a launch, and now the rest is free. Very well done. We gotta make sure he can't move, though, because once he goes below 60% HP, he has not tackled metamorphosis where he transforms, so he doesn't move called Seraphic Ray. And now we'll just kill Lightning from full HP, no matter what. So, the interruption's key, and if we got recovery instead of defensive, we could actually reach that damage threshold early if we have a bad fight before Stagger, and that can become a problem. But in that case, we do have a backup. We can summon through the Seraphic Ray to negate the damage, and we just try to finish it with Odin. It was quite a bit of time, but you won't die. Yeah, so you're, you're essentially supposed to get a whole second phase where he transforms and becomes much harder, but <laughs> by just air juggling him forever, we don't even have to deal with it. Yeah, we purposely don't over damage him and then he's never entering that. And when the fight goes like that, it actually also looks pretty easy, but it is not easy. Like, yeah, it is that, very Kaya made that strength. look so much easier than it is. It's and one of the most technical fights in the whole run, for sure. It's also one of the worst time losses when you do actually die to it. it you, it's easily two minutes lost if you die near the end of the fight. Yeah, and luckily, you also don't have the backup for this fight, uh, or like this dodge, if you actually have to use the backup on Sid. Right. So, so uh, there's... Oh, oh. oh <laughs> Almost! Nice. That was close. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. So there's two of these types of elevator dodges. Uh, they're particularly annoying because if you fail the dodge and you have to retry, the game 
you know, typically puts you at the entrance to the, to the battle zone. But in this case, the entrance to the battle zone is at the top of the elevator with the elevator, you know, all the way at the start. And so you can lose a lot of time if you have to retry that. However, those bombs can be beaten with Odin very quickly. So it's not that bad to fail that dodge, unless you had to use the Odin backup on Sid, in which case you don't have the ability to summon, and then it's just kind of a mess. Yep. Um, and retrying that is just bad. There's going to be another so... one of those dodges <laughs> later on, but instead of bombs, it's birds, which we saw how we saw a little bit of how bad they can be. They can be really bad in, uh, here and in Chapter 4, but um, we're just going to deset that one because of how annoying birds can be. Yeah, it's one that's pretty reasonable to do. You don't have to actually deal with them as long as he did with the bombs on that previous elevator. By the time the birds drop on, it's, you're essentially near the bottom already. But, like, five seconds is too much time to spend with birds, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, especially yeah. considering you just get reset to the top. Like that that's the thing about these. When you, when you retry those five, the bombs and the birds, you just get reset to the top before you have pressed the switch for the elevator to even start going down. Yeah, we, we would not be um, decepting bird elevator if it wasn't for the the risk if you do fail it being so high. Yeah, exactly. And unlike the bomb elevator, uh, the bird fight doesn't have a good backup for it. There is no really good way to deal with the fight, so Dude, you're just kind of forced to retry. So a few more dodges here. There's a behemoth where he's really, he's pretty thick, but... Oh, wow. I got the bad pattern, actually. <laughs> like, he has two patterns that he can have. Um, now his cycle was a bit more advanced than usual, and that's the pattern where you have to lure him a bit to the side to dodge him. With the other pattern, you can basically just run towards him and then go on the side when you're really close to him because he runs run straight. As you can hear from the <clears throat> breakdown that Kaya just gave, many, many, many dodges <laughs> in this run have like a variety of possible scenarios for what can happen. And then there's dodges like this with three birds and a behemoth where there's an infinite number of things that can happen. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I got lucky there. That was nice. <laughs> I think that's the worst dodge in the game, in my opinion. Bird room is horrible. Yeah, Kaya's making a lot of this really difficult stuff look very easy. Yeah, or you just get lucky, right? <laughs> no. But yeah, these, these dodges, like, as we said at the start, everything that outspeeds you is scary. Like, the dodges, or like the enemies that are slower, they are no problem for the most part. Except for the vampires. Yeah. And this is the bird elevator. Like, you can, you can see, once they land, now we have, like, only, as one like said, like, five seconds or something. But if they spot me, I very likely get caught within, like, less than a second. So it's too much of a risk. There's also two different types of birds. The, there's the two that do damage and there's the one that debuffs. The ones that do damage are a little bit more predictable in that they tend to run at you and attack you, and if you just run away from them, you'll get away. But the debuff one sort of just blasts at full speed in a random direction. And if it's in your direction, there's really nothing you can do. You just get caught. Yep. All right, you can probably read like two or three quick donations, but then we have the Bahamut boss fight. Absolutely. We have $25 from Team U saying, let's get a train for that blindfolded fight. I can't wait to see it. Awesome run, Kaya. It's my first Final Fantasy speed run I'm seeing, and it's awesome. Uh, we also have uh, $25 from Ashikun saying, it's so lovely to see Final Fantasy 13 on GDQ. An absolutely underappreciated game, and it's being utterly destroyed here. Donation going to blindfolded fight. I guess you can fit in one more. Uh, all right, uh, we've got $25 from Seb saying, always a pleasure to see my favorite Final Fantasy game run. Here's to seeing that blindfolded Dahaka fight. Thank you so much for the $25 donation train. Let's keep that rolling. <laughs> all right, so the next boss is Bahamut. Um, this is Fang's Eidolon, and it has the same pattern as I mentioned of, he does a sequence of attacks, which is of a few fixed patterns, and then he'll just take a break where he does nothing. Our party here is fixed, and our paradigm setup is also different from what it was before. It's possible to retry the fight and set up a different paradigm setup, but the paradigms they give us aren't the worst. So the goal in this fight is to basically inflict slow and curse to make it so that he, you know, he goes slower and he doesn't interrupt, him, interrupt us as much. But those are very, very random, and his attacks are devastating. So um, this can be a very random fight. The amount of time he also spends in his breaks is basically random, and so. Uh, this fight is often called an RNG expletive fest by, by members <laughs> of the community. We got cursed, but not slow. However, the way our party is set up here, lightning is physical spec, and Vanille doesn't have anything physical, and so uh, 
Lightning likes to run up and attack him, whereas the other two can stand back. He targeted Lightning both times, which looks bad because Lightning is really getting destroyed. However, it's actually good because it means that the other two members are not getting destroyed. Yeah. So the one caveat to that is that Lightning is very squishy and a lot of times she'll just die, so you need some Phoenix Downs, and Kai just used his last one. Yeah, <laughs> because I had to sell them earlier, that's a bit scary, but I can buy some in Mahabara most likely. It's still all models, so it was a good fight, yeah. Yeah. Something else that Kaya was doing that fight is whenever Bahamut would go for attacks, he would try to shift it into a Paradigm with Sentinel, like Combat Clinic. Whenever you have a Sentinel in the party, it gives you a full party uh, damage reduction, and the character that Sentinel gets an even bigger damage reduction. That's what we've seen in some fights where we go to Sentinel just to tank and then shift back out after. It's there specifically, Fang is the Sentinel, and she is the party leader, and she is the one who will give you a game over if she dies, so it's nice that your Sentinel will, uh, you know, we'll stop you from getting a game over there. All right, and that is the end of chapter 10. Now we start with the longest chapter in the entire run. This chapter is more than twice as long as all of the other chapters in the game. For yeah, whatever it's, reason. It's, it's <laughs> even the speed run. If it's perfect, it's a little bit less than an hour, but it's typically more than an hour long. Yeah, my PB has, a, has the best ever now, known time currently with a low 57, but very good times are below an hour. Um, it can also be like a bit more than an hour, it depends on what happens. So if you're keeping track, we have six party members and we've done the Eidolons for Snow, Lightning, Saz, and now Fang. So we have left now our Hope and Vanille. That's the next fight is going to be Hope's Eidolon, which is Alexander. We've got a short dodging session here with a few, uh, you know, like slugs and flans. Some, some big flans that can be annoying, however, recently we've discovered ways to dodge the, the more annoying enemies. Um, but Again, for the next fight, we're going to have Hope, Lightning, and Fang. And Alex is going to, like I said for the other ones, do attacks and then take breaks. He does a sort of weird pattern where he does uh, the same sequence of attacks every time, but every other break is basically twice as long. And so we're going to be doing a combination of tanking with Ravager, tank with Fang while the Ravagers do chain. And then when he's doing his most devastating attacks, we'll heal up uh, while while Hope is constantly using his Ravager spells. Um, Hope is sort of his main thing is being a Ravager, and so that's what you do to build up Gestalt the most in this fight, and we're just going to be constantly chaining throughout. There's also um, a bit of very specific position manipulation going on at the start of this fight, because Hope is extremely squishy. We have not leveled him very yeah. much at all. So he can, at the start of the fight, if he gets targeted, he will just, or well, if he gets hit at all, he dies in one attack. So what we do is we time a shift very specifically here to have Fang run up to him and then not attack. If she attacks, then that will delay her to the point where she can't get a provoke off uh, before Alex attacks, and then uh, you are liable to just get completely wrecked. Um, so you need to uh, shift late enough so that she runs up far enough uh, to be away from Hope so he doesn't get uh, hit collaterally when uh, Alex attacks Fang, but early enough that you can still get the Provoke in. So that's pretty precise. Uh, after that, the fight is pretty much just following uh, a fairly basic pattern. Of, he did the Lofty uh, Challenge, which means he's taking his extra long break. Um, once we're done with this string, then we'll shift back here and give Fang the signal roll and heal her up so he can take the next string. And then we'll have a short break and then we'll continue chaining and then we'll break and then the fight will be over. Yeah, this, this fight is one of the most consistent in the entire run. Um, it is dynamic combat, so a lot of the fights have variety, but this fight, if you do the opening correctly, it's basically the same every single time. There's a nice little thing that changed a few years ago now, but Fang uh, can fail to provoke, uh, especially early in the fight when his chain is low. But we discovered that with a slight change to the opening pattern, you can maintain the chain. And by maintaining the chain, uh, you get that constant bonus to your chance of debuff. Or provoke is a debuff. And so you get a bonus to the chance of landing provoke. And so the fight is just super consistent now. It's always going to be around a minute 30. It was a minute 29. Yep. A minute 27 is the best possible from what we know. So that was very good. And how long the fight is basically comes down to small changes in how long his strings take. So it's it's basically as long as you execute it, you'll have a good fight. 
something Hello, else. Hello, we have Hope as a force leader. Um, sorry, sorry, Zero, quickly. Um, <laughs> you can go ahead. I'll but we said earlier that uh, Hope is slower than the rest, so we don't want to run with Hope over this entire area. So we switch him out ASAP into the endgame party, and yeah, now he can take over. Alright, so I just wanted to mention on the Alex fight, we geared up lightning specifically with magic equipment for the death fight Muhammad. The reason being, we want her to do spells. Because if she does strikes, she has a chance to run up to Alex before he starts the strings, and then she'll just get hit by the AoE that's aimed that thing and just die, and it makes that fight a lot more painful. It's it's uh, a really it's a really subtle piece of positioning that you can manipulate just with your equipment and paradigm timings, even though you have no direct control over positioning. Yeah. Right. There's an optional fight coming up pretty soon, and while I do that, and after that, I guess Wanda can explain why we have particularly these three characters in the party for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess first we, we can really quickly talk about the uh, logic of why we are fighting uh, Behemoth King and Megas Letharian in a moment. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's coming up in like a minute. Um, so... We've done a few optional fights here and there uh, for getting uh, chests that are locked behind them. This is the one time in the run where we fight a an optional fight specifically just for uh, experience. Um, the reason for that is it's right in our way. Uh, we, we, we go right by it anyway. Um, it's reasonably fast and it gives a lot for, uh, for how quick it is. It's, it's actually a well-known grind spot uh, for even casual players. Um, we are just going to fight it one time, because just doing it that one time uh, allows us to hit a couple of really important CP thresholds that will just uh, save us the time back that we invest in this uh, fight. The most notable of which being um, somewhere in each character's Crystarium is an extra ATB slot, which um, essentially just means that they can do more actions per string. Um, Vanille's is coming up uh, shortly, and uh, we have her Eidolon fight coming up uh, very soon. And by doing this fight, we get to get that extra ATB segment for her Eidolon fight, and that speeds that fight up a lot. That, that by itself already almost uh, wins back the time that you spend on this fight here. And we have a setup that kills this fight very quickly. So, we actually just set, uh, as Kai mentioned, our party. So now we have Saz, Snow, and Vanille. And this is going to be our party for pretty much the rest of the run, except for a few exceptions where we're either forced or possibly forced by donations to change. Um, but the, the basic reason for this setup is Saz is the most important member. First, he is the offensive synergist. So, Hope and Saz are the two synergists, but Hope has things that give you damage protection. So you get shell, protect, uh, and then bar elements to make you not take elemental damage. But we don't want defense, we want offense to go fast. And Saz is the one who has bravery, faith, haste, elemental spells. Second of all, Saz has blitz, and he's a really good commando. So those two things together make him sort of the critical, the linchpin of our party. Now second is Vanille. She's the next most important member because she has the offensive debuffs. And so she's the one who can give us the 89% damage boost with the protect, double damage with imperil, which adds elemental weaknesses. And then also for a few places, poison. D shell's not really gonna be important for the rest of the run. So those are sort of the two critical members. Um, after that, we have the option. We need a second commando. Um, to just to do massive damage. And so for the second commando, we could pick Snow or Fang. Historically, Fang was the one that was chosen originally. And that was because she is sort of at the start, the better commando and her debilitations are quite nice. It is nice to have enemies slow down. Uh, however, what she lacks is she's not a good Ravager. And that's a pretty big deal because adding chain quickly can make fights go much faster. And so those two also double as Sentinels for the fights where we do need a Sentinel, so they're kind of even in that sense. But um, a few years back, it, the, the route changed from being Fang-centered to Snow-centered, and just because of Snow's Ravager, um, he can chain much, much better than Fang can, and so, so he's the better better option overall. And yeah, that's that's basically the, the breakdown of, of why they're all, of, of why we're using this party. And that BK and M fight was actually a nice little microcosm of all of that, because you open the fight with Saz giving himself an inspell, so he does, he does double damage. While he does that, Vanille deprotects uh, both enemies and even imperils the second one. 
so that the in fire does double damage. And then Snow staggers them with his Ravager, and then he becomes the commando and launches both. So, or uh, he, uh, he only launches the Behemoth King, but um, you sort of get to see all of that in play right there at, at once. Any chance we could sneak in a couple donations? Yeah, we got a, uh, we got yeah, a long, okay, like, go three-minute menu coming up, so now would be this, the time. This is the longest menu in the in the run, I just wanted to tease that. So if people like menus, they can pay attention now, but... Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have $25 <laughs> from Anonymous saying, gotta donate for that blindfolded fight. This Final Fantasy 13 run is awesome, and thanks so much to the couch for keeping up explanations of the run. Yeah, you guys have been doing a great job. Thank you so much. Um, we have another $25 from Zeal saying, have to see this blindfolded fight. Seeing 13 get wrecked like this feels like revenge for how much I got stuck playing it as a kid. Oh, there's a mood. Proby donates $25 saying, blown away to see Bethandalus stunlocked and pummeled. Barty was one of the biggest hurdles for me in Final Fantasy 13, and watching him fall to slick strats was oh so satisfying. Good luck on the rest of the run, Kyrun, and here's $25 to that blindfolded Dahaka fight. We have another $25 from Candice saying, I love playing this game, but I think I love watching it even more. The backgrounds are so beautiful and the music brings back so many memories. Good luck to Kairun, and here's to that blindfolded Dahaka battle. Uh, we also have $5.40 from Cody Hansel. Why isn't this man in a blindfold yet? It's fine, but I expect this train to arrive in blindfold station in the next hour, chat. And uh, with that, I would like to note to everybody that we have passed the $53,000 mark for the incentive. We have a little under $27,000 to go. And if I'm not mistaken, a little under two hours to go uh, in the run to meet that incentive. So uh, if you want to see and you want Kaya Rune not to see, then you should donate to that incentive. Yeah, just to point out real quick, um, I, I believe the plan is to, if we meet the incentive, do uh, the blindfolded the hot fight after the run. Yeah, um, just so that we can it's... we can properly yep. explain it the first time. And it's, then, exactly, uh, it's it, it's the first fight that actually shows how strong the multipliers of damage are in this game. Like we see that at several occasions, but the Haka is the first boss fight with millions of HP. So um, if I, if I do it blindfolded during the run, a lot of people will probably not understand it. So we uh, just thought about doing it after. So it's nice to be able to explain it first time and then just appreciate the mastery in the blindfolded fight after. But those who are not sure yet if they want to donate for that or not, they can also see the boss fight done normally and then maybe get convinced. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's in around one and a half hours if the run has no major time loss. A bit more than that. We've still got some downtime though if you want to continue reading donations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have $15 from Edward saying we have 27k till the blindfold Dahaka fight and 48k till we meet FF7 bonus game. If we get 25% of everyone watching with $5, we'll hit these goals. Let's see this happen, everyone. I am in big agreement with Edward. Uh, we also have $10 from IFD Delusion. Uh, I heard there's a train going on right now. Final Fantasy is one of the best franchises out there. Glad to donate during this amazing Final Fantasy 13 run, and we need that blindfolded Dahaka fight. We need it, chat. We really need it. It's a really cool boss. Like, uh, the first time that I fight the boss is actually pretty soon because he's in Chapter 11. He's the second last boss. So just to just give a quick breakdown of what happened in that menu, we just got a ton of CP from the, the previous fights and we just wanted to dump all of that into our main party members. We haven't really needed it for the previous fights because uh, Alex and Bahamut, they are Eidolons and so the, the actual damage doesn't matter, it's just about how much chain you can inflict and so the stats don't really, they really don't matter. And so we've dumped all of our CP and we also got several pieces of equipment that sell for high value, high guild totals. So we just dumped all of that guild to a couple of accessories. So we got two maxed out warriors wristbands for Snow. He's doing massive damage. And I think another one for, or no, Saz is just using the one we had already had before. But just mm -hmm. most of that guild went into just those two warriors wristbands, but each one gives 180 strength. And so that's 360 extra strength on Snow, which is pretty much more than we had in total before. So stats go burr. This is a fight, uh, just to quickly say that, this is a fight that is possible to dodge. Uh, Logic Dolphin, who some of you maybe know under the name Loot Dolphin, um, has a video of dodging that, but it takes like around five minutes if you're lucky. 
because they barely move at all and it's just a pain to try to dodge that. So we just take the 23 seconds fight and are done with it. I, I tried to dodge it once and I was un unsuccessful. <laughs> Right yeah, <laughs> like, like they, ju they just barely move, move you. The, the, the strat for that is pretty much enter the battle zone, exit the battle zone, hope they move, enter the battle zone again, and exit the battle zone, try to get them to one side that way. You, you can also get but... like a party member to kind of push them a little bit, but I, I, I couldn't get it to happen. Yeah, that as well. It, it's just like around 25 seconds real time investment to kill them is much better, especially considering they give a bit of CP as well. What we just saw is kind of a cute little dodge where the the enemy is called, called a phalanx, and it just likes to T-pose, and so if you just run to the side, it'll yeah. turn towards you and make space as it turns to face you. And now the, uh, is the in my opinion, hardest idol on fight in this game, and also the last one. Uh, it's a very complex fight, so I let you guys explain. When you guys want to take it? Yeah, so... Um... For the most part, for most of these Eidolon fights, the most efficient way of, uh, of raising the Gestalt bar has been to uh, sit in Ravager and Chain. Um, in this case, we're actually going to mostly use Saboteur because you get additional um, bonuses to Gestalt for uh, inflicting debuffs. So we're just going to inflict debuffs. The, the, the debuffs in themselves don't matter because we're not doing damage on this guy. He doesn't have HP, but... It's just uh, because this this just fills up the gauge nice and quickly. Uh, and yeah, it's, a, it's another fight that goes through phases of attacking and then doing nothing. Uh, so we just switch between a tanking paradigm and a, an attacking paradigm. Uh, much like with Alexander, the goal here is to get Fang away from Vanil so that uh, Vanil does not get hit by the AoE attacks. Though occasionally, like right there, she can still get hit a little bit. But as, as you can see, that took like half of her HP just from one attack, so we really don't want Vanille to be taking too much damage here. This is also a notoriously difficult casual boss, um, just because oh, yeah. he has this so much damage, nightmare. and Vanille will die typically in a string, but just having a good understanding of how his strings work can make all the difference. So, you know, he's, he's doing a sequence of three combos, and we know exactly what's possible, so when we saw that fourth projection, we know that that's his last move, and he's going to do Looming Wrath. And we know how long he'll do Looming Wrath, Looming Wrath for, so just before Looming Wrath ends, uh, Kyle will be able to switch back into the single paradigm, with Fang standing next to Hecaton, so Vanilla's safe and the fight's fight is free. I also try to stay as healthy as possible with Vanille because he has a paradigm where he does two quakes in a row and then follows that up with a counter. If all three of those things hit Vanille, she's dying in a lot of cases. I almost died there now because he just did one quake and counter. <laughs> so you can imagine if that first so, attack was a quake, it also hit Vanille. But yep, and I was full HP by the way. As, as scary as that looked, that was still totally safe. You, you were guaranteed to yep. survive a quake plus a counter. Uh, Fang, yeah, because it was full. Fang was sacrificed, but she doesn't actually do much in that fight besides tank. And since the fight was almost over, we didn't need her. So thank you for your sacrifice, Fang. The reason I took that much damage is actually because Fang died to it. Because right. we have her in Sentinel, and if she's in Sentinel, you survive Quake, Quake, Counter, barely. But this was only one Quake and Counter, right? Um, so the reason that happened is Fang died during the Counter. So the Counter... Uh, hit Vanille after Fang already died, and the damage calculates after Fang is dead. So I didn't have the center of reduction on Vanille yeah. because also, Fang died to that attack. There's a really important uh, sort of hidden ability or passive ability called Fringe Ward. And what Fringe Ward does is it makes the Sentinel reduce the damage of AoE spells as long as the Sentinel is the target of the spell. So Quake and Counter can hit everyone, but as long as the target is actually Fang and Sentinel, uh, Vanille's damage will be multiplied by 65%. Uh, and so yeah. you can survive significantly longer with Fringe Ward. Snow also has Fringe Ward, so when he becomes our Sentinel, that'll be helping us a lot too. But yeah, we're done with the Eidolon fights now, and that was also the last uh, Force Party switch until the end of this chapter, so we'll be able to stick with our party of Saz, Fang, and Vanille. Or, sorry, Saz, Vanille, and Snow. We'll be sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm just thinking about Sharky. Yeah. Also, um, just just to mention, if you have a lot of donations, this is the longest running segment in the run. 
Um, so we have a lot of time theoretically now until the first floor in Tatum's Tower, pretty much. Oh boy, do we have a lot of donations. If not, uh, we can take over again because there's like a dodge technique coming no, we, up soon too. But We have plenty of donations. <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, $50 from Razzle Dazzle. So excited to see my favorite game of all time being run at GDQ. Completely blown away by the battle strategies and dodging tech. I gotta see this blindfolded fight. Thanks for such a great run, great event, and great cause. Who's your favorite 13 character? I gotta go with Fang. Personally, Razzle, mine is Lightning. Uh, we also mine have... is Fang. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for, uh, we have uh, $5.40 from Levisalanon. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, donating toward the blindfolded goal and hoping we will see some chocobo action before the run is over. Uh, we have $50 from Argus uh, saying, how can I not donate for blindfolded Final Fantasy? Uh, we have $250 from Wavefront. Let's see that blindfold fight. Uh, $50 from SD. Always glad to toss in some cash for GDQ. That Metropolis Automata poster is incredible. And let's get that blindfolded fight in G in front there, in Final Fantasy 13. Uh, do we have time for a couple more? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. We're, we're coming up on the little area where there's there's some neat cutscenes, but other than like gameplay-wise, there's not too much going on here. Yeah, yeah this right. area is too big. Uh, great. Uh, we have uh, another $25 from Rubix14 saying, I hope you can hear the thunder because you won't be able to see the lightning when you are doing the blindfolded Dahaka fight. Let's keep the $25 donation train going. Um, folks, uh, I do want to throw this out there because uh, we are at uh, 54000 and change uh, for this incentive, so we have a little less than $26,000 to go. If you donate toward the blindfold incentive, I will sing your donations. I will sing them for you. That is that is how much I want to see this fight, and how much I want you to see this fight. Uh, nice shout out of the fifty-four thousand there. <laughs> yep. Oh, this. Is, uh, um, is there is there more time? Uh, I can. I yeah. Have, I have more. Um, <laughs> You can read like two more and then I explain one dodge and then you can read a few more again. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have uh, $100 from Lady Black Rose Wolf uh, saying 20 tickets for the $5 train, 10 for each of the Final Fantasy incentives. This is a great cause and more Final Fantasy is always a great thing in my book. Let's get these incentives met. I guess one more. Like, All right. There, there's one specific dodge in like 30 to 40, 30 to 40 seconds. Okay. Um, we have uh, $5.40 from Seymour the Llama saying, uh, I don't know anything about Final Fantasy, but apparently 54 is core to the lore. <laughs> Love a good rhyme. It, it's core to our lore. Yeah, you can explain that later if you want to again. Like, we explained that earlier. It's a community intern meme with the 54. Like, not game-based. We, we I'll explain it again once we actually get to the, to the fight in question. Yeah. All right, I guess you can fit in one more, and then we're there. Uh, all right. Um, we have uh, $54 from Raven King. Uh, Final Fantasy is one of my favorite franchises. Thank you, GDQ staff, runners, hosts, and chat for the amazing event and community. GDQ is one of the best things to kick off a year with. Let's break our donation records. All right, uh, now is a specific dodge that works different on PC and console because uh, changing the party order affects enemies in a way that they de-aggro after you leave the menu very, very, very slightly. But enemies with very long aggro animations just do them again. And here's a trick I try to do that's not 100% consistent, sadly, but it works a lot of times, where one of these big birds up there will go close will go close to me and then I change the party order and he should de-aggro after at least two party switches. If he's not doing that, it's a deceptive soul use, so it's not too bad. So we will see. It's a very nice technique that sadly for some reason only works on the PC version. It's not as important yeah, if it in... works. Yeah. <laughs> It's not as important that any percent aren't too many uses for it because you have access to seven souls, but in categories like Shroudless, where you can't use them, it's very, very useful. Yeah. If you look at the minimap on the right, there you see the, the red dot is close to me, and when I do this, he's like just stopping because he's doing his aggro animation again. 
So that way I just changed the party order once, deaggroed him, and now I changed it back because it's pretty important to have the party in that order later on for the tower missions. Alright, now we can read a couple more, I guess. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, I do want to note that we just pissed past the $55,000 mark. Um, and so we are we are rolling on at this rate. We will actually hit that incentive. Uh, we have five dollars and forty cents from Vert Phil saying five dollar and forty cent dollar train. Uh, we have uh, five dollars and forty cents from Scorch sixty four. Here is ten cents for each of the fifty four minutes past. Uh, good luck on the run, and may the RNT gods bless the speed run with plentiful drops. We have. Uh, Twenty-five dollars uh, from Theo Schnorenberg, uh, saying, uh, "So glad to see a run of my favorite Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy XIII is so important to me, as it helped me get by when my grandmother died of cancer. The work PCF does can help so many people and brings hope to my own family that is at high risk of cancer. Every dollar counts. Thank you so much, Theo." All right, so um, we are now in Tejas Tower, a fairly long section, taking up kind of the about half of this uh, supersized chapter. Um, the conceit here is that there's these statues that uh, will open the way for us if we do them a favor and uh, wipe out the monsters that are, um, I believe their wording is, are holding my power thrall? Something like that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Essentially, we just have to kill some enemies. <laughs> um, these are part of um, the uh, Seath Stone missions um, that are, make up the, the bulk of this game's uh, post-game content. Um, these six that you have to do in this tower are mandatory, though, and uh, can all be skipped. Since we're somewhat like underleveled, quote unquote, since we don't really take optional fights, these fights are supposed to be fairly challenging, but they are all preemptible, and that makes them a lot easier. We'll be preempting all but one fight in this tower, and they all have yeah, their own various the techniques. Hardest. Yeah, they all have their own various techniques, and there's luck involved. Sometimes the enemies don't move quite the way you want to, but uh, if everything goes smoothly, we'll get first try preempts on stuff, and that makes the fight considerably easier because we start like. Depending on the main and I mean really close to stagger, it'll be like 500% chain or 300% chain. And then we can keep them interrupted and it makes it all smoother. But uh, general yeah. theme in these fights will be buff, buff snow, buff sass, debuff enemy, and go to town. Yeah, you can, you can see there that he got one attack off on snow and that took down like half his HP. And snow has the most HP of our, out of any of our party members by <laughs> far. So that kind of gives you an idea of how tough this would actually be if we were fighting these enemies straight up. So the free ounce really, really helped, because now we can just, you know, not have to deal with anything he does because we're just keeping him launched. Yeah, and also I still use Blitz for the majority of it, because as you can see on the damage numbers, the majority of bullets still hit, even though he's further away, just because he's a very large enemy. <clears throat> and that was the first fight. That was the power of buffs and debuffs. I had a damage multiplier of, I think it's 5.2 times? With like D-Protect, Imperial Weakness, Bravery on myself. And then on top of that, the chain also adds up. Yeah, and if you just throw in the 500% chain on the 5, it's like 25 yeah. times damage. <laughs> yeah, it's a 5 times multiplier with 500% is like 2,500% chain pretty much. Yeah. If, if you want to be generous, <laughs> you can also call the 4 or 5 blitz bullets that are hitting a 4 or 5 times multiplier. <laughs> and that is just because, as Rooster said earlier, the debuffs and buffs in this game are not additive, they are multiplicative, which also, is very strong. Just to correct my earlier statement, 13-2 is also multiplicative. Lightning is turning the one where it's additive. Ah, oh, okay. But, but debuffs and buffs in 13-2 wear off quicker as far as I know. Like, they made some adjustments. But now we can mix it up because uh, this fight is... This fight strat is very different from the previous one. Uh, the the crux of this fight is that if you kill the little Cryptos enemies, which are actually very annoying and can kill you pretty quickly, the, the main boss, the Ambling Bellows, will actually summon new ones. And so in order to stop this from happening, we have to focus Ambling Bellows first, but that means we're at the mercy of the little guys. So what we do is we just stagger everything and then kill them in Just Alt, because Just Alt, you're totally immortal. Yeah, so and Hexatron is a very, very strong idol on. I 
How much do HP does Bells have? About like 200k or so? 190? Uh, a lot, but you can see the damage number now if you pay attention. Like on this fight, from the finisher at max chain, because we max out the chain with this strat. Yeah, as you can see, it's 175,000 just on the finisher. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, depending on, the, the depending on the situation, Hecaton is probably the strongest idol, and it's it's between that and Odin. Odin's calculation is weird, so it, it kind of depends on the situation, but uh, Hecaton's yeah, really o strong. O Odin is only strong if he kills, because if he doesn't kill with the finisher, it does like barely any damage, yeah. o even Odin, on max Odin chain. Odin is as much as 10 times as strong if you can get the Xantet skin instant kill at max chain. But after that, we're back to sort of our normal antics. The next enemy uh, is similar to the one we saw earlier. There was the Thermodon, which was sort of like an armadillo whose shell broke. This is just another enemy like that, but of a higher class. So since we're able to preempt them, we can get them at high chain and then do our usual thing of buff, buff the commandos, debuff him, and kill him quickly. Yeah, the first three missions are all pretty simple. The, the second three are a bit harder. But it's still fine if we don't get super unlucky. But I same thing here, I have a 5 times damage multiplier now and we just do way too much damage. Have we mentioned the adrenaline yet? I don't believe we have. Okay. Anyway, so, so uh, commandos have this passive ability called adrenaline. They can unlock some, no hazards. Some they commandos have, have them, they don't all have them. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Um, what Adrenaline basically does is if you're in green HP, you do 20% more damage, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And yes. it's not as important for these fights, but it does make a difference here. For example, if that Gurengage hits Snow, he would be doing 20% less damage. It would take you an extra 4 seconds or so to kill him. But it'll be very important for some later fights where the damage is a lot tighter. And if you don't have Adrenaline in a certain amount, the fights get, like, depending on the fight, it goes between harder to unwinnable. Like, if you have another drum on the Dolphin Pace, you want that fight can actually kill you. So, something to worth mentioning at this point. Snow yeah, gets even with adrenaline, it can kill you, right? Like, if you get yeah. very unlucky, um, we'll go in depth when we're there, but that's one of the fights that just when Zaz gets targeted for the entire fight, we don't have enough healing resources to stay alive. Yes. But... Snow and Fang get adrenaline in Chapter 7. Saz only gets it in Chapter 13. It's very far in his uh, Crystarium. And then Lightning. We're just continuing through this this area. It's supposed to be something like a puzzle. However, the waypoint on your mini map always shows you the right way, so it's not it's not particularly difficult. Yeah, but I'm ignoring it in one instance True. soon, <laughs> so we can explain that in more detail. Because you can actually like most of these, you have to follow in the um, order the game wants you to. But the upper ones you can actually do in any order. I think I don't know if like 24 can be done later. But you can do mission 25 and mission 26 in different order, and that's what I'm going to do. I do 26 first and then 25, just to make the mission 25 much more safer, because that's the scariest of them all. Yeah, the pathing works out that it's nearly the same. The, the path that Kai's going to take is about three-ish seconds slower. However, the, the final mission, the 26, is pretty much the same either way. But if you beat him first, it makes 20, mission 25 significantly safer. Mission 25 is yeah. kind of a, a bit crazy for three seconds movement speed loss, so that's a good thing to take this late into the run. But first we or... have mission 24, which is a pretty interesting one. It's a, uh, so it's a normal, it's, it's an enemy that we've seen a few times before, but it has two accompanying bird type enemies with it, and we have to preempt it manually. Uh, if you get enough bonus, bonus decepts, this can, you can save a few seconds here by using the decept to preempt them easily, but typically you have to do this manually, and it's can be pretty scary to, to get it Right, but once you understand the technique, it's actually pretty pretty cool. So what Kai's gonna do is he's gonna go to the edge of the zone and try and lure the main enemy out. And he's gonna come to the edge of the zone, and then you actually want the enemy to basically go to where you are on the edge, and then you run to the to the corner of the zone and around the edge of the corner so that he backs away from the zone. He backs away from you no matter where you are. So you put yourself opposite where he is, so that he backs out of the zone. And then when he starts going back into the zone, you can surprise him on his way back in. So the first thing you do is you lure him to the edge. The birds. Yeah, you want Mushusa out, not the birds. Yeah. <laughs> That's like one of the problems of the stream. Right. The birds, these are the, the buffing type birds, buff and debuff birds. And as I mentioned, they will just run in a straight line for as long as they want. And okay, this time it looks good. Like this time they stayed. Back. So now you sort of run towards the zone to make him move away. 
he'll back up, and then as he walks back into the zone, you can catch him from behind. Quote unquote. Yep. Nice. Here you have to pay attention that you don't enter this fight too early because this is just on the edge of the battle zone. <laughs> You yeah, can yeah. actually enter too early and then it's not a preempt even if he doesn't see you just because you're not in the battle zone. Yeah, you have to catch them by surprise in the battle zone for it to be a preempt. And they can leave the battle zone. So. Honestly, I, I, I'm kind of surprised they even thought of that. That seems like something that could have really easily become an oversight where you can just preempt enemies by luring them out of their zone. There's a bit of an annoying thing in this fight, which is that the birds are weak to water and Mushusu it absorbs water, and so we give Snow in water, so he does double damage to the birds. But as soon as he attacks Pen England, that first punch actually healed, not Pen England, sorry, Mishusu, <laughs> healed him. Uh, but this game has a mechanic where if you attack something with the wrong debuff, or w w with the wrong inspo, it will wear off immediately. So we got one punch within yeah. water, but it did wear off, so. I'm fortunate that Vanille died, so that caused it a bit of chain or in general sometime, but... But the Ravager's doing so little damage now. <laughs> you, you can actually get very unlucky at the start. You start this fight with Protect. You can get very unlucky that both of these Yakshinis, like both of these birds, do deprotect on Zaz, and both of that inflict. So you, the first cast removes your Protect, the second cast inflicts you with deprotect. And same as for us, that means physical damage from enemies is increased by 89%. And if you have deprotect on Saz and Mushusu targets Saz with one attack, he can basically instant die. That's how squishy we are. All right, but now we've just got some running until we get to mission 26, so now we'll be a good time for some donations. All right, well, I promised I would sing, so here's $500 from Crunchy Chocobo. I'm so amazed by this run, how could I not donate to Dahaka blindfolded? We gotta see this, even if Kyron won't. Thank you very much, Crunchy Chocobo. Uh, we also have uh, $5 from Michael saying, $5 blindfold train. We have time for one more? Yep. All right, we have $25 from Unalaska saying, Final Fantasy made my childhood. Now I want to see someone destroy one of the many bosses without even looking. Let's get that blindfolded battle. Thank you all so much for the donations. And we are at uh, $56,000 for the blindfolded to Haka fight. So keep those donations coming in. And thank you We're for really your surname. actually, yeah. Um, quickly uh, putting in there, like, here is the part that we mentioned earlier. Like, the waypoint, look at where the waypoint is right now. It says I should go into the room next to me on the right. We just ignore that. We don't go there. <laughs> because we get mission 26 first. Yeah, Even though the game tells us to go to mission 25. We're being bad to see right now. We're disobeying the orders of the, of the Valsi. Yep. You guys don't mission 26 is all the way down here, even though the minimap says I should go to the other side. Okay, that was a bit greedy. You have to run this whole path anyway. It's just basically the order we do it in. Yep. You save, like, now I have more movement. I save that movement back later on when I'm done with 25. So... It's actually only a bit extra movement. You also notice these numbers that Kai is saying, so mission 25, 26, 24. Yeah. These are just the mandatory missions that you have to do here. We skipped missions 1 through, I guess, 22, 21. I don't know. I the, don't even know how many you can do. I don't know, one, one, I don't know one, one, which three. mission Gel Titan is. I think Gel Titan is 22. Gel Titan is 21. Yeah. So we skipped the first one. Guys, 20. come on. There's six in here. <laughs> they go up to 26. <laughs> On, but Matt, yeah, basically sorry. these things are mandatory. There are 58 optional ones that you can do to complete the entire game, but that's not any percent. But these we have to do. It, it's just that so. Ambling Bellows and Gurangesh just take so much less thought compared to the others, I kind of just forget about them. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I wanted to go back to the Muchusu fight for a second. At the start of the fight, we used a technique called Quake, which we never really quite explained. And the game doesn't really quite explain to you, so whenever I, when I played this game casually at first, I had no idea what it did and the thought it was useless. But what Quake does is it hits all enemies and it gives you the max chain duration on all enemies. So when you get a preempt and you stagger something, I think it's like a 10 second stagger if I'm not mistaken. Thanks to Quake, that goes straight to the max of 45. So we get uh, we get to keep the stagger longer and it gives us enough time to kill everything properly. All right, uh, for this preempt, you can do this manually. It takes around 20 seconds if you're lucky. If not, you can lose several minutes here. Um, so we just accept this nowadays for the most part. 
even though it's like in perfect case you farm one less deceptor soul in chapter two and do this manually but as soon as you fail it once you pretty much end up losing time to farming the deceptor soul so against ambling bellows we wanted to use a summon because the if you kill the little guys first he starts to summon more little guys there's a very similar crux to this fight if you kill all of the small enemies then uh Nanglin will start to use eroga which will totally destroy you so you just go into Just Ult and they are paralyzed and you're immortal while you're in Just Ult, so you can take care of them with massive damage here. Yeah, and another time where Hecaton does like more than 100,000 damage. Even though this time the chain will not be maxed out. 146. Like, he's really strong. Another important feature of the Just Ult and Just Ult damage is that even though the, the, the Eidolons have uh, elements associated with them, all of the Just Ult moves are non-elemental non and they ignore a lot of damage resistances that enemies have, and so, uh, you know, Penanglin, I believe, takes half damage from physical, but you can just avoid that by by using this uh, yeah. this property of the of the Eidolons. Also, one quick little thing I feel obliged to mention for the sake of Logic Dolphin, Quake actually doesn't give max duration, it gives like a little bit less than 20, 26 or 27 seconds of duration, and as long as you're above 18-ish seconds of chain duration, you'll get a max stagger. So you get enough chain duration to get a max stagger, <laughs> but it's a little bit more subtle than that. Yeah, and now we actually do what the game wants us to do. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, we're going back now to do mission 25. This guy is called Vitala. He has a sort of cycle of attacks. He puts up a barrier that you have to break before you can do any damage to him. Everything else is reduced, is totally blocked. Um, and he is a magic-based enemy, so he does a sequence of attacks, which is a massive damage to a single target, area of effect to everyone, which is less damage, and then a sequence of debuffs. And so he's going to cycle through this for the whole fight, and we want to um, attack him in a way that we're prepared to tank this damage. Um, so Quake and Libra are moves we've been using. Uh, Quake, as we mentioned, gives chain, chain duration and Libra gives us information. There's another TP skill called Renew, which restores everyone's health by 50%. So we're gonna be using that in this fight to heal more than Vanille could as a med, or potions could. Because now, now our HP is around in the thousands, and a potion only does 150, since we're not, we don't have Doctor's Code equipped. Even if we did, it would be 300, which wouldn't be enough, so. Yeah, this guy does a lot of damage, and that's the reason I did mission 26 before that. There's also Just a, that I get a bit more Crystarium now, it says gets more HP, Vanille gets stronger items. Yeah, um, we also get a lot of the pre-setup for the Haka actually now, because the Haka is the boss after this. There's also a subtle um, little thing that we didn't shout out, but Saz actually had a Shield Talisman on for the, the past several bosses. Shield Talisman gives you Protect for the first, I believe, minute of the fight. And so, since these fights are all shorter than a minute, it basically gives them protect, enough Protect enough uh, damage to survive a lot of these fights and you otherwise die. Um, but now that we're fighting an enemy that does magic damage, we've swapped that to a soul farm talisman, which gives us the uh, shell instead of protect for the first minute. But we're yeah, just the, dumping the, of our CP. Go ahead, go ahead. The, the specific uh, attack that we're really worried about from Vitala is his second one, which is a, a big single target move. Um, Snow is just so tanky, like he is the tank of the party. He has enough HP to survive it just uh, normally. Uh, Saz, we give him the, the Soul Pump Talisman, so it reduces to the point where he can also survive it. Vanille, unfortunately, just has to deal with the fact that, that she can die, although I, I guess in, in this route now it's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can only die when you get very unlucky with debuffs yeah. that later is, uh, on. That, that is the uh, the reason for doing Penangolin first. Yeah, Penang yeah. Penangolin also drops a, an accessory um, called the Diamond Bangle, which is the, the highest HP boosting bangle that we have available to us now, and so we can put that on the nail to make it so she can survive the massive single target. Yeah, Zero can explain this, I guess, because Zero made the strat. <laughs> so the old strat we go in Spawn Bomb here and rely on Saz to chain, and he's not the fastest at it because it's Spawn Animations, but Snow has really quick animations. So what we do is that we, we buff Snow and uh, Vanille Face instead, get them chaining, and it ends up being faster overall than um, trying to chain with uh, Saz. Nice. And we got every debuff, so that's good. So now it's just a matter of buffing up Saz and Snow and killing him fairly quickly. 
But uh, this strat relies on Manil not dying to the big single target attack. If you didn't have the extra stats from Benango in first, Manil could die and then you could have a shortage of debuff timing. With other strat, you had more time to heal. This one you have less, so it ends up working out nice overall. Yeah, and this fight looked very safe uh, because the strat is very safe. What do you mean? That looked um, very scary. Vanille got pained. Oh no. <laughs> wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, I mean, com compared to when we did this fight first, this is way safer. Like, I, I dropped to half HP to his first multicast attack, but he's not doing two DPS multicast attacks in a row, so then we just healed up. Um, there's also, and we killed him before he got dangerous. There's also a funny thing between that fight and uh, the Mishusu fight, where Vanille can die, but her only job after she inflicts debuffs is healing anyway, so if she dies, it's fine because she took all the damage anyway, so yeah. <laughs> she, she did her job either way. Yeah, when she died on Mishusa, it made almost zero difference because you were just in tireless, so she was just trying to heal, and her only job was healing, and everybody else was healthy, so it didn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. And upcoming next is Dahaka, so for those who actually are not really sure if they want to donate for the blindfolded incentive or not, you can get a view of the fight now done normally. We, we do have a bit of running before we get there. Um, the menu is all done and prepared for the fight. We just have to take these elevators, so we have some time for donations now. Uh, all right, uh, we have $25 from Alonso Sereno uh, saying, this is my first time watching a GDQ stream and FF13 is my favorite Final Fantasy game. Changed my life in a lot of great ways And I'm so stoked to be watching a live run of it Cheering for you, Kaya And here's to hoping we get to catch that blindfolded fight Let's go, gamers Do you have time for one more? Yep <laughs> Pictures three to four, probably. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so we have a uh, hundred dollars from Alligator saying, "Here's some money toward the blindfold incentive." So glad to see FF13 here on the GDQ stage. This game came into my life at a rough time, and I got a see tattoo to always remember the joy it brought me. Good luck on the run, and thank you for showcasing this great game. Uh, folks, I would like to remind you that I will be singing all blindfold incentive donations <laughs> from here on out. So if you want to keep hearing more of that, uh, please donate to blindfold incentive. And if you want yeah. to stop hearing it, then close out the blindfold incentive. That's the fastest way to do it. Uh, we are almost to $57,000 for that. So uh, check out the regular Dahaga fight and, uh, and throw your cash in. Yeah, I, I do a very quick menu now uh, to unequip stuff from Fang and get Saz another strength accessory. Uh, we are at the top of the tower, and this is where the Haka will be. So the Haka I guess you been, guys can explain. Yeah, has sort of been building up for a while now. Uh, we saw him flying around, and he's been in this tower in these cutscenes that we've been skipping. But now that we're finally at the top, mm -hmm. we're about to cross over towards Vanille and Fang's home village. He's our final hurdle before we get there. So he has a massive amount of HP, and he also does a lot of different attacks. Um, so basically, for the start of the fight, we're going to just be trying to survive his various attacks. There's a really cool bit of positioning we do here where we get Snow to run forward and then just become a sentinel for the whole fight. And ideally, he'll be positioned such that all of all of Sahaka's uh, area of effect attacks, he has a few uh, circular AoE spells, and he has a physical attack, which has a very weird hitbox. If Snow's in a good position, he'll just tank all of that, uh, and nobody will take damage besides him. Um, it's possible to have that not happen, though. But other than that, we're going to inflict Imperil. Imperil will boost the amount of chain we take, and it will also make him take double damage from uh, all elements. Since since he's normally he's he has no elemental weakness, he's just neutral. Imperil raises him to be weak to everything, and so we're going to have Saz give in water, but he could give any in spell here, and it would work the same. So he's hasted himself in Vanille. Snow can just sit there. And we're also going to buff Snow and give him the same bravery in, uh, in water. And if everything works out well, we'll be timed such that he's casting Faith and we can stagger him. Now, Dahaka has a really interesting property where once he's on the ground completely and he's finished his falling animation, he no longer resists Deep Protect. So a single cast from Vanilla will be enough to inflict Deep Protect, which she's about to do. 
There we go. And now we have all of our multipliers together. And just look at the massive amount of damage. Five times multiplier, 800% chain that will max out later. So. Every single Blitz Duel bullet is doing 20,000 damage right now. Yeah, so th this boss has by far the most HP of anything we've faced so far at uh, over 2 million, and we're just completely shredding him right here. There's he a... gets up, but we don't care because he dies now. There's a bit of a weird thing where when he's on the ground, if you're as long as you're interrupting him, he'll stay on the ground, but there's sort of a background timer, which if you let it count up and don't interrupt him enough, he'll just get back up, but it doesn't end his dagger. It's not like a chain break or anything, so um, you're able to kill him just fine. So that is the fight that we would like to showcase blindfolded. The reason it's even possible to do it blindfolded is because we know that when we don't have deep protect before stagger, uh, that it will for sure inflict after stagger. So I know as long as the setup is correctly, I know exactly when I have deep protect. Yeah. In the past, it was not possible because we just started to try and inflict deep protect as he was staggering and while we were still on Sentinel. And it was you had to literally just wait for wait for deep protect, and you couldn't you couldn't tell what was happening until you saw deep protect. But since it's guaranteed now. And there's a little other thing which is Imperil can fail to inflict, but we have a contingency for that. For the blindfold. Yeah, blindfold and I do it different. It's actually scary. It's not 100% consistent to beat the fight. Um, I can, like, so far I got it first try every time I showcase it, but there can be several things that mess it up a bit. For example, if Sass gets hit um, and delays the strings, or if I obviously do a wrong input to buff the wrong character or whatever, because the fight is very precise still, even though you don't really have to see it. Um, so obviously if Saz or Snow is not buffed correctly, we're super under damaging. Because you saw it was still pretty tight on the stagger, and that was a correct setup. So right now, what Kai is doing is actually making a few members of the community, myself included, sad. He's, he's not getting the Perovskite chest over here on the left. This Perovskite is a type of component which lets you upgrade items from uh, specific weapons from a lower class to a higher class. If you get that, you can use it on a later weapon, which is also a detour in this village, called the Pleiades High Powers. Pleiades High Powers are basically the strongest weapon in the game. They have a much higher scaling rate than anything else, and they upgrade into the Hyades Magnums. So you may have seen the hashtag Magnums. That's sort of uh, an experimental route which currently doesn't appear to be better, but it's something that uh, we've been working on to try and you know, see how it compares. It currently seems to be similar in time for ideal like, execution. However, it's it's riskier in some places, so we're working on it, but it, for, yeah. for right now, it's... Uh, the Magnums are... they're a completely ridiculous weapon. They, they give you no magic at all, and they reduce your HP by 40%, but for that, you get more than twice the um, strength of any other comparable yeah. weapon. It's completely ridiculous. And the, the, the both routes are very similar in speed, so we, can, we can't really say which one's better because they are two different. Uh, it's just that the Magnum's route, just because they cut your HP down to 60% because of that side effect, even though the fights last uh, shorter, they don't last that significantly shorter, so it's a bit more dangerous in case the strats don't work because you have less backups. Shoutouts to, shout out to um, Hoi Shin, the main uh, <laughs> router for that strat, who is, I believe, currently running the uh, Japanese restream, so hi Hoi Shin. Hi Hoi Shin. Hi Hoi Shin. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so he... Uh, so, so the Magnums are pretty much the, the strongest weapon that you can get, and for, for your best commando who has blitz. And so for pretty much every category besides any percent, you lean heavily on the magnums. Uh, any percent is pretty much the worst case scenario for them because you get them close to the end of the run and have the minimum chance to actually take advantage of their power. But you know, for shroudless or all missions or plat, you really rely mm -hmm. heavily on the power of the yeah. magnums. You, you can also not max them out in any percent because we get too little guild for that. And the other categories, they are always maxed out, which is like, as I said, like, more than twice that much. Like, Sans's weapon currently, I think, has like 
190 strength or something. It's I don't know exactly how much, but the Magnums have 1,140 when they're maxed out. Yeah, so, it's so that's like eight great. times as much as the weapon that I have right now. The, the best accessory you're gonna get is a maxed out um, power glove, which is 250. So even if you have like three power gloves maxed out equipped, it's still <laughs> less than the Magnums. So we're coming up they, on they the. They just uh, come with it with with the downside of the HP, right? Sorry, one second. Yeah, we're, we're coming up here on the second Barthandalus fight, one of the toughest fights in the run. This will be the first time we're actually using an Aegis Soul, which gives us defensive buffs. Saz can't cast these on his own currently, um, and we haven't really needed them up to this point, but Bart is a really tough enemy here. Uh, you, you'll remember that the first time during Stagger we just kind of interrupted him and didn't let him do anything. That doesn't work this time. Um, he actually yep. never, ever stops attacking you, which is the main reason he's such a dangerous enemy. He's, he's also arguably, ar arguably the hardest fight in the run to learn. Yeah, he's, he's really tough. So, um, the main idea um, of the fight is going to be that we want to have those defensive buffs and we also want to keep them. Now, that's a little bit uh, of a problem because um, he, uh, Bart's got, uh, again, a kind of second phase. He starts off like not having a face and then gradually opens up and eventually reveals his main face. Once he does that, uh, the stagger will reset. Not that that's really a problem for us. We wouldn't be able to kill him in one stagger anyway. Um, but after that, he's going to use a move called Apoptosis. And what Apoptosis does is it gets rid of all of the debuffs on Bart and gets rid of all of our buffs. Now, that's a problem because then we are going to get completely wrecked in the rest of the fight when we don't have our buffs anymore. So what we can do is uh, we're gonna use a summon to dodge it. So you'll see right here, we're, Neil's being a little bit slow on the debuffs, but we got him right there and this should still be fine. Um, I'm on PC, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. And now we're just gonna hit him. Also interesting in this fight, uh, he used a Libra scope, even though a Libra would have sufficed. The problem is that we want to do Renew plus Summon, and that's 5 TB, which is the maximum, so using a Libra would uh, stop us from doing either that Renew or that Summon. Yeah, this fight uses a lot of TP because we just need to heal so much because he is constantly hitting us. And that, that Libra is literally just to stop Snow from casting Ruin. That's the only reason you need it, but it's a huge difference the amount of damage Snow puts this out. This might be push, actually. Oh, but... Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, so he started casting Apoptosis there. Um, Kaya prepared for that by summoning uh, Saz's Eidolon. We are not doing this for damage at all, um, but when we go into Gestalt, um, our party members are off the field, and so are not getting hit by Apoptosis, which means that we get, a, we get to keep our buffs for the second phase of the fight. And so we didn't use a Fortisol here because Saz is able to give us all of the offensive buffs we need, specifically haste and bravery. Oh, Vanille is a little nice on Vanille, but it's not super critical. It's just so she heals a bit more. But Saz does not have the ability to cast defensive buffs, and we're really relying on that damage reduction from the deep protect or from the protect. And so, if you don't dodge a Pokéosis, you really are lucky to die. Oh, that was close on Vanille. That was, <laughs> that was close, close on Vanille. <laughs> So that so, attack, um, yeah, that, 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 there. <laughs> Sorry, that attack right there, if I was laughter, it does more damage oh, than you have HP. So the trick of surviving that is you heal through the animation, and that gives you more effective HP than it will do to get barely survive it, but you can get a bit close like that. Yeah, so Kaya timed an elixir there. Uh, this is the first time we've used an elixir. We actually only get two uh, in the run. Um, what the elixir does it is a full uh, HP restoration for the entire party, as well as giving us uh, full TP, which made it, made it so that we had an extra two renews for the second phase, although Kai only needed to use one there. Yeah, that was a very good timing with the laughter. N um, notably, elixirs don't revive your party members, so if Vanille had died there, we would have we would have been in some trouble. Yeah. You'd have to revive her, I think then at she'd that have no point... bugs. I think at that point it would have been fine, but uh, I would need to go into a medic much more because she would have no defensive buffs after the revival. But, yeah. yeah. But anyone who remembers playing this game might remember that he is a pretty pretty difficult boss casually, and our stats are significant, except for power. 
is significantly less than a normal Tillman at this point, but that was still a very, very fast fight. Yeah, he also, didn't debuff me at all. Yeah. Like, he did one Daze Ga uh, that can debuff Daze up to, like, three times, like, up on every one, uh, and Daze is pretty much stop. If that happens, it's very bad. But everything there missed, so... Yeah. And yeah, that's, he that's was the end of ridiculous. chapter 11. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of chapter 11, so that was the longest chapter, uh, pretty much from Alex to Bahamut, and with all of the page and tower stuff. Now we're moving on to chapter 12. Uh, this is... Starts with quite a boss rush. First, here we have Anna of Tapta War Mech. He, uh, you start the fight in just alt mode, and so you're able to kill him. This is an interesting boss in that it's a little bit different between PC and console, just because the the moves from Odin hit him more often on the console, so it's a little bit freer. But uh, we've discovered the, a good pattern for taking care of him consistently like that on PC. Also, if you're unlucky, you only you have to send that skin at the end, and you can just kill him. Other than that, it's a pretty straightforward boss. But now we okay, have... Zero, oh, go ahead. Uh, zero found a neat camera manipulation for this, which is why I camera trick right now. If I enter the battle zone, I immediately look up, like now, and that makes this bulwarker just run into me. So I lose literally no time on movement, as you can see. Like, this lines up perfectly. Yeah, we wanted to run into him because we wanted to cancel that decept. So shoutouts to Zero. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> in this voice call. So so coming yeah. up is uh, Zero said that the bird room in chapter 10 was the worst dodge, but coming up is also one of the worst dodges in the whole run, which is the four times... This entire chapter, to be honest. Run. Uh, so this fight, or this dodge, is... Th there's a couple soldiers we have to get by, which are pretty free, but the the Adamantherons are four uh, dog enemies. Now, these dogs move much, much faster than the ones before, and they are very difficult to dodge. And so we just are going to decept them, which, you know, decepting has been great so far, but now the dogs are in the way and you have to dodge around their passive movements. So once we get past these soldiers, you'll, you'll get to see the situation. And yeah, sadly, the pathways are really thin too, so they can just completely block him. And in that case, you just have to run into them and reset their positions, which is not very That's nice. That's actually good. Probably wait for this guy to turn around and I should squeeze through. Yeah, nice. Very nice. <clears throat> we like to do a nice yep. little spinning flourish and like whip you with their tails and stuff if you're in a bad You position. also have to pay attention uh, that your Deceptor Soul does not expire because we still need that yeah, Decept for this fight. For 30 seconds, so. You, so you can't take too long with the Decept, else it will run out. So if you're keeping count, we started the game with three uh, Deceptor Souls. Uh, we used one on uh, to manually preempt Penangle and then we used one to manually preempt this, and then we have one remaining to do uh, decep stuff with. Which we also, also won't keep um, that much longer, but... Just, just a heads up, the Adam and Kellett boss fight is coming up in around 6 to 7 minutes. Um, I just need to know the results for the bit war like 20 seconds before it, but just wanted to say so that. that. That donation incentive is coming to an end soon. Depends on how quick these fights now are. So once again, I believe, I believe that one is actually already closed. Would you like to know the results now? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, so Lightning won. Let's go. Yay! <laughs> that's, the, that's the better looking strat, it's the faster strat, and it's the much more dangerous strat. Yeah, yeah it, it's the one nobody <laughs> actually does in runs because it's kind of risky. <laughs> well, there are a few people who do it, but um, we we'll right. get into that when I do it, but Lightning pretty much can only tank one of his stomps because um, I didn't invest into Lightning at all since Chapter 9, and we won't do that because it's slow. We, we didn't um, invest in her, but Odin has been passively growing. By the yeah, the Odin is so independently Odin. growing, but Lightning is weak. But now that we finished right. off, uh, these first few fights, um, so those were both just all fights, so the actual stats of our party did not matter. We got like 100,000 Crystallian points from part two, plus all of the old fights in between, it's another like 20 something thousand. So now we can spend all of that CP. And this is a really, really important uh, place that we're spending our CP. Here, Snow got some important things. He got his accessory and his uh, fifth ATB slot. So now you can do five attacks in a row and get another 180 strength from uh, maxed out Warrior's wristband. And then we also got most of the way to Saz's next ability, which is Cold Blood. We haven't quite gotten there, but we're going to get it after the next fight, and Cold Blood is going to be very, very critical for 
several coming fights, uh, but we'll explain how, what Coldplay actually does when we get there. For now, though, we are setting up the party with um, two Cerberus Paradigms, which is the max damage, and then a few other Paradigms for the specific things that are coming. So this next fight is a Behemoth King. We already fought one of these earlier in the Behemoth King versus Megasetherian, but in that fight it was a preempt and he was at half HP and he didn't target us at all. Now he's a fight in one on one. Now there's an interesting crux for this fight, which is that if you let him get to half HP, he will transform and increase his stats and reset any debuffs and he will start damaging you massively, even more than he is already. So we want to get him to a high chain and debuff buff ourselves and then kill him while he transforms. So the first thing we do is chain to give us a high chance to land deep debuffs. We'll move into Sentinel so that uh, we don't die while waiting for the debuffs to land. And we set the prey to RNG's AK right. That's good. That was very lucky. That's a really nice fight. And then we just I kill saw him that, so um... fast he doesn't get the chance. I saw that he has Deep Protect, like Imperial was already on, and I saw that he has Deep Protect on as well without even looking at it because I saw that Vinyl stopped after the first cast of it. Um, when she doesn't inflict it, then she's continuing to cast her string, so I knew it was inflicted. Yeah. And uh, I, I do want to point out, uh, we, we really do not want to see the Behemoth King stand up, but if you do want to see the Behemoth King stand up, I believe there's a very cool shirt design that you can buy um, that someone made of the uh, standing Behemoth King. Yeah, it should be on the GDQ merch. He was uh, uh, okay. You forgot to cancel yeah. these up. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, this is, this is alright. Yeah, I just noticed. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> worst, worst case, if I'm stuck here, I'll to save later on, but it's fine. Usually it's like three to four minutes time loss. <laughs> so what, what just happened is Kaya forgot to cancel the D set, so now um, he, he lost that D set, uh, which is especially unfortunate because it was his last one. So he can now yeah. no longer do D set cancels. This isn't uh, as big of a problem because we were about to let the last D set run out in about a minute from now anyway. Uh, yeah, but, but we'll have some fun be, dodges now. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a couple of really fun dodges now. With so I mentioned, I mentioned that Adamantrons are faster than you and very, very fast, and we're about to see that in uh, vivid detail. Okay, so this one should be out of the battle zone. If not, then I can do it on the retry. Oh my god, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> More content. We shroud this now. <laughs> okay, wait a sec. I think you need yeah. a double battle team for this one. Yeah. This is fine, guys. This is just like some entertaining content now and why we have the Deceptisol. <laughs> All right, so now he will dash, so we do this. And now it's fine. Yeah, we're past this. All right, and now we have three more. But the problem is we have the fastest type of dogs. Just two. <laughs> two more? OK, so yeah, we have this nice. one. Come here. OK, we're going to change now. I think I'm past this one now. Maybe? Okay, maybe not. Aww. <laughs> so there's a nice trick that was discovered by Logic Dolphin that Kai is taking advantage of here, which is that when you change parties, it sort of does a weird thing where it basically removes you from the zone as far as the game thinking you're aggroed by the enemies. So if they have aggro animations, it'll, it'll reset them. Oh, come on! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see how hard this is without the Septisol and why we normally have one here. Yeah. Uh, Just dodge okay. the smile. Yeah, we almost had it though, several times. You can now. use Hope Lead. Soon. Okay. What? what, what? Use Hope Lead and be even slower? <laughs> He, he's like, like, as I, said, I think funky. It kind of works better with him, oddly yeah. enough. I think if I need more than five minutes for this, we should, like, progress otherwise, I guess. But for now, we try this. <laughs> uh, while we're working That's on fine. this, do we have time for you, a couple of questions? You can rejoin. That would be a good yeah. time. Oh, right. Uh, we have uh, $25 from Michael saying, let's unlock the blindfold yeah. run. That sounded like a commercial jingle. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that $25, Michael. Um, we have uh, one donation that I'm actually just going to read straight. Uh, this one's a little more heartfelt. Uh, $30 from Liz saying, donating in honor of my mom and aunts who all have had or taken preventative measures against breast cancer. I love okay. HDQ so much. This is for the blindfolded incentive. I'm so excited for it. 
We're past one. Now only this one left. <laughs> uh, would you like me to pause or should I continue? No, no, no just continue until I'm past oh, this. Right. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, we have $25 from Banquo, who says, There once was a woman called Lightning Who had no big goals besides fighting Combat was on hold Till she got a blindfold You don't need eyes to beat a Dahaka Thank I you very I'm much passed. for the... $25. Yep. Oh, we're past it. All right, we're through. Nice. <laughs> D didn't take that long because here it would expire anyways, the deceptive cell. Here we would let it expire on purpose. Now we're back. So, right. na na so yeah. now we're back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> so now, right. now we're coming up to another fight, which is really interesting. And it's very, this one's very set and okay. it's possible to do this fight blindfolded. This is another one of the possible contenders. Yeah, I can't do this one though. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it needs a lot of practice, but it's very, it's very structured. But we're gonna take advantage of Cold Blood for the first time. So, the Proud Cloud is an enemy which is immune to. Uh, okay, well, he's not technically immune to Deep Protect, but he, we can't inflict him with Deep Protect, so we have to rely on just massive chain. And there's a way that we can get even higher chain now, which is Cold Blood. So Cold Blood is a move which, if you don't understand how it works, doesn't seem very good. But the key thing to know is that when Cold Blood is hitting after chain, every single Cold Blood bullet, of which I think there are 19, adds like 10% chain. So you can get a lot of chain from a single uh, Cold Blood cast. So we're just going to get the necessary buffs as we chain, staying alive, keeping healthy. And once the party's fully buffed, we can stagger him, and then we're going to do two Cold Bloods consecutively in Tri Disaster. And Thaumaturgy, which is uh, try disaster with healing. Now, with most fights up until this point, um, it's been a matter of, well, we want to kill him in one stagger. If we don't, then we just have to do a cleanup afterwards. That's not the case with this fight. Um, if you fail to kill within one stagger, he is going to do a move called Retaliatory Strike, which is death. There is no way we can survive it at our HP. We will just die. So this is a, a really tight fight and a real problem for beginning runners because of that, because you just can't really do backups on it. You just have to do the strat. So I might die here if Snow loses Adrenaline. That's the problem now. Like, this is very important that he keeps Adrenaline now. So it was two casts of Cold Blood, and he went from 250% chain to 866% chain. Yeah, this actually looks bad. Yeah, that's a death. No, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, lucky. Dead. Looked like your chain duration was low. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know why. It might have been the fine. extra spells and Thaumaturgy. Yeah, uh, I had to do them though for the chain, because yeah, I, did, I, I did the wrong shift. Yeah, you cut Vanille Strength, <laughs> I saw it. Oh, by the way, is yep. that you could do that, Kai? You could do Haste Faith instead of uh, Faith Haste, so she starts a little bit earlier. But that's fine, that's, that's, that's like okay. I got very bad targeting, which is why I didn't pay attention. Uh, Saz was dropping a lot. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we haven't really mentioned it up until this point because Kai hasn't made it necessary, but even if you die in this game, you can just retry and it's not really yeah. too big of you. That was actually the first big mistake this run, so I'm pretty happy so far. <laughs> I guess the second one after the V-set. Well, okay, true. True, <laughs> if that all <Yeah>. counts. <laughs> it's all right. This game's hard. We're going to fix it with the light jump, don't worry. Yeah. Which is a strat that totally does not randomly kill me. <laughs> but yeah, even with that, it's fast, okay? It's fast now. This time we do it correctly, though. I'm not supposed to cut off the new string here, because now my chain is correct. Cold Blood is especially good for this fight because um, he halves all damage from um, from elemental abilities, which includes all uh, Ravager, all other Ravager abilities, which also means that you chain less with those. So you see how much the chain is just shooting up right now. That's basically that like. Snow and Vanilla are contributing a little bit, but the mo most of that is just as. Also, Snow is adrenaline, like this is a safe kill if I don't get destroyed by single target on Sass now, which can still happen. <laughs> in, in the background, this is also that, that Cold Blood Crystarium is something that we can do because of that EKNM grind that we did more than an hour ago. Right, yeah, we actually would not have enough CP for that otherwise. I, I was actually lacking stagger duration because this is very, very safe. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was the problem that fight was the stagger duration. I yep. just took gold blood on Snow as well. You'd be short about the BKNM fight. 
All right, yeah. and now, thanks to your donations, we are going to switch in as leader, a character we haven't used in over an hour. <laughs> well, we thought you thrown Adam and Tapta, so... Uh, <laughs> that's that's true. Sure. Yeah. We used Putting some Odin. defensive oh, equipment on Lightning right now, just that she's able to survive one stomp, because without equipment, she's dying to everything. Now so, I can tank one storm. So this fight is <laughs> more or less the same fundamentally with either Lightning or Snow in the lead. You basically just chain him until he staggers and then you kill him with just ult. It just happens that Odin is uh, better at dealing with the specific enemy than Shiva is. So uh, it's, it's much safer to use Snow because Snow has enough HP to survive multiple stomps and he can survive the big Quake move, which you'll always get, but you have to kill him before yeah, exactly. Quake with Lightning. With Lightning, he does Quake early, which he's doing after a lot of fast storms. Uh, quake kills you. There's no way that I win without Quake, uh, with Quake happening. Looks like slow storms though, so this should be kill. And we also get to see, we also get to see something here which we haven't seen in a while, which is Lightning jumping to avoid the long Paradigm Shift animation. So it's uh, a... Yeah, nice that's a kill. Thing. Nice. I go for level 3 for safety. Easy. All right. So. so we need to get above 320% chain with an attack level 3 and then it's a kill. Um, which is RNG because he can do his stomps quicker. This time I got a slow pattern so it was very safe. I just need to pay attention that I uh, dodge them. You just spam his Razor Gale until, he's, until you're out of just all points. Until you can do that. Yep. And now he has half HP guys, he has half HP. <laughs> Odin's weak, Just wanted right? to say this. Yep, Odin is weak. Half HP and boom, gone. <laughs> so this apparently also works on bosses. Wait, unless they resist death. Like, there are bosses that resist death. On those it does not work. But yeah. That was the fight with lightning. With snow it's a bit slower, but it is way safer in case he does... A it's, fast pattern. It's actually a bit ironic because uh, Adam and Charlotte is weak to uh, ice, ice magic and Shiva is the quote unquote ice Eidolon, but as I mentioned, the just alt moves are all non elemental anyway. So o Odin is just too strong, that's the thing, yeah. right? Like, it, it doesn't matter what weakness enemies have. Like, for Shiva, you need to get him on lower HP and on higher chain. Like, Odin can leave him at higher HP and lower chain, so it's just. So for the next stretch, you can enjoy uh, the music. This is uh, a favorite song in the community, but we've got a bit of running and then only one boss left in the chapter. There's some pretty interesting dodges, but for now, this would be a good time for some donations. Yeah, All we right. have like three minutes. Great. Uh, we have uh, $5.40 from Callie saying, hey chat, the current amount raised starts with 54. Let's get a $5.40 train going toward that blindfolded incentive. You know you want to see it. Uh, and we also have uh, $5.40 from Burrito Muerte, uh, who says, I want to see the blind Ahaka fight. Kaya, don't you see? We don't want you to see. <laughs> uh, thank you for the chocobo theme on that one. Uh, we have got uh, $500 from Nat's fan saying, Blind, fold, blind, fold, blind, fold. I don't know how to read things with clapping like that in the, with, anyway. Uh, and we have uh, $50 from another terrible deer saying, let's see that blindfold magic. We got another jingle in there. All of these short one-liners are gonna be <laughs> like that, I think. <laughs> Uh, also, I, do one more. Uh, I want to uh, take this opportunity to let everybody know that we are at about uh, $58,500 uh, toward the blindfolded Dahaka fight, so that's uh, $20,500 left to go, more or less. Uh, please get those donations in, uh, because that's going to be a thing to see. Yeah, please donate, right? It's so fun. Um, we have around half an hour left in the run, if I don't die, so you have enough time. Alright, so coming up, uh, we have probably the coolest dodge in the entire game. There's going to be two huge enemies who are completely blocking the path. This um, looks undodgeable to anyone that yeah, doesn't know and it. They, are, um, they also completely ignore you, so we cannot get them to move by luring them out or anything like that. Uh, you know, desetting wouldn't work, they're just blocking the way. 
So how do you get them to get out of the way? Well, um, your party members actually have collision with enemies, but when they uh, hit them, it does not trigger a fight to start. So we can actually, by running in a very specific manner, uh, manipulate our party members to run into the enemies and push them aside. So that's what Kai is going to try to set up here. So he's going to wait with, here for the party members to catch up. With lightning, the new trick that Zero found with the party swap apparently doesn't work, but we can still get lucky. <laughs> Just I doing think, the menu the, here. The basic idea is you set your, you put lighting right at the corner here to make the game think it's like, oh yeah, I want to go here. And so your party member's like, okay, we'll go there next. And then going there involves pushing them out of the way. All right, so if I cross the battle zone onto the other side, hopefully Snow and or Vanille will push them out of the way. That looks good. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But okay. nice. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. First try every time. Yep. And that only happened because I ran to the other side, exited the battle zone, and Snow was wait. I need to catch up, so I need to follow you. But while following, he pushed that enemy a bit forward. And that can be a pretty significant <laughs> hindrance if it uh, doesn't go well. But sometimes Snow will just run back without pushing the enemy, and it just becomes a game where you just do that over and over again until he does it work properly. But now we've got a few pretty simple dodges for a while, so if there are any more donations, now's a good time. I am so sorry. Uh, the new button was not working. Um, we have $25 from Mr. Game and Shout uh, saying, Blindfold run, blindfold run. Come on, Twitch, get, let's get it done. Kaya Rune's got the skill. Don't need eyes to get the kill. Watch out. Here comes the blindfold run. Uh, we also have a $10 donation from Hoodie Wadi. Uh, killer run so far, Kyrune. Super hyped for this blindfolded run. Come on, chat. Let's get a $5 train going. Doody doo, dee 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 dee, do dee dee do. Sorry, I felt like I only had, I, like I should only sing the last part on that one. So I, I do apologize, Hoodie. <laughs> um, we have uh, $50 from Peanut153. Love Final Fantasy 13 and loving the run. Here's a fistful of gill for blind Haka. And $25 from Prismatron. $25 donation train. Let's go. So if I can interrupt you really quick, we're just passing the battle zone for a sort of super boss. Uh, it's supposed to be a really, really difficult fight at this point. It's an adamant tortoise that's just invaded. Eden. Kaya tried to turn the camera but couldn't quite make it. Yeah, you can't turn it over anymore. <laughs> so it's an adamant tortoise, but it's a, it's a one of enemy that appears here. So we call it the Eden tortoise or Eden toys. And this is the enemy that Logic Dolphin was attempting to fight and successfully got a 54 second run. And this is where all the, the 54s come from. It's that enemy. It is actually possible to beat him with any percent development, if you if you get the magnums, it's there's a trick that you can you can use where you inflict days using Fang, and days gives you an extra double damage, which, which gets you gets you there. But that that ends up being a two minute ish fight, so 54 is really an impressive time for such a strong enemy. But All we're right. just gonna be continuing in this uh, area for a while now, so got more, got this more time is, for This is, in my opinion, the coolest looking hallway. But, yeah. <laughs> it is a very cool looking hallway, and but nothing else all that text on there is probably uh, donators' names. <laughs> so if you want to yep. open that wall. Uh, from here on out, I'm only going to be singing the ones that actually ask me to sing a song. Uh, my voice is getting a little bit strange, so I do apologize, folks. Uh, we have $25 from ZOVGMs, and I'm putting my donation toward the blindfold incentive. Uh, Final Fantasy 13 means a lot to me on a personal level, and it makes me so happy to see it finally being run at GDQ. Thank you so much, Zio. This game is really wonderful. Uh, I'm really, really enjoying this one as well. Uh, we have $13 from Tumamos. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, long time watcher, first time donator. Final Fantasy 13 is one of my favorite games, and I felt now is the best time to donate. Donation to go to the blindfolded fight. Um, we have uh, $54 from Shadow Dart. One ticket for the $54 Doom Train. Choo choo! Uh, do we have time for a couple more? Yep. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, we have uh, $54.54 from Larsivsi. I uh, hope I pronounced that right, too. Have to donate to this awesome run of a very underappreciated game. Keep it up. Uh, and uh, we are going to do... Uh, I actually want to take this opportunity to uh, tell everyone we are over $59,000. We've almost hit the 60K Ooh, mark. Nice. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Keep those donations rolling in uh, for the blindfolded run. Really, really appreciating all of these. No worries. If uh, we're not there, we can just have Kaya die however many times he needs yeah, to I just, I, just, I, I, I just died like <laughs> three times on the final boss or something. And then uh, Mr. Titan will pay the rest of it with his death incentive. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All right, this is the, the last upgrade menu in the run. Um, I upgrade a Warrior's Respend with a Skull Tide that I just got through dismantling um, to a Power Glove. So now it now has tall power, uh, two Power Gloves, which is the strongest strength accessory that we have access to in any percent. Mm, because the next fight is pretty tight on damage. Very, very tight on damage. Yeah, so um, that that uh, big robot we fought earlier that Kaya died to, he's going to come back and uh, he's arguably even harder. Yeah, it's, this it's, is normally the version that new runners have way more trouble with. Even though the other one is a loss when you don't do the strat, the strat is easier to do. Yeah, th this one is is really tricky. Um, there's with, with 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 any luck, Kaya is going to make this look easy. But um, basically, everything that happens in this entire fight is excruciatingly specific with the timing. All your cold bloods, all your shifts. It's 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 really rough, and there's a lot of adapting you also need to do to yeah. what your uh, party members are doing, what the boss is doing. Um, it, it's you can't really follow a script. That's yeah. the problem. You, you cannot really follow a script. Like this fight is the most variable in the run. So, so the the critical thing is that cold blood can be used to consistently interrupt him while he's staggered, and he is easy to stagger. But the difficulty lies in connecting your cold bloods consecutively and maintaining interruption and launching with snow. So you want to, you're shifting at very precise timings to maintain snow's actions. So there he's successfully shifted, got a ready animation cancel and a successful launch. And now he has to maintain what snow and Peniel are doing for the rest of the stagger. One of the things that makes it really tricky is that Snow can't launch while Cold Blood is hitting him. So you have to time it so Snow gets launches off after Cold Blood. You go too early and you get less launch chances. You go too late, he has a chance to attack you. So there's a very fine line for timing it. Yeah, and if you miss it, he'll get more attacks off, which will keep Snow interrupted, stopping Snow from getting his interruptions in, and it just can spiral out of control really quickly. But this has been a very good phase one. The goal in yeah. phase one is to do about, I think it's like 40% of his HP. Um, that will trigger him to deactivate his limiters, which will make his attacks even stronger, but will also give himself a uh, deeper tech and B-shell, uh, which means that even though he, he does also full uh, heal to full HP when he does that, um, we can now kill in a second stagger. This transition between staggers is kind of the, the hardest point of the fight. Um, but that was that was a good pattern, and doing that big attack right away is actually what we want to see. And now we're transitioning to the second stagger. We got a launch again, so this is looking nice. This should be. I might a good need fight to here. extend, but yeah, missed one ready because I didn't get the ready animation. Worst case, we can just kill after, but he successfully yeah. got through the, the most difficult. This should be a kill. Thing. Yeah, this is a win eventually. The question is how fast. Yeah, unlike uh, the first uh, fight with this robot, we don't have to worry about that uh, retaliatory strike uh, attack if we fail to kill and stagger. Yeah. He does retaliatory strike when he's flying, so since he yeah. starts this. And you're not supposed to be able to win this fight without him going into the aerial mode, so this is still a very difficult casual fight, but because we can keep interrupting and launch nice. so much. Nice. Beautiful, Easy. beautiful nice. fight. Didn't even need to extend the stagger. Like you can extend the stagger with locking uh, a cold blood animation in before it expires, because that keeps the stagger duration up uh, and keeps the stagger from expiring until cold blood is finished. Um, but yeah, there I had enough damage to go for the kill without that. So, and now this is the final chapter. If everything goes as planned, this is around twenty minutes now. 
Um, so get your donations in for the Haka, please. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a menu here and then some running, so this is actually a good break point for donations. Oh. All right, first I want to let people know we are just shy of $60,000 um, on this incentive, so please, please get those donations in. We can do this. Uh, $5 donation train, a $10 donation train, any kind of donation train that you want to run. Choo-choo! Let's take it to the end. All right. Uh, we have $5.54 from Mythic Dawn. Wrecking my sleep schedule for this without a second thought. May Chapter 4 be kind to you, Kaya. Thanks to the rest of the FF13 speedrunning community as well for such a fantastic showcase. We have $50 from Victor Prime. A haiku. Prize man shows prizes. We donate to win great ones. More GDQ lamp. Love FF13. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, we have $20 from Lemon Nerd Boy, a long, lifelong FF fan. Love seeing one of the few games from the series that I never beat, played so quickly. Keep up the good work, GDQ. Uh, we have uh, $100 from Dark Gizmo that says, uh, I hope everyone has a great time. Can't wait to see all those frames saved. How, uh, how are we doing on time? Mm, oh, we have so good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, let's see. We have $50 from Renegade saying thank you so much for running this game. And thank you to the amazing team of runners, commentators, hosts, and technicians putting AGDQ together. Blindfold fight. Let's go. Uh, do we have time for one more? Yeah, yeah. go on. Uh, we have $25 from Cowbones uh, saying, I want to see the very best run this game blindfolded. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for the donations. Uh, we are uh, past the $60,000 marks. We only have 20K to go. We can do it. I quickly want to throw in that like a lot of people meme about this game being only hallways and you can't get lost. Uh, in this chapter, I've heard from several people that they got lost. So... There's, there's also <laughs> all of chapter 11. It's like yeah. a lot of, you know, the first 10 chapters are pretty much a sequence of you know, triggers in the story, but there's so much to do in chapter 11. Even in the speed run, it's like a significant chunk of the game. And if you do it casually and start doing the side quests, chapter 11 is pretty much more than half the game and it's all open world, so. All right, so um, something to point out is that uh, once we started this chapter, we unlocked uh, the Eden Pharmaceuticals shop, which lets you buy shrouds, which is great for us because we have pretty much run through all of the shrouds that we had built up uh, throughout the run. And these last uh, several bosses that we have to uh, deal with, coming up after this little dodging section is pretty much just going to be a boss rush of six bosses, uh, which will take us to the end. Um, and those are going to be real tough, so we, uh, we definitely appreciate being able to just use shrouds on all of them. In fact, for the next four fights, we are going to be using both a Fortisol and an Aegisol for all of them. You can also die on all of them very easily if you do something wrong, or even if you get bad. Like like the second one, the Vladislas, uh, that one is having a lot of RNG with debuffs. If I don't land debuffs, it's very hard to win that. Um, because our healing is limited at this point. Like, we have very low stats, so the healing comes mainly from Renew. If I use both Renews and the fight's still not close to done, then it's getting really sketchy. Yeah, the shrouds are actually routed such that the, sh the shrouds we farm between Chapter 2, uh, random drops, and the Doctor's Codes are such that we can use our final shrouds on Proud Cloud 2, which was the final boss of Chapter 12. And now we just we just spend 12,000 gil for every single shroud. We've been saving all of our remaining gil to get these shrouds. We've pretty much maxed up the, the equipment that we have and really can't, even by spending gil, improve our stats that much, and so the rest of it's just going into the shrouds. Mm. No barrel. That's not a good start. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we wanted of, in peril there. Out of these two enemies, one uh, is immune to physical and one is immune to magic. Since basically all our regular damage is coming from physical attacks, uh, we are going to use uh, summon to take out the one that resists it, uh, because, well, um, summons completely ignore all damage resistances, so we can just kill this thing. 
Yeah, yeah I play this very safe. I do two of this as well because I have level two and no in peril. Yeah. <laughs> Bender Snatch resists physical, and all of our stats are physical oriented, and so we kill him with the summon. There's another little thing, which is that they heal each other. So if you try and kill one, the other one will heal him and will get in the way. So it's really nice to just take this one out and then leave Jabberwocky, who is immune to spells, but weak to physical. He's got, a really, he's got a really strong attack uh, called Breath of the Beast, which uh, if this goes right, we will stagger him before he gets to do it. This will get very close now. On the bright side, it's no target, so you won't game over if he does get a lob. If it's going for Veneer Sad, he gets the Breath of the yeah, Beast, no. there's a very good chance you die. I got it, I got it. It's good. Now we just keep him interrupted. The same yeah. as you do in Chapter 6, pretty much. Yeah, this is basically the grown-up version of the final boss of Chapter 6. There we go, right. first, first boss down. When you get early in peril, this can be up to 20 seconds quicker. Um, but this is obviously still better than dying. So. It's, it's not getting early in peril, it's like not failing <laughs> to inflict in peril. That was very unlucky. Y yeah. I mean, I, I don't. Nowadays, I don't try to get it afterwards because it messes up your whole patterns. You can just like take longer and get out then. Sure, yeah. Usually. Yeah, I do the same. It's like it's really bad if you go for more imperial chances and you still don't get it. It's like I think yeah, it's and then you die. Yeah. <laughs> so this way, it's like maybe 10 to 20 seconds slower, but you don't die at least. So now the Another. next boss is Vladislav. Um, this guy is a Seath of a very specific type. There's a few of these. And there's a late game boss that looks the same, but this guy, uh, he's weak to all elements, and he also has devastating physical attacks, so we're going to be using mm -hmm. Snow and a Sentinel when he uses his strongest attacks. But the most important thing is that he's weak to D-Shell and D-Protect, but we really only want to inflict D-Protect, and for that reason, we have Vanilla as the lead, because if she was not the lead, she would do D-Protect and D-Shell, and basically be half as effective as a Saboteur. So we're just going to be pretty much using her almost <laughs> Entirely to cast D-Shell, or sorry, D-Protect. Also, we didn't say anything to this, but this is a hitbox abuse. Um, his hitbox <laughs> is favorable for us because he can just sneak through his legs. The first time I failed it because it was a bit too far forward, but yeah, <laughs> second time worked. I want to sneak in really quick that we just hit 62,000 toward the incentive. Oh, nice. Yeah, we have, nice. we have roughly 15 minutes left, so keep going, guys. It's not much left. <laughs> These donations right. are rolling in, so... Yeah, for this fight, it would be a nice break. Yeah, we just need to protect, hopefully. Okay, there you there go, first it <laughs> If it stays like that for the rest of the fight... We use Libra here also. Oh, wow. Wow, Snow no. is not able to hit. Oh my god. Legend. So, so Libra here is nice because it tells Saz's Synergist AI that he's weak to all elements, so Saz just defaults to in fire. And then Mounting Contempt is his strongest attack, so we use Sentinel for this. Otherwise, we just heal through his attacks and hope for deep Yep. Which we have Which we didn't get. So Mounting Contempt <laughs> removes the debuffs on him, and it can also remove the debuffs on the character he's is targeting. Luckily, it's not too much of an issue, but not getting deep attack on him reduces our damage a lot, so we have to yeah, reapply that's it. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, he actually it's went slower for the than second. Planned, but yeah. <laughs> All good. So if, if you don't land debuffs, like I already used both of my renews there, and Vanille's tireless uh, charge healing when she's medic heals like 150 or 200 per cure, so it's really not good okay, we <laughs> at have this our, point. Our final stretch before this boss, and it's pretty yeah. much the last time we have for donations after that's gonna be non stop until yeah, the and end. Then, and then Swanzik wanted to also say something, I think. Oh. No, 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 I wanted to say exactly that. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. So, uh, really quickly, we have $25 from Miss Q saying, let's see the blindfolded Dahaka fight. We have $25 from Siege saying, blindfold, please. Uh, we have uh, $45 from Boney saying, do 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 uh, and we have $10.80 from Courage the Cowardly, Cowardly Dutch 
I've never played Final Fantasy, and I'm new to GDQ. All the runs and wholesome chat's been doing wonders for my mood, so into the blindfold bucket a little droplet I will throw, and if I can get the host to sing this, I surely hope you all will know you're great. And I'm so sorry, Courage. I am, uh, my voice is, is, is a little bit busted for singing such a large donation. Uh, we are almost at $63,000. We also broke $550,000 in total donations. So keep those donations rolling in. There's still time. Yeah, around 10 minutes now, if I don't die. <laughs> Big F for these fights. Now the, the three complicated fights in this chapter, and the last one is pretty easy, but yeah. This one right here is probably my favorite fight in this chapter. So this is Tiamat. He has two attacks in this aerial phase called Ice Grenades, which has a chance to slow you, and Tail Hammer, which will launch your whole party. But one really nice property of Cold Blood and Snow Strikes in this fight is that they will keep him interrupted. So he shouldn't get too much out before first stagger, ideally, which is nice. Two Ice Grenades, no slow, yeah. so this is perfect. Yeah, this is the setup we want to. Yeah. So now we just keep him interrupted until stagger, and once we stagger him, we're gonna keep a set pattern where we keep him interrupted until the stagger's over. Right now, we're not really going for damage, because after this, he will do the scent, and then he'll be vulnerable to debuffs. At this point, he is vulnerable to debuffs. And then in that phase, if we can get the whole strap properly, we will keep him interrupted until we stagger him. I keep him interrupted through the whole stagger. But that's a little bit debuff slash luck reliant, so we'll see how that goes. There's something really interesting about that first phase also, which is that his second phase begins after his first stagger, so we intentionally do a shorter stagger, and it's, I think it's the only time we actually do that in the whole run, but we just stagger him quickly and do as much damage as we can in that short stagger to get to this ground phase earlier. Nice debuff, Vinio, by the way. <laughs> Vinio, please! Okay, he got something out, but it's okay. Uh, as long as I get debuffs... No, it's the uh, this is a little rough because no debuff set uh, is the right. <laughs> no yep. debuff set all before stagger. This wow. Is horrible. This is bad. Aw, oh, Scrip Snow's buffs. Okay, I, I think wow. I'm fine. I think I'm fine. I think I'm fine. Yeah, I think you are too, but jeez. <laughs> he should launch him now and have adrenaline on both because Renew. But wow. Yeah, that's so, his. So it <laughs> just it just occurred to me the other day that you could probably stagger extend this fight if you really wanted to, so I guess keep that in mind if you if you need it. Yeah, that's gonna be nice for poison too. Not only could you stagger extend, you could also reverse stagger extend. I've learned that the hard way. Where um, at the end of the first phase, when he does descent, he resets his chain. But if you cold blood during descent, you will actually won't reset his chain right away until after the cold blood ends. So you essentially waste all the chaining you do during the cold blood. I, I've also run right, that way before. <laughs> now we have the final drop in the game and the last three bosses, which are two of the hardest and then one very easy one. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. So we've had it's two around bars. seven minutes now until the end of the run. So keep your donations going. We've we've had two parts. <laughs> now it's time for the third and and some people's opinion worst part. He is in some ways not as bad as Bart 2. He does not inflict debuffs the way Bart 2 does. However, Bart 3 has a lot of HP and it's a really tight kill to get him for his his next cycle. And if Vanille fails to land debuffs or if he targets people badly, you can just die without any control. The pattern is more or less the same as we've been doing so far though. You chain him, debuff him, stagger him and kill him. Yeah, but it's very precise. It is very precise. Yes. If I'm a little short on chain, I will not kill. The strats have been improved a little bit recently though, so it's not as tight as it once was, but with that in the flock, it still gets really sketchy. You can also not always do that, like I need debuffs. Yeah. Uh, Deprotect is already there. He also got so, a few safety nodes, like Vanille's HP, so be a little bit Yeah. Alright, we normally don't get them. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably. Vanille's getting first. If he doesn't kill Vanille now. Yeah. It's a bit okay. amusing because Vanille <laughs> used D, uh, D shell earlier and it was nice for the first few fights, but pretty much every fight since then we have not wanted D shell and D shell has just been a waste of uh, chances for Vanille to land more important debuffs. So if you could unlearn D shell, you absolutely would, especially for this fight. Please. But unfortunately, that was a pretty not. high roll. He's yeah. not going on Vanille. Oh my god. <laughs> Be happy you got more HP on her. I think that's why he's yeah. going for her. Oh, he knows. Yeah, he knows. Yep, sure. and, and I missed oh, this refresh, right. so... That's okay. We have to improvise this a bit now. <laughs> you can often kill him after, and 
you have an elixir that you're saving for the next fight that you can use in this fight, it's faster to use the elixir and do the slow fight next instead of dying. But ideally, you don't have to use it. Yeah. I... Uh, you oh see my god. Kyle uh, wild. No. <laughs> yeah, I tried. You see Kyle kind of wildly shifting between paradigms there. He's trying to keep snow on the ground and did not succeed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's okay. All right, back up time. <laughs> All right, you look at the sword and you get to show off. Yep. <laughs> this is something you normally don't want to do, but also you got early it's the more exciting so threat on off. So actually, you wear off, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't need it now. I need it after Sega. Okay, now we can go for it. Come on, the Neil. Oh my god! Oh my god, the Neil. That's it, the Neil. Then without deep protect, whatever. Uh, Chain the, sign the, up. We might see another <laughs> laughter. Something to mention about it in this fight, on my service, is that it actually does a percentage of your HP based off a set damage amount, so it will never kill you. It will just get you I really I can't believe long. that Snow got... Uh, whatever, it's okay. This is a slightly different strat. It's not too hard different. It's harder to do. Alright, this, but... this fight is going to start out with an immediate... Uh, uh, oh, and I guess it, you don't it need would have. It, <laughs> it would have, it would have started uh, with an immediate summon. Uh, the, the goal of that would be uh, to tank this first attack and then immediately be back on full HP and just hit the ground running. Uh, but since he didn't have, he doesn't have the elixir. He has to conserve his TP a bit and uh, just deal with the fact that he has to recover from that at the start real quick. It's better than dying on Bart, even though it loses you like 30 seconds on this fight as well. So this fight is pretty similar to other fights, fundamentally, in that we buff ourselves, chain, debuff, stagger, kill. At least at the start. However, he has some, this pretty devastating slap attack that we have to be tanking. We actually got the Sentinel roll on Saz a lot just to tank these slaps and reduce the amount of damage he takes. So this Paradigm Run Consolidation has Saz as a Sentinel. Normally, if you start at full HP, you're able to be more aggressive here. But because we had to use the elixir, we have to be a little bit more cautious. We've given the same deep, the same puffs that we've been giving as usual. So haste on everyone, bravery and and thunder and sad and snow. He's gonna get in peril eventually, and so the the in thunder will be doing double damage. And then also vigilance on Saz. I think this is one of the only times we actually use vigilance. It stops Saz from getting interrupted by these slaps while he's casting blitz later. Oh, and that's good debuffs like we've got deep protect. Yeah, yeah, that should be a kill. The three debuffs but... you need for this fight are deep protect and peril. And for the first time, we absolutely have to have poison. The reason why poison is good here is that Orphan has millions of HP and poison kills in six seconds or six minutes. And so that means that you're going to be doing tens of thousands of damage per second just from having poison inflicted. And Orphan is another enemy with a chain break. So when he's around 40% HP, he's going to break our chain and Reset, reset his chain, and he's going to start doing damage much faster than before, and it's going to be much harder to survive. So we're going to summon to survive, and chain uh, the, the poison is going to be doing massive damage this whole time. So we're really going to be getting on poison here. Maybe you could die to this. Okay, that was nice. a 50% 50 uh, 50 insta kill move because Squeenix thought it was a good idea when the leader dies to put that move into the game. Um, <laughs> But the first one will always go on a Medic or a uh, um, Sentinel, so we know it will be on Veneer. It's and literally an unavoidable thing. Alright, so now okay. he's in his really dangerous phase, uh, phase, and we can't really survive this for very long normally, so we just have to summon and then uh, win the fight with Sazel. Oh, oh, no, is this gonna be... oh, come on, dude! I knew oh. it. <laughs> That's why I waited this long. Yeah. So, oh Ray is the most <laughs> devastating attack he has, and it will kill you from full HP, and so you have to go into just ult. And so this whole time we're going to be sitting here just waiting for Poison to do its thing. I had to go to just ult, else I would have died if he would have done a normal shot, yeah. which is what I expected. <laughs> At that point, the next orb had a 50% chance to kill Sad, so you have to summon to tank that potentially, but then you can't summon tank this. So you have to go straight into just ult. So he's trying to make this the, the, last the, the, the as problem long as he is, possibly can. Now it's getting a bit scary because that timing was awful. <laughs> yeah. 
hand. We're just literally <laughs> waiting for poison to kill right now. You can see yeah, the yeah. HP bar is counting down and oh, it's oh, entirely oh. from poison. If, if he does not use Progetory Wrath on Sass, it's fine. If he does, I'm dead. 50%. To 50%. <laughs> yeah, I just need to survive for a bit now. <laughs> poison take right. donation train? That's vile. It should be fine. Just no wrath. He's almost dead. <laughs> Next birthday. You should be good. I think so. Consolidation. Saving the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should die now. Okay. Yeah. That was just a bit scary. So yeah, poison good. <laughs> That's the lesson to take from this. That was the best example of like why we normally have the elixir for phase two. Because if we have the elixir for phase two, I start with full HP instead of 2000 HP. So I can stall a tiny bit longer and actually summon through that DZ ray pattern uh, instead of having to go into the Gestalt mode, which does not lose you any time. The Gestalt mode loses you a bit. All right, final boss right here, Orphan 2. Yep, so. we have around one minute until time from now. Um, so this boss is completely immune to damage uh, before you stagger it, and uh, like the Igolan fights, he also gives you a Doom timer, but we really don't have to worry about that. We're going to kill him in much less time than that will <laughs> take to uh, expire. Um, so, yeah, we're just setting up buffs and trying to stagger him as quickly as possible. He has some rough attacks that we uh, hopefully shouldn't see. He did a slap here. It's random whether he will do that slap early. If, if he doesn't, then we actually uh, uh, stagger him before he really gets to do anything of substance. So this is not ideal because it launches uh, your party members. Still managed to stagger him before the second slap, and now it's just a matter of Vanille getting on the debuffs that we need, and then we're just going to destroy him. He doesn't have that much HP compared we to some of the other bosses. <laughs> okay. Deep protect okay, is the most likely time. to have a land, and she got it last, of course, because that's just how Vanille works. Get ready on time. And time is... after this result screen. And... time. GG. GG. All right, <laughs> that is Final Fantasy 13 any percent. With a bit sloppy endgame, but also could show some of the backups. Oh, come so on, you, 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 have, you, you have what, one death? <laughs> That, that's honestly yeah, not bad at all. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of good to show some of the backups too, honestly, so... One death and one travels <laughs> chapter 12 bridge segment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that, and did we meet the blindfolded incentive? Hopefully? Unfortunately, we didn't, uh, but this was Aww. a wonderful run. We had a lot of fun here, and uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, do you have any final uh, shout-outs uh, that you uh, yeah, want to about? Sh shout-outs to the whole... FF13 speedrun community, really, really great community. Whoever's interested to learn this game, we have an awesome, very, very, very active Discord. Um, you can check the link out on speedrun.com. And yeah, thank you at GDQ for accepting this run. I had a lot of fun to, uh, during this. And yeah, that's it from me. Anything you guys want to say? Thank you, guys. No, thanks, thanks everybody for watching. All right, goodbye. All right, everybody. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful run by Kairun. Excellent commentary by everyone. I hope you all really, really enjoyed that. Uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, we have uh, we have plenty of donations uh, left to read. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, and get through those. Uh, some of those anyway. Uh, we have uh, $10 from Titus Gordon uh, saying, hello, GDQ team and runners. I hope you are having a great day. I just want to say good luck to Kairun and everyone who's running today. I'm going to have a great day on my birthday. Happy birthday, Titus. Uh, thanks so much for donating. Um, we, uh, we have uh, $10 from 
Kupikaku, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, winter greetings from Finnish Lapland. FFs have had my heart for the past 20 years, and it's always fun and nostalgic to see them speed run. Best of luck to Kairun and Kupoan. Um, thank you, everybody. Sorry, we couldn't get to everyone's donations during the run, but it's great to see them uh, all coming in. Um, we have uh, $50... Uh, from Manual 999, uh, lost my mother to cancer last October. She didn't really have a thing for video games, but an FF13 speed run is always a good time to donate. Let's kick some cancer butt, and good luck for the remainder of the run. I'm so sorry, Manuel, and thank you so much for your donation. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we have... Uh, $20 uh, from Roe, and first time donating to AGDQ. In the wise words of a certain gun-armed man, there's no getting off this train till we get to the end of the line. Let's start a donation train and get it to the FF7 Integrate bonus. Uh, folks, uh, during that run, we did exceed $550,000 in total donations. Uh, we have uh, plenty more upcoming incentives, including bonus game, uh, the Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade, uh, which we are currently at $55,000 out of uh, the one hundred. And $77.77 necessary to unlock that run. So if you want to see that, you will want to get donations in for that incentive. All right, everyone, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we will be right back. All right, everyone, we are back with more AGDQ 2022 online. Uh, folks, we have a $25 donation from Cloud Strife, uh, who says, more Final Fantasy, please. I wonder which Final Fantasy Cloud is uh, looking to see. Um, we have a $5 donation from Puis1337 saying, Dono Train, let's go. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. 
Uh, we have uh, $50 from Bridge Bandit, first time donator. Thanks for all the entertainment over the years. Looking forward to contributing plenty more over the course of the week. Let's give Espeon some love as the best evolution. I'm honestly, I'm, I'm in the Sylveon camp myself, uh, but I, you got to respect every evolution. Uh, we have uh, $25 from uh, Banyan saying, thank you for everything you do. As the son of a cancer survivor, it means a lot knowing that people will donate to help others. Also, Umbreon, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for the donation. Uh, I'm really glad to hear uh, that you are uh, the son of a cancer survivor. And uh, Umbreon's pretty great. We have $10 from Link's dad. Been watching GDQ with my son since he was born. This year, he's old enough to see the prizes, and we just had to bid when we saw the Jolteon plush. Evie's his favorite. Looking forward to another amazing marathon. We also have uh, $25 from Major Dad 206 saying, Last spring, my family lost my mother-in-law to cancer. She loved the Legend of Zelda game series. This donation is for her memory and helping stop other families from going through what we have. GDQ does awesome work and has inspired me into doing my own speed runs. Here's to a fantastic week of runs. Good luck to the runners and let's kick cancer's butt. Thank you so much for the donation and I'm so sorry for your loss. We have $25 from Intwig. I hope I said that right, uh, saying, loving the runs, the hosting, the chat. Let's keep it going. We have $10 from Elsie saying, all right, fine, you got me. If there's a $10 train, I'm on it. Love to the runner and especially Sabera for always keeping it super cute. Oh, thank you, Elsie. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, another $5.40 donation uh, from Michael saying, 540 train hype. Uh, we have uh, plenty of these 540 donations. Thank you all so much for riding that train. We have 540 from Anonymous that says, you have a lovely singing voice. Well, thank you, Anonymous. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, we, <laughs> we have uh, $54 from Rusta saying, just donating to hear Sabera try to pronounce some of my favorite Final Fantasy 13 names or sing them if it'll help. Uh, let's let's see if we can pronounce these. Megistotherian, Monogarmer, Panangalan, and Adamantulid. Adamantulid? Adamantulid. Well, it's certainly one of those, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for the donation, Rusta, and uh, I hope I did you proud. We have a $15 donation from Balam Soldier saying, A haiku. Final Fantasy, only RPG for me. Time for a hype train. So chat, if you uh, feel so ready to get a hype train going, uh, then please, by all means, do so. Um, we have, uh, one more donation to read, uh, for right now, uh, and it is, where did it go? Oh no. Um, <laughs> where's my browser? Um, don't mind me. Uh, we have $20 from Space Robots, uh, saying Final Fantasy 13 is underrated. I apologize for technical difficulties. Um, and now, uh, I would like to, uh, tell you a little bit about Fangamer. My friends, it is my distinct pleasure 
to tell you today about Fangamer. If you know them, you love them. And if you don't, Fangamer sells video game merchandise, including GDQ merch. All sales of GDQ merch benefit the Prevent Cancer Foundation, and Fangamer ships worldwide. They even have branches in Japan and Europe, so you can get your gaming merch fix wherever you are. Check it out and snag some for yourself at fangamer.com slash GDQ. All right. Uh, folks, uh, we have uh, $50 from Nano saying, Greeting from Norway. My cousin was diagnosed with cancer during AGDQ last year. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed too late, and he passed away four weeks later. Happy to contribute to such a good cause so that we prevent the same thing happening to other people. This donation goes to unlock Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade because we cannot have enough Final Fantasy. Folks, uh, we are currently at $56,485.22 on that Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade unlock. Uh, so we are more than halfway there. That is really plugging along. Uh, so keep those donations rolling in. All of that money, of course, goes to benefit the Prevent Cancer Foundation, uh, which will help those fighting with cancer and those who are at risk of it. We have... Uh, $157 from Eric saying, FF7 was my father's favorite game, so I donate for the bonus game today in his memory. $250 from Nick saying, great event for an awesome cause. Let's get some FF7R. Thank you all so much for these wonderful donations for this amazing, amazing cause. We have $25 from Jace Longstrider. Year three of watching AGDQ. I love the new in-stream schedule layout. Also, best evolution is the Everstone version. That's right, the original Bunny Fox itself, Eevee, except no substitutions. $20 from Johnny Phoenix saying, my friends and I love watching GDQ and this go around is no exception. Jolteon is fantastic, as are all the evolutions. I'm a sucker for Umbreon and Flareon, but I'd be happy with whatever my Eevee involves into. Good luck to everyone, and have fun watching GDQ. Folks, I cannot stress enough that Johnny has the right idea here. Please support your Eevee, no matter what its evolution turns out to be. We have $25 from Rose the Red Panda. I lost my mother to cancer in 2015, and my father is battling melanomas that keep coming back. I'm donating so that others won't have to go through what I have. Go fast and blast through those games. Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry, Rose. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, you've been lovely, you've been cute, but it's time for me to mute. This is the end of my hosting shift, but we're coming up next on Tuesday Afternoon Prizes with Scent and Mr. Game and Shout. Right, so anyway, Shout, I was trying yeah. to tell you at the end of Final Fantasy 13 there, we kind of extended to the extended Final Fantasy 13 universe leading into Final Fantasy 13 Lightning Returns, which sees the... Oh, we're, we're, we're live, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, don't, don't worry, I'll finish the story later. There's like 16 more chapters, it really goes places. That's not <laughs> worrying at all. Hi everybody, and welcome back to Awesome Games Done Quick 2022 online. I am Mr. Game and Shout. And I'm Scent, of course, and we are here to tell you all about some of the amazing prizes that you can win by donating during the marathon. Isn't that right, Shout? We are. I do want to add real quick, though, big shout out to Sabera Messia. Amazing job with the hosting. Oh. That was a surprisingly musical uh, hosting shift there. So great job with that. Seriously. I, I, I was not expecting actual singing to occur, and it, it was incredible. Uh, 
it, the unexpected always happens at GDQ. That's that's what it's all about, Chow. But it's let's talk about what people can expect, which is, of yes. course, some awesome prizes right now. The prizes we're going to be talking about right now are mostly until the end of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, which is coming up soon in just a few runs here, about uh, two hours from now, I think, or so. Yeah, something like that. So you've got a little bit of time to get your donations in if you didn't already during Final Fantasy XIII, but you definitely want to because we have some really cool stuff to talk about, like a $5 minimum donation. We have a Triforce dice bag from Mountain Goth Mom. We do. I love her stuff. She was the one who sent us those uh, lamp uh, Amigurumi last Oh, yes, event. yes, yeah. Uh, excellent work. Uh, you can see a great picture of it as well as all of the prizes that we're going to talk about today uh, by heading over to gamesdonequick.com or if you're already there, clicking on the prizes link. It should be somewhere at the top of the screen for you. You're Got so good pictures of everything. I, I have learned what directions are, Shout. <laughs> I'm evolving. <laughs> Soon I will reach my final form, but... <laughs> Not yet. Anyway, it's an absolutely adorable dice bag. Thank you so much to Mountain Goth Mom for uh, sending it out. We've got another couple of great $5 donation uh, prizes as well uh, in uh, the form of a SM64 style coin from Cute Monster Props. It's got the little coin marking of the coins from SM64 and uh, a 3D Monado pin from Ihotsun. And, um, you know, it's just, it's got great detail on it. Uh, did, did you play Xenoblade Chronicles, Shout? I did not play Xenoblade you Chronicles. You, you, you want, not. like, a 40-hour good RPG, you should play Xenoblade Chronicles. Excellent time. Just like that is an excellent Monado pin. $5 minimum donation. Make sure to get them in. I'll tell you what I did play, though, oh. and I played repeatedly, is Nier Automata. And oh, I'm yeah. so hyped for this run that we are about to have, I can't even tell you. And we have some amazing prizes to go along with it. Now, for a $10 minimum donation, I believe sent you had showed this off earlier, we have a Nier Automata poster in the style of the Metropolis uh, poster. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, Phoebe J sent that in. It's such a cool mashup. Uh, they've done multiple of those, you know, like B-movie. They'll take, oh, yeah. you know, like Bride of Frankenstein or something, but instead it'll it'll be a video game. In this case, they took, you know, the Metropolis poster, the iconic scene of the, like, woman looking up at the city skyscape. Except this time, it's a 2B from Nier Automata. Excellent. Also, for a $15 minimum donation from Storyteller Cosplay, we have a pair of Nier Pod enamel pins. Uh, these are adorable. I absolutely love them. So we've got Pod 042. We've got Pod 153. Both is the right decision. There is no wrong decision when it comes to these. $15 minimum donation gets you in to win these. Thank you so much. You don't even have to make a decision because they come as a set as exactly. well. Exactly. They're great to display. They're great to put on your bag. Uh, they're great to deal chip damage to your enemies when you're afraid to go in. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to have a ranged option, okay? That's that's what life's about. It's about options. Exactly. Speaking of some great options, uh, how about we get into one of the prizes that we've got in front of us here? Yes. From uh, El Gui, we have this absolutely incredible rivet and kit drawing from Ratchet and Clank. Um, I mean, come on, this looks even better in person, Shout. I, I said I was excited to show it off earlier. I genuinely meant it. No, it's genuinely amazing. And a lot of what looks to be like shading in here is actually line work. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, grays in here. What, what looks like a gray is black, just very fine line work. And it's absolutely incredible up close. The detail's amazing. It is incredible. You can see a uh, closer shot of it over on our website at gamesdonequick.com. But yeah, like Shout said, the line work is really what makes this special, especially in like Kit's, um, Kit's joints. Yes. Like that, that is super detailed. It's one of my favorite focal pieces of the artwork. It's a $25 minimum donation. Thank you so much to LG for sending it out to us. Uh, from Jesse Penning, we have a one-of-a-kind painting here, this Galaxy Mog painting. Coupeau. Coupeau, indeed. It's a uh, spray paint and acrylic paint on uh, on is canvas. Uh, yeah, yeah. Apparently, the um, wow. the splotches are spray paint. That is so cool. Yeah, it's it's such a great style, right? It's it's got that really like. Oh, I, I wish I was better at art education, like that uh, disco pop kind of okay. feel. You know what I mean? And there might be. Do you see through the light here? There's something going on with that canvas. I don't know. Yeah, I, I was saying earlier, I feel like it's almost like gessoed or something, like yeah. an old school icon. Interesting. Because it, it's got a real sheen to it. You can see it in the light there. It's, it's yeah, yeah. really shining. Uh, but yeah, that's a $20 minimum donation. Thank you so much to Jesse for sending that out to us. Now, for a $50 minimum donation until the end of Kuon a little bit later tonight, we yes. have two absolutely amazing prizes, right, Chow? We do. So, first off, from Lalin at Lalin's Garden, we have this handmade silent princess. So, this looks like a flower, uh, like one that you would find growing in, you know, wilderness, thing I've heard about. Uh, this is handmade from silk, and it is 
absolutely gorgeous. The detail on this is stunning. I love the framing, the little bit of information that's printed on there. This is an absolute one of a kind, and it could be yours. Again, $50 minimum donation before the end of Kuon, uh, later this coming morning, will get you in to win this. It is absolutely incredible, and it's still mind-blowing to me that that is made out of fabric and silk. Oh my uh, goodness. Also, from Arland, we have a beautiful meteor painting from Final Fantasy VII. Yes. You know, the iconic logo of FF7 with the meteor streaking through the night sky. Probably one of the most iconic images in gaming, frankly, just, just seeing that meteor, thinking about FF7, thinking about the remake. Looking forward to that later tonight. And I think we're actually pretty close to getting that uh, bonus game La in the schedule, Last aren't we? I saw, we were, we were just over 57 out of the $107.77. Definitely doable. That. Yeah, we, yeah, we totally. can get there for sure. We've already raised over 550 thousand dollars almost, almost 560 we're about to hit it's that that's that is absurd thank you all so much remember it is going to an absolutely amazing cause shout before we get out of here real quick you want to talk about the grand prizes yes so two grand prizes this event both of them are available for a 250 fifty dollar cumulative donation what does that mean every donation you make throughout the week we add them all together if that number meets or exceeds 250 dollars you are automatically automatically entered to win both of our grand prizes First off, from Heroic Replicas, our friends have hooked us up once again this year. We have a three-piece Legend of Zelda Grand Prize Pack. We, of course, have the Master Sword Dark Link Edition. Beautiful black and steel. I, I, I love the Master Sword, but I love this look on it. It's, it's a very striking look, It right? makes you, my little golf kid you, heart so you, happy. You get the black and silver contrast, and of course, in addition to that, we have an amazing Hylian Shield, as yes. well as an all-brand-new Full Metal Megaton Hammer. you got to check out a picture of all three over at GamesDoneQuick.com. Meanwhile, back here behind us from our friends over at SkyTech Gaming, we have this lovely SkyTech Gaming Mark 9 gaming PC. Indeed. Absolute beast of a machine. You can check out the full specs on our website as well. Both of them $250 cumulative donations, so get in $50 now to be entered into everything we just talked about and so many more amazing prizes. Get in $50 a little bit later and before you know it, you are going to be eligible for those grand prizes. Shout! Yep. That FF13 run was amazing. This Nier Automata run is amazing. What say we let these folks get right back to it and get into our next game? Absolutely. Thank you again, everybody. We'll be seeing you a bit later on today. See Have you. a good one. Hello gamers, welcome back to Awesome Games Done Quick 2022 Online, powered by Twitch and in support of the Prevent Cancer Foundation. My name is Zenadir, and I will be your host for the upcoming Near Automata Any% percent VC3 mod race on PC with Amei and Blue Metal, as well as the Ratchet and Clank runs following. The next run is very near, so I'm going to be starting an elevator with you with a reminder of a fancy little thing I've been informed is called uh, Prime Gaming. Do I have that right? Uh, all revenue after taxes that GDQ earns from subscriptions and bits for the month of January will be donated to PCF. So yes, that does include your Prime Gaming subscription. That 